Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please welcome the next president of the United States of America, Mr. Doug Stanhope. Thank you. That was Jessica Paquin and Norm Wilkerson. Thank you. The apathy is palpable here in Tyson's Corner, where apathy breeds. Khaki pants are ubiquitous. I know like nine big words, and I wear them like a paper helmet of fake intellect. <laughs> was Jessica funny or just hot? Because I thought she was funny, and I go, wait, is that maybe the just I want to fuck her part? <laughs> Making me think. Is it a Sarah Silverman syndrome here? Because I think she's funny, but if she's a pig, would I maybe I'd find a flaw? I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes you don't know. If, sometimes I don't know if I'm a racist. Am I, you go, I'm not, but then you don't know. So, do, am I a sexist? I don't know. I want to fuck her, so maybe I'm giving her a I went to a McDonald's in Cincinnati. There's two parts of this story. There's the racism part, just because you're black guys and you're sitting in the front. I want to address my guilt. Uh, but it was a, 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 one of those epiphany moments where I went into a, a McDonald's in Cincinnati, and it was the afternoon, and so I walk in, and it's empty, and there's a kid, he's a black kid behind the counter, and it's empty, so they're all the kids behind the counter are goofing around, and they're having fun, and there's kids, you know, smiling and happy, which you hate to see, but I mean, there was a moment where I go, oh, you know, because you have that moment where it's a black kid, and he's happy, and you have that trained moment of, Hey, you know, he's working at McDonald's. It's great. He, you know, he could be out on the streets and doing bad things, but he chose a... But if it was a white kid that was happy at McDonald's, I'd just go, what the fuck are you happy about? You're at McDonald's. Like, so you, you think you're not a racist, but there's some kind of trained racism that you don't even recognize. But here's the rest of the story. This is what fucked with me on a human level, is they're all happy and they're joking. And the kid's got his visor, his McDonald's visor, and it's kind of askew, and he's wearing it sideways. And they're joking, and he sees me come up, and he goes, hey, can I help you? And out of his peripheral vision, he sees his manager come around the corner, and you know, like, uh, uh, um, his face just went, oh, fuck. And he zipped his visor straight and forward, and he made eye contact with me, like, whoo! Like, we just beat the system. <laughs> and, you, and it was just, it was a very subtle moment, but it was one of those moments you go, fuck, you forget people live like this. Where beating the system means, oh, fuck, I gotta keep my hat straight. That was, like, that's his day. Like, what the fuck does that matter? You, people live, they, they take this shit so seriously. I hate it. I, there's something in your job that you do every day in your fucking stupid cubicle here. It's, I don't understand how this town works. It's just fucking glass and metal and fluorescent tubes and you all show up here so f fucking dead. Just lifeless, dead people staring at someone to make your life interesting. I don't know what you want. I mean, there's so many sweater vests that have shown up at my show over the last three shows, and I don't know what the fuck you want. Some of you are my crowd, and other people are just wayward fucking goats of the system. That It's Saturday, so you know after 60 hours, you got to pick something out of the weekend section and go to it. Oh, I, I want to set you all on fire. <laughs> We're taping for XM Radio tonight. So I'm going to mention XM Radio a lot, especially in my favorite bits, because if you mention their name, then they'll fucking play it a lot. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> 
I'm sick. Like fighting a fucking, trying to fight a flu with Jägermeister, and I think it's working. <laughs> and it makes perfect sense. You get a fucking virus. You want to disinfect something, you wipe it down with alcohol, right? Yeah. Yeah. So far, I'm feeling better. <laughs> Fuck it. I drank quite a bit last night. You know how much? $97. That, that's how much I drank. I drink quite a bit every night because I am a drunk. <laughs> but I don't normally know how much I drink in a dollar amount. Because every other comedy club on the face of the planet would never charge a comic for alcohol. Anywhere, ever. This club is different, so now I know how much I drank. $97 plus gratuity. I gratuitized well. <laughs> You're a, I'm a fucking alcohol salesman. That's what I do. You don't charge me. It's like if I was, I was a fucking Coke dealer. I'm the guy I'm fucking pimping it on the street, and I go to my supplier, and I go, you want to do a rail? Well, you know how, how much it costs. No. It's what I charge them, asshole. I know what you pay for it. That's what I'm doing for you. I'm selling alcohol. You don't give a fuck about comedy. The best Western is not here to promote the arts. They're here to sell fucking booze. And I'll tell you one thing. I don't toot my own horn a lot, but as far as being a drunk on stage, when it comes to being an alcohol salesman, I'm the Ricky Roma in this industry, cocksucker. <laughs> you want to sell alcohol, you give me a free supply, and I'll sell the fucking booze to the fucking poople heads. That's <laughs> an Al Swearingen reference from Deadwood. Ooh, not a Deadwood fan in the house. <laughs> Awful. A drunk. With Deadwood. Deadwood. We're drunk now. Good. Get, get to be a more fun drunk. This crowd needs the guy with the lampshade. <laughs> right. Did you ever fake Parkinson's disease so you don't have to admit that you're a reckless alcoholic in the morning? That all that shaking is just congenital? Oh, no, I'm just nervous. No, you ain't nervous. You're a fucking rummy. Pour another fucking shot down your head, loser. <laughs> Fuck it. It's been a fun ride, but Jesus. I'm 38 years old now, and it gets to a point where you want to be a drunk and a fuck-up at 38. You're drinking alone a lot of the time because your friends, they're gone. They fucked up. You age, the bar stays 23 years old. You keep getting older, bar's always 23, and then you're the weird, creepy guy at the end of the bar watching the sports bloopers with no volume because you ain't got shit to say to the person next to you. You're 23. What, you're going to tell me about your fucking ringtone? I got 50 cents. I got, I got problems, Captain. I, and you're not a fucking guy I can talk to about it. Because I had friends when I started. I was 23 once, too, and there was a bunch of us getting fucked up. And one by one over the years, you dropped out, and you got sucked into the system, and you got sucked into that office building, and you started taking shit seriously. Uh, why? Well, what, 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 well, I can't drink with you on a Wednesday, man. Come on, man. Well, you can't leave me with these 23-year-olds. I'm sitting there paying $9 a fucking drink with no one to talk to. Come on now. Can't, man. You used to when you were 26, you just had some shitty job and you didn't give a fuck about working hungover, but then they gave you a title and now you take yourself seriously. They moved you up $4 an hour and gave you a fucking white shirt instead of the blue Oxford and a fucking bigger name tag and now you're gonna, oh, I can't drink with you on a Wednesday, man. I got responsibilities. I'm the, I'm the manager of the factory now. I got responsibilities. No, faggot, you got the keys is what you got. You got the, you got the keys to that closed factory. We could be drinking there. You're leaving me here with these kids. We could be drinking at the factory, drinking Costco price beer, having forklift races. You weren't such a douchebag acting like you're important. What the fuck is that? 
Remember? You were the guy that used to fucking not give a shit if your visor was askew at McDonald's. Remember you? <laughs> now you're it's horrible. I know you get to pay a bill. We all get to pay bills, but you don't have to <coughs> suck a dick. Take a day off, man. Like, uh, <laughs> pay a bill. You don't need that much shit. Hooker's a fucking great alternative. I, uh, I used to respect and adore hookers, and now I envy hookers. A great fight. You, you know what? Especially in this town, look, look at that. You're, you're wearing the fucking uniform of the boring. You have the khaki pants and the blue Oxford that I make fun of. And it's too tight. You're uncomfortable in it. You get fucking caught up. This area especially, you're so status driven with your fucking titles. And it's, that's why Hooker is great. Because you don't get, they don't get caught up in the status of it. Right? Hooker doesn't get caught up. Hooker Entry-level hooker starts at the most she's ever worth. That's her best day is her first day on the job. That's when she's worth the most. And every day after that is years working her way down to eventually 525 an hour. <laughs> Fucking hooker looks at my job like a long day. If I was sucking dick, I'd be done by now. So take off your blue Oxford, suck a dick, work a half day Monday, give a fucking lunchtime hand job to some fucking queer senator, and then go catch a doubleheader of the Nationals. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta talk to my sound guy over there every now and then. He's the other XM radio guy. Sonny Fox, the guy that's actually going to broadcast this on XM, well, he took shit seriously, and he has to go home early. <laughs> yeah, I got responsibilities here at XM. <laughs> do you want, do you, are you, is this town excited about the Nationals? Because I, I was an Expos fan. Just because I fuck, who gives a fuck about baseball? Baseball players are all douchebags for whatever. <laughs> They're like cops. They're, they're, they're the most joyless sport. They look like cops. They, like any other sport, they're happy to be there and they high five and they pump up the crowd. And baseball players all sit around with their arms crossed with that smug arrogance like cops have. You know, when you see cops, they pulled you over for no registration, but you're a fucking minority, so they had to bring out 12 of them and spend 45 minutes doing And they all just sit there with that smug, self-assured, I'm a joyless cocksucker look on their face. That's what baseball players look like. This unhappy fucking date rapists. Even the, even the Red Sox, man. The Red Sox, they're supposed to be the scruffy team. And yeah. Well, whatever. That's not the point. The point is they even they still look like fucking narcs, even though they're scruffy. Would you buy pot from Johnny Damon? No. Like, fucking cut your hair, you fake hippie. You look like a narc. You're no Serpico. But I, I always have a favorite, no matter what the sport. And the Expos were my favorite because it's, it's like Delaware. It's a, what team you forget exists. You forget Delaware is a state. Maybe not you because you're near it, but everyone else doesn't know it's a state. And the Expos, you forgot we're a team. But you get the Nationals now that were the Expos. And evidently they're going to fucking trash the queer section of town to build the stadium. Is that the... There was, a, yeah, there was a homosexual uproar. Uproar. Hang on. Uproar. Can I get another small shot of Jägermeister? <laughs> There's some death for you. <laughs> no, there was, a, there, there, were, there, there, there was a very small story. Not that the queers usually make the fucking big print, but... Yeah, because like, there's a, evidently a big gay area around here where they're going to tear down to build the stadium. And they were upset where I wish I had the number to the gays so I could call them. Because don't protest. Just adopt the Nationals as America's gay team. <laughs> Ain't shit they can do about it. 
just get the fucking queer networking going and just go, yeah, no, we're going to love the Nationals and we're going to show up every fucking doubleheader, every matinee game and fucking Daisy Dukes with a hairy ass cheek coming out the bottom, t-shirt t- tied up between the tits, glory holes drilled in the men's room wall. They keep trying to duct tape over those glory holes, but... <laughs> Every Saturday, there's a new one drilled. <laughs> Just make it the gay team, eh? What do they? They can't. It's kind of like gang members made the Raiders the fucking gang member team. You don't think the Raiders were surge to seeking that out? They don't want the fucking gang members stabbing people in the stands for wearing a Chargers jersey. Too fucking bad. Gang members chose you. Suck it up. Maybe that's why they hired a fucking 38-year-old quarterback to suck for a few years. Maybe get rid of him. Maybe they'll be too embarrassed to support us. Go Raiders! Go Raiders! Yeah, whatever. <laughs> fucking arrogant asshole fans I, I, you don't hate the team you hate the fans that are arrogant douchebags about supporting the team I don't, all you are is a fucking chump sitting in the stands drinking overpriced beer and you're the fucking dupe I mean, if you're going to root for someone I, yeah, I like sports because I gamble on them I, I have money on the game that's the difference. If you have money on the game, it's kind of like having stock in a company. You're part of the team. Huh? You have a vested interest. You're just going to be some shithead screaming in the fucking stands, pick an underdog and have some character, right? That's why I hate Yankees fans. Well, I mean, if you're going to be an arrogant prick about him, like, because they are. They're so arrogant, but the Yankees bought their team, man. They're supposed to win. They spend more money than anyone else. They're supposed to win. They have the edge. So if you're going to be a shithead about that's so, like, weak of character. Be, the, to, to be a, 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 a loudmouth cocksucker yelling for the Yankees, unless you have money on the game. <laughs> That's the same as going to a casino and cheering for the house. <laughs> and being a cunt about it, too. It's like standing behind a blackjack table. Oh, dealer busted your ass, bitch, huh? That's my dealer, faggot. Have some of that. Have some of that. You, you don't even have money on the table, douche. What are you fucking talking about? Of course you're supposed to win. You didn't take any chance here whatsoever. I can hate that. America loves an underdog. Bullshit. America loves an underdog like a coyote likes a three-legged cat. <laughs> America would rape and fucking pillage and chuck an underdog under the bus. Unless the underdog won first and then they could hop on its bandwagon going, I was here the whole time. <laughs> America is a fucking mindless, meathead, limp dick, angry mob without a cause. <laughs> Terrible place. <laughs> America jumped the shark, Captain. I think it was 9 11 where it, jump the shark is part of the average nomenclature, is it not? I don't talk to a lot of people anymore. They depress me or they want something. <laughs> Jump the Shark, old people. Jump the Shark, a guy came out with a book, and it was all the sitcoms, and fucking, where did they fall apart? And Fonzie jumped the shark in Happy Days, and then it sucked because it was too stupid. So it's kind of the kids, that's how the kids talk, old folks. I'm, yeah, let me be the interpret, interpreter. I'm a few years behind you, but catching up quick. <laughs> That's why uh, 9/11 was the point where America it was already on that trajectory of shit. This whole safe and sober nation, up with people, banality of security and responsibility. That was already, but 9/11 kind of solidified the end of fun. <laughs> so that was you know somewhere around 1985 they called last call and September 11th. That's when they actually chucked you out the door. <laughs> A slow burn. That's when the news jumped the shark. Can't watch the fucking news anymore. After 9/11 was fucking fantastic as far as entertainment value. 
I mean, nothing can top that as far as excitement. That was a moment in our lives. We, you can't top that in the fucking news. What? I mean, yeah, the tsunami was that was fun for a while. It was closer to home, and there was better footage, better camera angles. But and Katrina was yeah you know, interesting for a minute. But it is without aliens or nuclear holocaust, you ain't gonna fucking top 9/11 for entertainment purposes. But. I mean, what else is in the new fucking George W. Bush? Whatever. It's the same boring fucking joke over it because it, it's a cancer that no one wants to get rid of, but it doesn't get any different. There's nothing interesting about it. It's the same story. Iraq is the same fucking story every day. It's pointless to read the paper. Okay, eight guys died and a truck exploded and there's a rocket attack and then they killed those guys and blah, blah, blah. And it's... I'm in Cincinnati last week. I don't know if this made national news... Got the paper, the local paper. A uh, retard uh, uh, killed his autistic roommate? And you're like, thank God, that's so hilarious. I, just because it's not Iraq. Is it not another boring, exact same story for the same, that many uh, This is uh, retard kills autistic guy. Uh, that story shouldn't beg for comedy, but it did because it's just something different. Cause, well, first of all, I'm one of those guys that gets into those drunken bar conversations about who'd win in a fight, was Superman or Batman? Oh, no. <laughs> who'd win, a, a tiger or a bear? And Now I know, yeah, retard beats autistic. I don't have to have that. Cross that argument off. I don't, I don't know which way I went. I don't know who I bet on, but yeah, all right, who, now we know. But it's just something new and refreshing. It's, and hilarious. They should put that shit in the Special Olympics. That's fucking fantastic. Death matches. <laughs> put them in the Special Olympics. Ooh, retard just moved on to the medal round with a decisive victory over the autistic guy. That quiet rocking back and forth is no match for the violent outburst of a fucking Cape Jod Tard. <laughs> Next up, multiple sclerosis versus hydrocephalic. This ought to be interesting. Hydrocephalic has won six straight matches, but he's trying not to get a big head about it. And for the bronze, we have Dane Cook versus Larry the Cable Guy. Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, I don't deny them their money. <laughs> this is a fucking mediocre world. They're deciding to play along. I'd rather fight back. I don't need a lot of shit. Don't care to be famous. Yeah, get her done. It'd be funny to just just start doing that like it's my catchphrase. Like, like uh, thievery in, in the industry, that's, yeah, that's the big no-no. It, it, we, it's a self-policing industry comedy, but if we were to all just start stealing, get her done, no, it would be wicked funny. Even though, yeah, comics would all be on that, yeah. yeah. Get her done. Everybody do it. Just start selling it. Get her done. Sell get her done bumper stickers. Because the retards who buy get her done, they're not going to know it's different. I always thought he's. They're cashing in. I, I, it's, a, it, it's, it's kind of a. You, know, you, you walk that moral line. Like, at what point do I fucking just sell out and join these fucking idiots? <laughs> Go to bed on a Wednesday. <laughs> it's a fucking most boring generation in the history of humanity like it's so dull if you're a young person and you're alive right now you got fucked man there's <laughs> shit going on there's nothing girls gone wild i apologize for that i <laughs> I did it one. I did one tape, and they advertised that one stupid drunk thing. I, all I was hired to do is go fuck with drunk idiots, and drink and smoke on the job for one week. And fuck with morons for a lot of money. 
Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that they would take like one thing I said and make it my inadvertent catchphrase for the rest of my life to show me where babies feed. As I said a million things that week. That's just the one they pulled out to put on a commercial. I don't, I don't like being known as the girls gone wild guy. Because most people, 99 point a lot percent of people don't know who the fuck I am. And the best you could do to describe me would be, you know that girl's gone wild, show me where babies feed guy? I don't want to be the... Because the other girl's gone wild guy is the owner of Girls Gone Wild, who is the creepiest fuck I've ever met in my life. And he has a horrible reputations and all his fucking allegations of fucking sexual deviancy against fucking uh, drugged women. Like, all, I don't want some guy like you, some fucking greased back fucking Italian dad going, Oh, you're the girl's gone wild guy? You raped my daughter. No, no, I think you're confusing me with the owner of Girls Gone Wild. I was just hired to make the rape funny. I was just chucking out a few one-liners at the foot of the bed while she swapped for DNA. I'm not... I had nothing to do with it. I just thought it'd be fun. <laughs> so, so fucking sad. But, but really, I, 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 I'm not saying that you, your generation is boring like you're boring as people. You've just been brought into a boring time and you don't know enough to fight back. Because you're just distracted with all the toys and the fucking... Oh, I have ADD. Of course you have ADD. That's your brain trying to catch up, asshole. Everyone, if you're evolving, you have ADD. Because there's a fucking ten-minute ticker and a news crawler on the TV with the weather up here and the cell phone's ringing and there's a text message and there's a fucking bell and whistle going off and you got shit to... That's your brain trying to speed up. I... <laughs> and meanwhile, while you're so distracted with all your fucking bells and whistles, the country is turning into this... To call it mediocre, it's just the same. Like, wait, what, where's it? Like, I played Kentucky was a, a few months ago or whatever. Used to be when you, I, I, 16 years ago, I started comedy. It, you get a gig in Kentucky, you know you're going to get 10 good minutes out of the fucking horrible stereotypes that you're about to encounter of all the backwoods <laughs> fucking idiots. I go to Kentucky in November. You know what Kentucky's like? It's kind of like Omaha, which is kind of like Peoria, which is kind of like Appleton, which is kind of like fucking San Angelo, Texas, which is kind of like the same as every other fucking place from the Baltimore Harbor all the way to Barstow. It's the same fucking franchise, box store, Best Buy next to an Applebee's, next to a Circle K, next to a fucking home country cooking, next to a fucking BP, next to a same franchise. It's every exit on the freeway from coast to coast is like Groundhog's Day. It's just the same shit. Another Super 8 motel, another Ponderosa steakhouse with a fucking fa six families of suede belly hogs and eight deep at the sneeze guard just staring at the deep fried. They can't even move for the food. They're mesmerized. They're finger fucking the macaroni and cheese with their eyes. They can't even touch it. They just gotta enjoy it with their just glasses steaming up just from the perspiration of wondering how it's gonna be going down their gullet. You think this is a fat fucking country now. Oh, America's so OB. You think we're fat now. You wait till all these anti-smoking ordinances kick in. You think we're fat now, you fuck? It's gonna be a fucking gigantic ordination of irritable fucking... Imagine every cigarette smoked at that bar is gonna be traded in for a jalapeno popper. Because it's cold out. That's a fat, miserable, irritable country exploding in their chairs. <laughs> I'm in a place now, smoking is an addiction, and it used to be funny. 
It's funny here because you're all smoking. We can smoke. We still laugh about it. I'm an addict. I'm such an addict, too. It's funny. I'm, I'm going to die from this. I can't even quit. I'm going to die. But you're going to die of something. <laughs> and then when you're alone in all these non-smoking places, most of the country, and you're the guy who had to get up three times during dinner and leave the family function go smoke outside and look through the window it's not fun did he get up three times during dinner he's he's an addict he, i mean he's gonna die wait remember ha 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 i'm gonna die that was more fun do you fly if you fly now they fucking take away your lighter that's you, when you know because you don't think about it when you give away your lighter to the cocksucker and security you think about it nine hours later after two layovers and a cheap ticket and you fucking finally get to where you're going i'm going to canada and then i'm like oh thank god i'm off the plane oh fuck customs oh shit what are you doing in our country i don't even remember man i think i think i'm here to smoke that's all i can remember i came here to smoke maybe i'm a terrorist i'll i'll sign a confession put me in guantanamo are you, you tied with that chain that sends people to guantanamo i just want a cigarette i'll confess the get go ahead get through that you get the baggage claim, fuck my bags, that's thrift store shit anyway. You can keep my bags, I'm just going outside for a cigarette. You get into the parking lot, I got the cigarette is dangling from my lips. And I'm like, thank you, God. Oh, this is going to be the best cigarette. Let me check my pockets for a... You motherfuckers! You motherfuckers, you took my lighter, man! It's, like, it's 10.30 at night. There's no matches out here. There's no other guy. It's just tumbleweeds and me. That's addiction. There's no more ha-ha-ha, I'm an addict. That's a, when you're ready to suck dick for fire. There's just fire, man. That's not even a drug. That's a that's a basic element of the earth, and I'll fucking I'll long tonsil you for it. That's caveman level addiction. It'll tickle your balls for sparks. Anything you've got. Two sticks. But it's just another example of. How this country's going backwards as far as, you know, uh, personal freedoms, individual liberties. And smoking's not, that's not even something that's fun. That's just something you count on doing when you're figuring out how to have fun. What are we going to do today? You uh, can't even do that, and that's your fucking business. When you listen to older generations, bitch... Every, the old people you knew when you were a little kid, when you were young, you were a little kid, and you had fucking the old people would always complain. They always complained about the next generation being too out of control, and they're too deviant. They got no morals. These kids are crazy. These kids today, they smoke these marijuana sticks I read in the newsprint, and it makes them crazy. And they, they, they go crazy and they, they, they go flying off of buildings and they rape white women. It's crazy. They got no, no more. In our day, if you wanted to have fun, you just went to a barn dance. And we didn't even finger fuck till we were like 35 years old or whatever. It was always that the new kids were taking too many chances and they were pushing it too far. We're going to be the first generation of old people. We're going to be on walkers holding our piss bag in our fucking hands. That are the opposite of those guys. You go, Look at these kids today, these half-faggots. We, we used to do crank off of titty dancers. Remember that? We didn't care what her tattoo said. Now these pussies, they drink a Red Bull and they go outside to smoke. And the closest they've come to a fist fight is on a message board. <laughs> Fucking zero adrenaline. You looking at my girl? I'm going to delete you from my MySpace friends. How do you like that? Thank you. Sad. Baby, I'm out of cigarettes.
Yeah, I got one. If you got some. Hate to go into the crowd for that. Can't handle during my act. Thank you. You're a doll and you're beautiful. That was my bald-headed girl. She just got out of an insane asylum. And she's bald. And you know what I love about that? That. <laughs> wow. That's fantastic. You're one of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my life. You fuck a bald girl. You kind of question your sexuality sometimes from behind. I fucked her from behind during the uh, Pittsburgh-Cincinnati playoff game. <laughs> We're on a couch. I'm fucking her from behind. And it was right when Carson Palmer got his fucking knee blown out and they put in Kitna. And John Kitna from behind, she looked a little bit like John Kitna. And I had money on the Bengals. And I, and I'm like, I don't know if this is a jinx or not. I don't know if I'm clear or not, but I lost my money. We're in, <laughs> we're, in we're in Tampa, and this radio DJ is a funny fuck, and she shaves her head completely bald, so he's a funny prick, and he goes, so do the uh, carpets match the drapes? And I go, no, her head's not bleeding right now. <laughs> a funny line. I gotta put that in my act somewhere. There's gotta be some sign you can come up with if you are bleeding just to warn a guy. <laughs> I mean, if you're in a place where, you know, fucking, like, your dance club or whatever, where fucking is the end, end game, but you are bleeding, you got drug out by your girlfriends or whatever, you, you want to warn a guy off. I don't know. I know you... It's going to be some kind of way of knowing. I know you can't just say it. Oh, hey, what's your name? My name is, I'm bleeding like a beheaded chicken right now. But there's going to be some you can do so I don't fucking waste seven hours buying all the drinks just to get back to your fucking rent-to-own couch. My hand is right down your pants right at the pubic bone before you go, um, you know, I should have told you a long time and a lot of money ago. Come up with a system, a fucking kind of support the troops ribbon, but it's crimson and clotted. I don't know. A sign. The park fairies do it. They want to you know, get a fucking handkerchief hanging out of one pocket if they want to suck your dick in a public toilet. They get some system worked out. Do the same thing. Put a burning tire around your neck. I don't fucking know. Where's all the new drugs? Right here. <laughs> what is it? What do you got that's new? What do you want? Something that I haven't done. I've been doing drugs since 85. The only new drug that's come out is crank. Thanks, thanks, America. <laughs> Crystal meth is the drug of our generation. Like the... Ice, ice. Well, yeah, the prescription drug's a problem. There's no illicit narcotics that are, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar business. You'd think you'd throw some new product out to keep us interested. <laughs> Ain't nothing to do. Yeah, scripts. That's the only new drugs they do are the ones to fucking, the, the, like the mood alterators or you know, the, the antidepressant, all the ones that keep you happy working in a cubicle. The, those are the dangerous drugs. Those are the ones you did take away your individuality and they medicate against things that shouldn't be medicated against. I alphabetize insurance forms 45 hours a week and I noticed I couldn't concentrate as well as I should. So now I'm on Adderall and I can just flip through uh, alphabetizing and say, you shouldn't want to do that. No, no, your natural instincts think this is bad. Don't be in this building. Run. Yeah. You, you, you shouldn't take anger management because you uh, get road rage for sitting in traffic for an hour and a half each way to work in stuck fucking traffic. You should be very fucking angry. <laughs> and that anger should motivate you to do something that doesn't require you sitting in fucking traffic. You, you, you're, you're medicating against the... There's illicit narcotics you can take that will make alphabetizing those forms seem like an empty life and make you stop. You have mushrooms, do those. They're the mushrooms that are illegal. They're, that's why they are illegal, because it makes you think that... That's why cocaine is illegal. Because it makes pussy too easy to get. <laughs> and 
pussy is the big motivating factor. If you could just put out a line and fuck her, oh, that'd ruin the whole economic process. No, you're gonna have to put in fucking 50 hours at a hump job so you can finally afford a booming sound system and a spoiler for your fucking low-riding Honda so hopefully you can impress some pussy to fuck you. That's the grift. I noticed that when I was a younger girl, I was very promiscuous. And I'm going to tell you right now, I slept around a lot. But now I'm in therapy and they have me on Wellbutrin. And my therapist tells me that the reason that I was sleeping around was because I have a low self-esteem. And my father, he didn't spend a lot of time with me when I was growing up. And maybe you just like the feeling of cock going in and out of you, just hammering cock. Maybe that felt good. Maybe there's no psychological reason. To, maybe the fucking cock pounding in and out of your slop hole is fucking... Maybe your clitoris is not an anomaly. That's not some weird male nipple with no purpose. Maybe it's there because it makes you want to take cock. <laughs> Take another fucking pill and look like another off-ramp in Kentucky. It fucking sucks. It's a suck time to be alive. And you don't want to sound bitter, but if you're not, you're not thinking it through. Jesus, if I die early and I have good odds in a few death years. Because of my lifestyle. Don't ever say, it's sad he died young. Maybe I'm going to die right on fucking time because the future looks really goddamn boring. <laughs> and you ain't opening up no windows of opportunity to jump through. When people, artists die young, they always fucking, ooh, it's so sad he died young. He could have brought so much more to the table. Maybe we'll never get to hear what he would have... Maybe they died right on fucking time. Maybe if they didn't die young, they would have just ended up bitter, drunk, angry men at a fucking Best Western yelling at people. <laughs> How do you know? How do you know they wouldn't have just ended up fucking caving in and sucking or going to bed early like Sonny Fox? <laughs> How do you know? How do you know Jimi Hendrix, if he had lived, maybe he'd be doing Super Bowl halftime duets with Elton John. Do you, do you know otherwise? That's a good possibility. Most people end up sucking. Count on your fingers, the old people that are still relevant in the art form. How do you know Lenny Bruce wouldn't have ended up being taken over Andy Rooney's spot at the end of 60 minutes behind a cluttered desk bitching about ATM fees. Oh, too bad he died young. Maybe, 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 maybe Hedberg died two days before he was scheduled to be at the Baltimore Improv because He's been there before, and he knows what it feels like to try to be an artist in an environment where they make you feel like you should be wearing a name tag and 30 pieces of flair. <laughs> Maybe it was just in time. Could I please have one more beer? <laughs> Am I depressing you? I wrote this set tonight because I, you know, I couldn't repeat shit from the old XM thing from last year, so I'm trying to dodge around bits I did before, and I started to read the fucking set list, and I'm like, well, this is really fucking depressing, but fuck it. It's what I got. It's sad. Is that, is that his fifth cigarette in one set? He's an act. It's sad. He's going to kill himself. Has he got another beer? <laughs> I heard him on XM and I think he had a tuba backing him up. <laughs> Jesus died for your sins, ladies and gentlemen. I'm doing it just for your mere entertainment value. And that is far more important and admirable than dying for your sins. <laughs> 
Because what that fake Jesus didn't ever think through is your sins are the only interesting thing about you, dreary cocksuckers. <laughs> you boring fucks. All the things you keep secret are fantastic. And you could be telling those stories right now. And <laughs> your sins are fucking... The sins are what make you good and real and human. God's sake, he died for him. I live for your sins, for fuck's sake. I can't wait to hear those stories. Your sins are all the shit. You call him up one morning. Dave, you can't tell anyone this. You promise? This is what happened. And you go, oh, it's all right. It's cool with me, man. I ain't going to say shit. Click, he calls you. Man, Dave told me not to say shit, but this is too good. That's why you repeat those stories, because they're great. Wear those stories on your sleeve. You fucking die for your sin. You start a story right now about what a good Christian man you are and how you walk the walk and you talk the talk and you're filled with the love and blooming effervescent light of Jesus blowing out of every hole in your fucking awkward orb. And you start a story about that one time you kick-fucked a girl with cerebral palsy and we'll see who draws a crowd. Even your fucking boring guy on a stick could leave your story for that. Yeah, I pray for you too. Whatever. I gotta hear this. What? You kicked fuck out. What? <laughs> Did a who? Was she into that? Was it against her will? And what kind of lubricant? You are a fucking star attraction at this table. <laughs> Sins make you good. You know what? I'm not a big fan of you guys either. <laughs> you guys are right. You can talk back to me if you want. There you go. It's a fucking. That's why when I'm president, I'm wearing this fucking every day for four years. <laughs> Slippers in a bathrobe, because you know why? It's fucking comfortable. And I'm playing in the hotel. I get off work, I hit my floor, and I'm home. <laughs> what the fuck am I gonna dress up for you for? What do you give a shit what I wear? I want to be, I'm comfy. I'm sick, man. <laughs> you a cop? No, that, yeah, that guy. I know, I got kind of retard eyes. You can't always tell, but you in the pink shirt. Are you a cop or something? Who talked you into the mustache then? I just, I profile for cops in my show. A shit job. I got some presidential platforms, but I, I picked out an uh, outfit is bathrobe and slippers and pajamas, but I didn't work on a platform, so maybe I, I have my priorities wrong. Do you hear the music in it? It's fantastic music. Just just 30 seconds of silence in this fucking day and age makes people so horribly uncomfortable. There's, there's, there's nothing happening. There's, I need some flashing in my face. I don't know what. Something's ter terribly wrong. He hasn't talked in 30 seconds. This is fucked. I love it. <laughs> Name me one thing that is better today than it was 20 years ago. Tits? Implants, yeah, okay, all right, I'll give you implants, yeah. Breast implants are better. I have no problem with breast, I mean, people who, I like a natural tit. You're talking about a tit that was nice naturally. You're not talking about the fucking puppy mill mother of six. <laughs> fucking gym sock full of vomit swing it tit. At that point, yeah, you'd prefer implant. Name me something else. Porno. Porno is not better. I don't think. I, 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 this is a judge, it's an opinion. 
but I think porno, like, there's all the porno chicks look the same. They all have, uh, they're so overly made up and uh, fake blood. They all look like real dolls, and they all look like the same one. At least before you knew one from the other. Porn star doesn't mean shit anymore. They're all just a fucking a empty, yeah. What else? Weed, I don't smoke. I do all the other drugs. I've given weed plenty of opportunities, and it didn't work for me. Just not my drug. I'm a psychedelics guy. <laughs> Ecstasy, if it's good, you can't find it anymore. Men in pink robes. Uh, Men in pink robes. Uh, see, you're dying as bad as me back there. <laughs> It's all this fucking say like the cars all look the same now. Can you tell the difference between a Nissan Altima or a Honda Accord or a fucking Hyundai Sonata? They all look exactly the same. People look the fuck. You know how we, like bars will relive generations? Hey, it's 70s night down at the VIP lounge. Come on down and put on your bell bottoms and we'll dance to disco music. It'll be just like the 70s without the drugs and the fucking in the streets. And, you know, it's like, they relive all the bad parts, but how are we going to relive this decade? How do we relive this in 30 years? Relive the fucking aughts or the fucking oh nothings. Come on down and just dress up like a normal guy in a normal shirt with a normal haircut and look like the guy next to you with a baseball hat on. It'll be just like the 90s without any good music. <laughs> the whole is all the fucking same. The TV shows, every sitcom is a fat, stupid guy with a fucking quippy wife that's too hot to fuck him in real life. And that everyone's the same. TV, I stopped watching TV just because... Like, I'm not a TV... I thought I'd get more done. Hey, you know what? I'm going to get more done if I stop watching TV. Nah. Nah, I just sit on the fucking internet. I'm not a TV snob. Do you hate the fucking TV snobs? The people... Why don't you... Why don't you read a book? You watch TV all day. Read a book. Well, what the fuck? A book is escapism just like TV is. Only it takes longer to do. And you can't share it with someone. You can't read a book and go, Ah, oh, that's funny. Do you think, though, oh, that's right. You're not reading it with me. <laughs> can't do that but it's all escapism it's a different form of escapism but we're not doing shit you watch tv for nine hours i read a book for nine hours do you have laundry done no neither do i shut your fucking hole we haven't done shit you write a book then you've done something then you can come stick your finger up my ass and tell me how much better you are than me and you have a point till then <laughs> pointless so much of it the, the the, I mean, you can read bad books and watch good TV. What, what are you reading? That's so, uh, are you reading Tom Clancy? Oh, enlighten me about how much you learned. Wow, it read just like a screenplay without the product placement. I can almost see Harrison Ford in this book. <laughs> Fucking hate commercial. The most disgusting commercial I've ever seen. Don't worry, we're getting very close to the end. In more ways than one. <laughs> I did this last year at the XM taping, but it's funnier now. <laughs> the commercial, have you seen a commercial where they've rescued a duck from an oil spill? You know what I'm talking about? It's an actual duck. It's not like a computer animated you know, Daffy Duck to lure the kids in. It's not a stunt duck. It's an actual dying duck from an actual oil spill. It's coated in thick, crude oil dying in front of your eyes. And they're desperately trying to save its life by scrubbing it in a sink. Not so desperately that they didn't wait to take the duck out of an oil spill, think of the idea, go to Hollywood, pitch the idea, get an okay, then build an entire set with a sink to, to film the duck in, bring in a camera crew. Can you keep that duck alive a few more weeks? We're having some union problems with the lighting guys. He's cocksucker. Don't clean the duck. No, we need that duck dirty. That dirty duck is gold. Don't... No, put a tube down his neck, chuck crackers down the fucking thing. I need a dirty duck, motherfucker. 
you don't think of that right away. You just see a dying duck and you hope it lives. Most people were pro-duck on the commercial and they hoped it lived. But either way, we have 30 seconds to find out. Either way, I'm going to invest the time because you think it's a commercial for an environmental issue. You think, you know... Exxon's going to apologize or some shit, it's some charity, and then right at the end, after your heartstrings are all pulled down, it's for fucking Dawn Dish Soap. Right at the end, Dawn Dish Soap. We make your silverware sparkly clean, and then we save a duck on the side. If we have a day off and we're down near a duck and happen to notice, and then do it. You motherfucker, it's what a creeper thing where you, you go... Is that the most vulgar, is that the most obscene exploitation of a tragedy just to promote some dumb dollar store product? Is, is that not exactly like using a rape victim to promote a feminine hygiene wash? <laughs> when we first found Elizabeth Smart after wandering the streets of Salt Lake for six months with her weirdy kidnap her homeless husband her little baby bald snatch was dripping sap like a vermont maple but after just a few swipes with a cheesecloth on a broom handle and a new can of jizz be gone let's take a look inside her oh she's good as new and back to mormon on sale now at Walgreens. <laughs> Fucking disgusting. <laughs> Has anyone here been molested as a child? <laughs> Seriously. I I have two friends that have, they're both comics and they're both fucking realistic about it. I don't give a fuck. It's something I can make jokes about. No one? Because I, I, I've never been molested, but I don't understand why if you've been molested as a child, you get to wear that big Jesus cross for the rest of your life. And nothing you do is wrong. I'm sorry I'm late for work, but I was molested as a child. And I have a lot of issues. I'm, so, I'm sorry that I let you buy me dinner and take me to the movies. And then when you try to kiss me goodnight, I burst into tears and made you listen to my long, awkward stories till dawn. On, but I was molested as a child. I'm sorry that I only left a quarter cup of milk in the bottom of the container. Not nearly enough to eat your cocoa puffs and <laughs> to give a fuck to replace it. But you have to remember that I was touched inappropriately. <laughs> and people let that slide. And I don't, I've never been molested, so I don't know if it's that devastating. But I can't imagine where it would be. Because when you juxtapose that against violence towards children, there's pride in that. People, how many times have you heard that shit? Fuck that. We didn't have no time out as kids. We got our ass kicked. Right, Bobby? High, high five, baby. We got our ass kicked. Come on. My dad, I mouthed off to him. He kicked me in the taint. Fucking whacked me in the eye with a soup ladle. Fucking gave me stitches. That's right. Huh? High five, Bobby. They pride themselves on being beaten. But if you get fucking touched a little bit, oh, well, I can't go on with my life. No, I've never been molested. But you know what? I've had the shit kicked out of me both as a child and as an adult. And guess what? If at any point in a shit kicking at any age, including tonight, you stop in the middle and offer me that option of you just fondle me for a while, guess what? I'm going plan B every time. Oh, yeah, no, no. Fucking get up some Vaseline and grab a handful, fat man in a jumpsuit. Yes, help yourself. <laughs> Don't worry about a thing there, creepy, greasy guy with eczema and thick, cloudy, scratched glasses. Yeah, put a digit in me if you have to. Just put down the cocked fist. <laughs> I don't understand. Child molesting is... I mean, it's, it's become such a buzzword for let the government in your life. Because we're protecting you. No, no, we need to regulate porn on the internet because there's child porn and there's predators out there. Guess what? 
the chances are nobody wants to fuck your kid. <laughs> right now, nobody anywhere thinking about fucking your kid. That's the odds. Yeah. I know you hate to think that. I know you want to think that your kid wants, you know, is, is that hot? And, you know, I, I, I'm sure child molesters have taste too. Yeah. <laughs> They probably don't want to fuck your kids, so quit priding yourself and using that as the loophole for the government to come in and fuck up my life because I want to watch a lot of porn. To go, yeah. They want everything. MySpace. Oh, there's child predators all over MySpace. We need to get fucking involved in the MySpace. We need to regulate it. It's going to be about seven minutes and then I'm gone. Okay, just, I don't know if you're pacing back and forth waiting for my drunk ass to get done. Homo. 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 Get up here. I'll fucking suck your dick right now. Do you think it's going to hurt my reputation? Come on, you fucking nitwit. Fucking homo. That's the homo. Who's that fuck? What's your point? I'm trying to do child molestation bits here. And you're casting aspersions my way. <laughs> Nobody wants my space. It's because your 13-year-old daughter put a grainy fucking picture of her ass. There's nothing but an ass right up there and says she's 26. So some guy writes, I want to fuck you. Child molesters, there's predators everywhere. No, your fucking daughter's a whore. <laughs> and guess what? Here's the kicker. Hang on, I just want to pause to be even more unpopular. Guess what, people? Your 13-year-old, she's ready to fuck. Yeah, yeah. Remember that with all the fucking predator child molestation? Yeah, she's ready to fuck. Yeah, she is. All your nonsense, bullshit, Republican and fucking khaki pants talk about... We have to stop playing God. It's not our place to play God be we, we, you know, between abortion and cloning and all this shit. You're playing God every time you try to tell someone when they're ready to fuck. Because God already told you when you're ready to fuck. When you start producing sperm and you stop start bleeding like a fucking speared pig. Yeah, that's when you're ready to fuck. Sperm and blood, yeah, the menstruation, yeah, that's when God... Or we can say nature if you're logical, but for the rest of you, we'll go with your God. That's when you're ready to fuck. Yeah, it's dirty, but it's true. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying they should fuck someone my age, but nature takes care of that, too. I don't want to fuck a 13-year-old for the same reason I don't want to fuck a 20-year-old sorority girl. They're annoying. <laughs> yeah, nature takes care of it. Quit calling the government, you fucking cunts. Government need a babysitter. I don't want to fuck a twenty-year-old for the. I want to sit there. Yeah. Nothing to say. Michelle Wee. Do you know Michelle Wee, the golfer? Fucking hot. Asian chick. She's an Asian chick golfer. It's fucking tall. Drink of fucking Asian. Tall. Drink of fucking yellow rust water. <laughs> hot. And you see a picture. You go. I want to fuck her. Then you find out she's 15. And you go, oh, fuck, I guess I'm a child molester. You go, I don't... But then you hear her talk. She signs an endorsement deal for a fucking $3 million or whatever. And the ESPN covers her. And they go, what are you going to do with the money? And she goes, I never can... I'm going to see the world. And then you go, all right, now I don't want to fuck you. Yeah, nature took care of that. Not a law, not fucking government intervention in my space and on the internet. Yeah, nature. Fucking sad. I've lived a fucked up life. Fifteen year old pussy is not gonna get me hard. Fucking professional pussy has a hard time. Like, all right, I gotta fucking. I'm I'm making you work. I know. <laughs> I know, whore. You haven't dealt with this yet, but <laughs> you've been in the business. It's time to step up. Once you've had that weird drug sex, like the fucked up MDMA riddled uh, anything goes kind of sex with someone you're not gonna see again. She's doing bumps off your cock, or she's having to fucking squeeze enough blood in to keep the bump from falling in the toilet. She's gonna having to fucking 
cradle your cock like a baby in her palm because otherwise it's going to drop down, the bump will fall off, but you keep fucking anyway with a, a sex toy. Shit that's not even sex toys. It's just shit from the dollar store, but it'll fit, so it's a sex toy now. Get it in there. Get up on top of me, 69, and bite on my scrot sack while I put two thumbs in your ass and drink flat champagne out of your coos. That kind of sex is hard to top. <laughs> Fucking 15-year-old Michelle Wees aren't going to be up for this job. I know that. Nature took care of that. Inventorying the anal beads afterwards. So you didn't know you didn't leave something behind. I think there were six on this string, weren't they? You check you, I'll check me. I got glow in the dark anal beads, which are fantastic if there's ever a power outage and you can't find your asshole. That's a homeowner's delight, because you can't call the landlord about that problem. I don't know if that you know it's fucked up sex when you have to use the safe word and you're the aggressor that's tough baby honey say blue dolphin blue dolphin honey your snatch just fell straight out of your pajamas it's on my shoe you didn't say nothing I've had my dick in some fucked up places. I'll tell you about one and then I'll go. I believe I've tested your patience. My favorite thing I stuck my dick in. My favorite for comedy purposes. It's called a rubber fuck my face. It was a gift. I get a lot of smut gifts because I talk dirty and stuff, so people think it's funny to give you a smut gift. Like I got, I got a penis pump once as a gag gift, you know, joke present. I got an inflatable sheep. Shit, they give you a, a Christmas and they laugh. Oh, there, you're dirty, so we thought this was dirty. We were at Spencer Gifts, so we don't have imagination. And you laugh. You go, ha ha ha. Okay, inflatable sheep. And, it's funny, but there's only so long shit like that can hang around your apartment before you have to stick your dick in it, right? It's, it's kind of like the cat or the VCR taunting you every day. Come on, try me. So I get this thing. I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. Listen to this story. I'm in, Ma I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. It's seven, eight years ago, whatever. It's my birthday. I'm working there. It's a one-nighter. And my friend Tim Mitchell is working with me. He's a comic. And he knows it's my birthday. So on stage, they buy me this rubber fuck my face as a gift. It's a actual, that's the actual title of the product, rubber fuck my face. It's a, it's a gelatinous head. Looks like, a, the, look, look, looks like the styrofoam head your grandma would put a wig on. No, it's, it's featureless. But it's, it's clear latex, and it has the open mouth. Welcoming mouth. And there's a, the mouth goes in, the hole goes up, and it kind of curves up through the top of the head to the back, the crown at the back of the head where there is a Kennedy exit hole where you put the vibrating egg... It's a vibrating egg, you know, most ladies, you know, the smut toys, most of them come with the chrome egg on a cord with a control that you control how fast it vibrates and then you put the egg in the Kennedy hole, it makes the whole head vibrate to make it realistic. That's what it says on the side of the box, realistic vibrating rubber fuck my face. I, real, like, maybe you have some epileptic fantasy or... You have some weird rape issue and you want to pretend she's scared shitless. You better shake for me, cunt. I'll cut your fucking eye out. I'm a dangerous man. I'm a fucking bad man. Whatever. They give this to me on stage. They make a big presentation out of it and they give it to me. And ha ha ha, here's your rubber fuck my face. Happy birthday. And I get off stage and it's just me alone with... 
I rubber fucked my face. <laughs> trying to get some happy birthday pussy and no one will fuck me. So I go home alone with my rubber fuck my face. I shovel back to the motel and I get in a room and I look at her. And then she looks at me. She put on something pretty. I turned on porn, whatever. That's. But no, I go, I'm going to fuck the thing. Because, uh, yeah, what do I get to lose? <laughs> Someone going to find out? <laughs> and my dick wouldn't fit in it. It's not my dick. It's a manufacturing flaw. I have a small dick. My dick wouldn't fit in it because over in Hong Kong... Oh, I get no pussy. No one get no pussy. How you like this, Joe? I get your dick in here. Find about that. <laughs> the fucking mouth is like a bottleneck. And keep in mind, I'm not packing maximum density in anticipation of a rubber fuck my face. It's not, it's not like I'm walking home swinging hard lumber. I can't wait to get you. I've had my eye on you all night, baby. You got me so worked up. Now, I know, I'm half whiskey dicked. I'm trying to thumb soft cock in there. Hoping it get hard on the inside, just trying to mushroom it in and then hope for a boner against the odds. And, and then when I, I get kind of a boner, it had like little rubber nub tea things on the inside of the neck that are supposed to sensitize. No, it fucking hurt. It's not sensitized. Yeah, it fucking hurts at this one benefit to an artificial blowjob, it would be the no teeth part, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? But oh, and then, then, then now, disgruntled Dong Lu over in a sweatshop doing line work. Oh, oh, here you go. You get your dick in here, Joe. Booby trap. How you like that? Ow. I think I just start to get a boner and then spit my dick out all half purple. Like, oh, fuck. I'm all hammered in the middle of the night. You... You start jacking off in weird ways like that, you you gain a level of commitment with every minute that goes by. I'm gonna finish, you motherfucker. I'm gonna fuck you sideways. I'm gonna try to spin it on there with corkscrew action. Put some English on it and zing and spin it. What the fuck do you do? What do you do? You spend an hour and a half on your birthday trying to jack off into a rubber fuck. This is a top shelf item. So someone spent a lot of money thinking of you. This is a, it's not some point of interest bag of lotion you just hammer off into and then chuck away. This is like a $129 realistic vibrating rubber fuck my motherfucking face. You just spent an hour and a half of your life trying to fuck it in the middle of the night because it's your birthday. What do you do? Exactly. You throw the rubber fuck my face to the side and you jack off the old-fashioned way with that vibrating egg in your asshole. I thought the exact same thing. Who cares? It's my birthday. And it wasn't bad. Didn't quite get to the prostate like you like, but it was still tingly and fun enough in the sphincter to fucking draw goop. But here's where the problem turned up problem came hours later my friend tim mitchell who gave me the rubber fuck my face to begin with he comes back to the motel staying in the same motel and he bangs on my door i'm long since done it's not like it's still going on over yeah you, know, you feel dirty but that goes away <laughs> he comes into my room and he's just sits down on the bed and he's just bullshitting, talking about the show and the fucking where we're driving to tomorrow, or whatever. Just small talk. And he's sitting on the bed and there's a small piece of paraphernalia of some sort on the foot of the bed. And as he's talking, just as an aside, he flicks it with his finger. He goes, What's that? And he flicks it and it goes, <laughs> and it sticks to the wall. <laughs> you know what it was? It was poop. 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 Evidently, when I yanked the vibrating egg out of my anus, a small dollop of poop trailed after it like a needy child. And now it's sitting at the foot of the bed, 
is splattered all over the hotel wall. It's it's all over Tim Mitchell's face. And he wants an answer. Shit, oh my, that was shit I just flipped it. I got no excuse at all. I have no reason. I'm usually quick with an excuse. You want me to help you move a piano up three flights of stairs? Oh, I just had spinal surgery, but I, I have no excuse for why there's a lump of semi warm poop on a freshly made hotel bed. So I just went, I don't know. And I went on with the conversation. What kind of gas mileage you get in that Pontiac? Like, like, I don't know. Maybe that's just the way I party, and you're weird for not having poop on your bed. I said, oh, I, oh, it's my only game at that point. I had a bluff. You don't have poop. Come on. They leave that there like a mint. What, are you in coach? <laughs> yeah, I'm a sick fuck, and I'm leaving, but it's... You, you need me, you motherfuckers. Frown on me now. Think you know it all. Your fucking blank stares of judgment. Blue Oxfords in your khaki fucking pants. Shit, whole fucking town. You need me. Let's say hypothetically. 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 You fucking know it alls. Say you're fucking a hooker. You're fucking a hooker. In Anchorage, Alaska. And you're doing mushrooms with your good friend Matt Becker, and you're fucking you've been at Coots for a long time, and there's all this fucking ton of fucking hot whores there, and you we're gonna bang one of them, but you got mushrooms, so you take them right away in a panic move, and then you go fuck, I'm still thinking with my dick, I don't want to think with my dick when I'm doing mushrooms, cause that'll blow my trip. Hypothetically, say that's where you are, so you're gonna go fucking to the whorehouse down on Spinard highway it's just right past a country bar it's called ravens or something with an r and uh but you don't have much time it's like 12 20 at night and the whorehouse closes at one it's a whatever they call it if i point is it's a whorehouse and you go in there and there's two chicks left it's the end of the night and they're both hot so you go oh fuck i got lucky and you get one of them back to the room and you pay her the money and she brings you in, and it's like any other fucking you know customer service business where she's you know, it's the end of her day, and she's kind of miserable, and she just gives you the flat choice of missionary or doggy style. What do you choose? Missionary or doggy style? What do you choose? Oh, it's a whole fucking cascade of doggy style. Well, you look at me weird all you want, but you're fucking wrong. You're dead wrong. Listen to someone who knows that made the mistake that you don't have to make now. Doggy style? It's a last call hooker. Did I mention that? She's worked a full day. Did I just mention that she has worked all day in Alaska where every fucking hunter who's been out fucking hunting bears for five days, camping with no shower, has been pumping loads into her on his way out of town? Every crab fisherman that just got off the boat after three months, they give him a $30,000 paycheck all in cash at one time. Do you think he showered before he went out and got some pussy? No. He's scrambling for the pussy. He's dumping loads in her, too. Every sick motherfucker, and you're last in line. All dumped into that pussy that you're fucking, you're, it's like bellows in a fireplace. Which way does stink go? Does it go sideways? Does it go down and then around? No. It goes up, right into your fucking doggy style face. So take that. You're on mushrooms. Did I mention this part of the equation? You're on mushrooms. Your senses are peaked at this point. You could smell a fly fart in a cab with the windows up six blocks away. And you're going to pick doggy style. So all that poofs right up into your fucking face. That's why you need me, because you don't know shit. In this situation, you treat it like a house fire, and you stop, drop, and roll, and stay low to the ground. 
I'll be selling shit after the show. DVDs and CDs, but not very many. Good night. Your next president, Doug Stanhope. New York is baffling in that it's a city that prides itself on being an absolute shithole. It's like, there's nothing good here, and people are proud of that. They're happy. <laughs> oh, it's, it's overpriced, and it's overpopulated, uh, and it stinks like piss, and comics. Comics film specials here, and they all open with a joke about, yeah, I spend $8,000 a month for nine square feet, and you go, why don't you fucking leave here? Why, why do people stay here? But unfortunately, this is where comedy works, where people are the most miserable. Like, I'd rather be filming a special in, uh, on a beach in Costa Rica at a tiki bar right now, but they don't need comedians. They're already smiling. They're already happy, naturally. So that's why I'm doing a special here, because it's the last fucking place I want to be. be smoking through this whole set because that's it's one of the loopholes in the uh, law they keep the in the smoking bands they keep if it's part of a theatrical production a loophole in the law because they don't want to fuck up some faggy Tennessee Williams production and ruin the integrity of the show so they leave this fucking loophole open for me if, if, if the cigarette bothers you because you're envious, vote next time. How about that? Vote. Yeah, every now and then. Figure out what the fuck's going on in your community. No, you don't vote. You got shit to do. Leave it to old people with breathing problems who will never come here. This whole fucking generation is so unbelievably sad. If you're just getting to like party in age, you're fucked. There's nothing going on in this country anymore. It's done. Last call. It's just a suck generation. It's the most boring fucking generation in the history of people. It's all dumbed down and watered. Wait, wait, when's, the, when's the last time you heard stories about rock and roll bands chucking TVs out of hotel windows or any of that shit that, that used to be fun? Like, there was fun in the world. I... I some of this is going to make me sound like a grumpy old fuck, and I am, but I have, I have just cause. There's, there's nothing... As people get older, the older you get, the more bitchy you get. Because that's just natural. The more you've done shit, the more jaded you get. But I, I think we're going to be the first generation of old people. As soon as someone gets old, they complain about the new kids. And, oh, these kids today, look, they're crazy. It's always that the new, it used to be always that the new generation was too deviant. These kids are out of control. They're crazy. They're immoral. Look at what they're doing. In our day, if we wanted fun, we just went to a barn dance. And we, we didn't even finger fuck till we were like 35 years old. But these kids today... It was always that the new generation was over the top, and we're going to be the first generation of elderly people complaining, but in the opposite fashion, where we're going, look at these kids today, these half faggots. We, we used to do crank off of titty dancers and shit. It was, no one got hurt. We had a lot of fun. We got some good stories and herpes out of the deal. It was a fucking good time. The blisters bring me back. These pussies, they drink a Red Bull for some pep, and they'd prefer if you went on the patio for a cigarette. And the closest they come to a fist fight is on a message board somewhere. <laughs> you looking at my girl? I'm gonna delete you from my MySpace friend. You got some block user in your future, faggot. They're about to start piss testing for adrenaline in the workplace. That's how sad this country's getting. Now they're shaking your urine in front of you. Is that yours, Donnie? It looks a little cloudy. Have you been having fun on the weekend? Are we not enough fun for you here at the Verizon Wireless family? You need to seek it elsewhere? I don't think you're a team player. 
That's why I love hearing uh, people go, oh, that town, that's like 20 years behind the times, that fucking place. Book me there. I had fun 20 years ago. <laughs> but I, I can still smoke indoors? Oh, I got ecstasy still pure, uncut, and readily available? Oh, shit. What cavemen they must be. <laughs> the only drugs that are even popular anymore, all the dummy drugs, all the drugs that make you more boring, all the mood stabilizer, antidepressant, everyone's got some mental disorder they've been diagnosed with and they take a fucking pill. I, they push them on me all the time. I got <laughs> ruin so many relationships because I get yeah you know, I because I think I fucking think all the time. Sorry. Oh geez, oh, you, you, you think it's ADD? No, it's not ADD. I'm thinking. I'm thinking about a lot of stuff. It's not ADD. Yeah, I stutter a lot. And I fuck stuff up, but I, that's because I'm always thinking. Well, you're not listening to me because I'm thinking about something that's more interesting than you. I'm trying to. I'm I'm trying to build a, a perfect utopian society in my head. And what are you talking to me about? Bowling or what? I, 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 and I do. I have a head that just, just won't shut the fuck up. So where do your ideas come from? Do you have a, a head like that? Do you have the brain that just won't shut the fuck up all the time? <laughs> you learn to work with it. Did you ever try to do this? I tried this in July in Tucson, Arizona and uh, failed miserably. Did you ever try to sleep sober? <laughs> you ever try to do that? It's completely impossible. I tried. You know, I, I got a meeting at 6.30 in the morning. I got a flight to LA for a meeting, so I'm trying to be responsible. And I'm just laying there in the hotel. No people or conversation, no distractions, sober and no television, just your head on a pillow. 1 a.m., 2 a.m. You mother... Because that's when the carnival kicks into high gear. You're almost 40 years old, you fucking loser. How long are you going to do that? How long are you just going to get drunk and amuse shitheads for a living? Well, there must be something that rhymes with orange. Lawrence, smarange, orange. There's fucking music is playing in there and it always sucks. We didn't start the fire. Shut the fuck up. I'm going to go to bed. Three more hours, I'm gonna sleep. And my ex-wife is in there. You never took me to the botanical garden. It was always about you. You fucking megalomaniac. You never cared. I was dying of loneliness. It was always better to the world. Shut the fuck up. You're gonna sleep. Well, I ain't not taking fucking medication for it. That's also where the ideas come from. I'll just pour some alcohol on that when it happens and try to even it out. You work with your problems. Fucking everyone's taking pills just because you're afraid of standing out. Or uh, I was terrified when my doctor told me that I had a unique and interesting personality trait. <laughs> But then he told me about new Zoloft, the Prozac, and I just take three pills a day and I blend into this fucking horrible inbred corporate landscape. And I don't care. They'll, they'll legalize any drug so long as that drug keeps you producing. That's all they give a shit about is production. You're kicking out enough boxes at the plant? Well, go. Whatever keeps you doing that. Keeps you vaguely content sitting in a cubicle. Go ahead. FDA approved. I have a job where I alphabetize insurance forms 45 hours a week, and I noticed I couldn't concentrate so well on my job, so my doctor put me on Adderall, and now I can just breeze through my work day. I don't even notice that my empty life is being pissed away underneath fluorescent tubes. I have no highs or lows. I have no good stories. I'm just, uh, but I'm getting a lot of stuff done. I'm probably the most boring person I know, but look at me produce. I just go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, I'm going to be blah, 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 You're never going to take a pill for that. You're not concentrating because that's fucking boring and that's a natural reaction to boring. Don't concentrate. Find another way. You're going to make a living. You get bills to pay. 
buy less shit and find some fun. Suck a dick. You got a pay bill? Suck a dick. I'm talking to you in particular because you're close. Whatever. Spin around the brass pole a few times. Whatever. Say you saw the Virgin Mary in a grilled cheese sandwich and sell that shit on eBay. There's a grift in the system. There's always a scam. You don't have to do it just because your guidance counselor told you you'd excel at it. Fuck them over. This country is so bereft of imagination anymore. So fucking those pills probably have a lot to do with it. I, w- I was a real slut when I was a younger girl. I slept with a lot of guys. And it's not something that I'm proud of. But I'm in therapy now, and my therapist put me on Wellbutrin and Effexor, and she explained to me through our sessions, the reason I was so promiscuous, I come from a military family. So I didn't have a stable male role model in my life. I have a low self-esteem because I'm a little bit chunky, and I try to compensate for that by having sex with a lot of different men. Maybe you just like the cock. Is that possible? Is it possible that's why you slept around? You like that fucking purple meat hammer that is wailing in and out of your... untrimmed, winter-ready New York sludge pot, and that's fantastic. Take some cock. There's nothing wrong with it. It's free fun. That's what it's there for. Jeez, don't take a pill. Take the cock. It's, it's there for that. Maybe, maybe your clitoris is there for a reason. Huh, huh. Clit's there to attract the fucking pork sausage. It's one equal right you'll never get. You'll have, you'll have every equal right in the world, and you'll. Women, not you specifically, don't get over yourself. I'm talking, women will never have the same equal right as men do to just. You can't sling pussy without shame attached. You'll be, you'll be Hillary Clinton's and you'll get equal pay, but you wanna go fuck like this guy fucks on a weekend? He gets high fives, you get. Whore! They have to keep some shame involved. I won't pick on you just because you're in the front. Oh, that doesn't matter. But I'm making a point. And, and, and I know it sounds base or coarse, but the reason that you can't do that as women, pussy really is the main motivating factor in all of humankind. It really is. It's what gets shit built. I'm not, I'm not doing it for pussy. I'm not, I'm, I'm, uh, this is a flaw in the system. Don't clap for it. See, that's the, they know that as a catalyst. And that's why religion and government have to control supply and demand of pussy. And they do that by heaping shame upon you should you want to give away more than the federally allocated recommended daily allowance of pussy. Oh, she wants to suck more than one big whore! Shun your natural instinct, whore! Or nothing will get built. It comes down to production. It really does. I mean, so they have to keep that, that, that pussy like a dangling carrot, something that's hard to get, so he keeps running on the treadmill, building up more shit, sending out more boxes to the dollar store, pointless shit that no one needs. That's why cocaine is illegal. It makes pussy too easy to get. They can't have it. They not have it. If pussy were suddenly easy to get, if it were simple for human beings to just relate on a regular level, or if he could just lay down a big fat rail on a first date and you gack it up, ten minutes later you're sucking his dick in a dirty urinal. You're loving every second of it. Yeah, no inhibition. If it were that easy, then you wouldn't have to spend 60 hours working in a factory and saving up your overtime check so one day you can afford a spoiler for your Honda that's going to attract a girl's attention. And then after a lengthy courting process and you meet the parents and sign the contract, maybe then one year on your birthday, she'll suck your dick in a broom closet. Yeah. I feel like a whore. Should have done the bump. It's fucking awful. It's just gonna make sure you produce. Buy, buy shit you don't need. Come on, diamonds and fucking flowers. And 
At least black people knew when they were slaves. You remain clueless. Yeah, same now. Fucking get a lot of work done. Hard work, hard work is fine if it's a work of passion, but just to work hard to buy shit to impress people, you're a fucking loser. An empty vessel. Hard work, if it's, if it's hard work that you do for free, hard work, if it's a work of passion, you're you know, working at learning how to play the acoustic guitar, or you're trying to find my prostate when we're on ecstasy or something, that's a work of passion, sure, go. Dig in, root around. You know, it just don't work hard. It's awful. You worked hard to get where you are. No, I didn't. I drank, smoked, and did drugs to get where I'm at. I'm really, I'm not glorifying shit. I ain't trying to build it up, but it really is responsible for where I am. I haven't re- ever tried very hard. I'm here because I... You know, drugs expanded my imagination and made me think outside of your fucking reality and cigarettes gave me the patience to sit and write those thoughts down in a comedy-friendly format that you could understand and the alcohol gives me the courage to stand up here in front of you judgmental pricks and do it with a quarter million dollars worth of cameras in your face. I didn't fucking work hard for this show. I, I, I am ill-prepared. There, there are people here from the first show, uh, and you know, I, wow, that's a lot of different material. Yeah, just membered. <laughs> right? I, don't, I didn't want to try hard for this show because I didn't want to send the wrong message to the kids who might be watching at home. Don't fucking work hard. Tell me you die at the end. Did anyone tell you? Sorry. That's the alcohol. But it makes me funnier. That's why I'm, that's why I'm drinking. I, ironically, I'm drinking to be more professional. Because I'm funnier when I'm drunk. I really am. 17 years. I have AA friends that I've had for lifelong friends that all of them have had to eventually cave in and admit that I'm funny when I'm drunk. It fucking kills them. <laughs> it's like they have to deny their own religion to admit it. Like, all right, all right, you fucking... That was a good show. I know you're fucking ripped, but... Uh, Doug, you have a serious problem, and you make jokes about it. That's how you deal with it. But I've been in the program for a long time. If you ever want someone to talk to... but Don't quit tonight, though. We have tickets for the late show. But... <laughs> We've seen you sober. It's a stuttering, awkward wreck with no self-confidence. But tomorrow, if you'd like to uh, talk to me, I'm up at 6 a.m. Fuck you. It's fucking horrifying. Have an AA guy tell you to your face that he's supposed to be the know-it-all and he tells you that your career is dependent on your disease? Kind of a scary proposition. It's like having your psychiatrist tell you that not only are the voices in your head real, but they're accurate as well. (laughs) So I should kill the babysitter? I'm afraid so. (laughs) I'm pouring more funny down my head. Pipe down. Jesus died for your sins. I'm doing it for your mere entertainment dollar. That's far more admirable. Jesus never made you laugh. Never once. You never worked all week fucking stacking pants at the Banana Republic or whatever you do and rushed home on Friday night and dressed up to rummage through the Bible to see what crazy antics your slapstick savior was up to this week. He never made you laugh. He was a mythical, boring, unfunny fuck and I love you more. Now watch me jack off. That's not even a regular tagline. Kind of detracts from the whole purpose of this joke. But the... Why would you... I don't even understand the connection. He died for your sins. What is how you? He died for your sins. Well, how does one affect the other? I, I fucking I hit myself in the foot with a shovel for your mortgage. What? I don't, I don't understand the 
And if there is a correlation, why would you do that? Why would you die for someone's sins? Your, your sins are the only interesting thing about you, dreary, bleak motherfuckers. Your sins are what make you, make you fantastic. That's what keeps us great and exciting and fun. That's what makes you alive, man. You should wear your sins on your sleeve. You, you should be trying to top your sins on a daily basis. When you go to work in the morning, the first thing out of your mouth tomorrow morning at work should be the dirtiest shit you did tonight, because that's what people want to hear. It makes you, ah. Right? You tell me a story, hypothetically, you tell me a story about what a good Christian kid you are and how that good book has filled you with some effervescent loving light of Jesus that shines out of every pore in your squash. You're walking on sunshine because of the Lord. At the same time, you keep the story going real loud. At the same time, you tell me a story about that one time you kick-fucked a girl with cerebral palsy. And we'll see who draws a crowd. (laughs) Even even your make-believe slapstick Jesus on a stick and have to walk away from you right now. Oh, that's very that's very nice. I pray for you too, but I, I really want to hear this. Ah, start over! You did what? <laughs> Was she into it? Oh my God. <laughs> what kind of industrial lubricant do you... I can't believe I died for these stories. These stories are fascinating. So fucking silly. If you're Christian, you get cheesed off of the Jesus. I got Jew hating stuff to follow it. So, I mean, you are a shithead, but I can make you feel like you're not the only shithead. Like a, like a big blistering chunk of Jew hating coming right your way right now. I didn't. I I wrote this uh, bunch of Jew hating stuff. I didn't intend to. I was over in Scotland. For, Every year in August in Edinburgh, Scotland, they have the Fringe Festival. It's the biggest arts festival in the world. It's a whole month long, and I'm there in August, and uh, some jackass writer for the uh, London Times, he's, trying to, he's writing a story about anti-Semitism at the Fringe, and they had found a review of mine from earlier in the festival, this anti-Semitic guy, and, the, and, and where I had been quoted out of context Like, oh, just a string of blurbs. He says shocking things like blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And one of the things I had said that he quoted was, I hate the Jews. (laughs) Which sounds (laughs) anti-Semitic. So all of a sudden, I get thrown into his little piece of literature. And I had said it. I had said it, yeah, without question. But I had said it, like, in a happy, fun-loving, Jew-hating way. There's no animosity. I, it wasn't even a bit of mine. It was just some aside when I was rambling about... Fucking Mel Gibson was in the news at that time. And I'm rambling about him being called anti-Semitic, going, why is he getting so much press? He's an actor. Who gives a fuck what he thinks? I need press. I hate the Jews. Give me press. <laughs> And ironically, <laughs> bam, 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 banging on the door. It's a fucking funny story. If you know me, if you guys have known me for a while, I've been doing this 17 years, and I, I, I can fill three CDs worth of just the Christian bashing alone I've done over my career. I've done Mormon bashing and Muslim bashing. I'll do, I'll do more Scientology bashing once I have a stronger legal team, but... <laughs> But it wasn't, it wasn't until this phone call that I realized I've never done any Jew bashing in my whole career. All the religion bashing I've done, I never fuck with the Jews. I'm like, what? how did they ever escape? <laughs> and they do. They, you know, in religion bashing, Jews never get fucked with because A, they don't have the aggressive recruiting policies that other religions do. They don't have billboards every 30 feet. Yeah, be a Jew or burn in hell. Jew God is watching you. They're not banging on your fucking door with pamphlets. We want to talk to you about Judaism. 
So they don't get shit for that. They don't get shit because they have that Holocaust sympathy they can surf on for another 15 years till the last survivor dies or till History Channel goes out of business. But and, and the Jews, to their credit, they don't have the history of atrocities that other religions have. They don't... Because they fucking lost all the time. Sorry. Like, but they don't, yeah. They, they're, they're not like, you know, the Muslims and Catholics. The fuck. I've heard so many comics doing bits about this new pope. Oh, isn't it scary this new pope used to be a Nazi? And you go, not when you look at that track record side by side. The Nazis versus the Catholic Church. The Nazis only lasted a dozen years and they got their ass handed to them in a high hat. <laughs> Catholic Church has been has a far more prosperous and prestigious record of murder and torture and tyranny and oppression and nonsense. Not to mention the kid fucking, and they're still around and more popular than ever. I'd be far more afraid to hear someone go, you know that new Nazi? He used to be a pope. No shit. I'm fucking out of here. That guy's dangerous. <laughs> so fuck the Jews. That's what I'm saying. I guess fuck the Jews. I'm sorry. I never said it over the course of my career, but fuck the Jews. Just for being a religion at all, you're as complicit as the rest in the retardation of human intellectual progress. Fuck you two. Fuck you. My brother's a Jew. My brother's a Jew, and I fucking fuck him too. I hate his guts for it. Not like I'm like hate hate level, but fuck. What do you how you think? He converted because the only humorless cunt in his life that would ever fuck him twice, he had to cave in and marry her. Because he's afraid to die alone, but he, but he doesn't mind settling for less. And now they're together and in a passionless swamp of a relationship. And, they teach their kids that shit. The, the, see, the parents wouldn't have him if he wasn't converted to Judaism because they're racist. And there's another reason to fuck the Jews. I don't like racists. Fuck you too, Jew. You're not good enough if you're not a Jew. Fuck you. Mostly I hate the Jews because they're wicked annoying. Can we agree on that? Really, they're wicked annoying. <laughs> Of all the religions I, I've been around, the Jews have a tendency to throw their Judaism into whatever conversation you're having. Like any topic, whatever the subject. Whoa, that's funny because I'm a Jew. Oh, Lord, what? Oh, I have a typical Jewish mother. Did I say I grew up Jewish? Well, my Jew family had Jew, 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 Jew. That's all I got to say. Jew, Jew. Why, 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 why do you keep saying Jew? Why do you keep saying Jew? I'm at an airport bar with you. I have to talk to you, but can you stop reminding me that you're irrational in every third sentence? It's like, it's like people who are really into their astrological sign and they have to pitch that into whatever conversation you're having to define themselves. That's funny, I'm a Virgo. Here's my Virgo coming out again. <laughs> You're going to have to excuse me. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. It's because I'm a Virgo. No, it's because you're a douchebag. And you've been busting my balls all day. It has nothing to do with your astrological sign or some alignment of the stars. It's because you're a shithead. And it's time for you to take individual responsibility for who you are. Don't act... Like if your parents had fucked a month earlier, you'd be feeding me chili dogs and letting shit slide. You're an asshole. Be who you are. But I'm a Jew. We naturally carry a lot of guilt. It's a Jewish thing. No, it's a you thing. You that fucking in that chair. That's nothing to do with Judy. If you have guilt, maybe you're weak of character. Maybe you're fucking guilty of something. I don't know. Maybe you just stole that bottle of Jaeger out of my freezer. And you're trying to, but it has nothing to do with some ancient tribe of blah, blah, blah. That didn't, that's not attached to your DNA, right? By the, by, the, by the same logic, we all come from apes 
But I don't throw ape in every conversation. Use ape to define myself. Use ape as an excuse to defecate in my thumbless mitt and then hurl it at you. I'm sorry, did I, did I just splatter you with wet feces? I'm sorry, I have a very rich ape upbringing, a strong ape heritage. I, I'm an ape, 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 really worthless as an individual anybody anybody who defines themselves solely on their their race or their religion or their nationality if that's the first thing out of your mouth well, what are you all about well, if that's the first thing on your myspace page well i'm an irish american boy what the fuck is that who, who, you got nothing else community college and something else but you use that fucking trivia because you got nothing to say <laughs> useless yeah <laughs> kind of out of shit not in this set I mean I have some stuff I put on paper but in the long term I, I think I'm out of shit <laughs> fucking cannibalizing my own 17 years what else do you have to say if I die soon, don't ever say I died too young. <laughs> Every time an artist dies young, I go like uh, nine more days before I'm 40. If I still have that three in front of my number, maybe they'll say I died young. If I had the four, died early perhaps. <laughs> died not as late as he could have. <laughs> But every time an artist dies young, Kurt Cobain or whatever, there's always the people, it's so sad. He had so much more to give. How do you know? Maybe he was out of shit. <laughs> I don't know. He's done. He got all the money. He did all the drugs. He fucked all your holes. And that's the American dream. And when you're done with that, you go, oh, that's why they call it a dream. It's bullshit. I'm still empty. And he cashed out. Maybe... How do you know what any artist had left? How do you know if Jimi Hendrix hadn't have died, he wouldn't have wound up doing Super Bowl halftime duets with Elton John right now? <laughs> Rocket Man! And you're going, this is tragic. Why didn't that guy die? He was my hero. I don't want to see this. It's fucking pathetic. How do you know if Lenny Bruce hadn't have died, he wouldn't have wound up taking over Andy Rooney's spot at the end of 60 minutes? Just some crusty old cunt with wiry eyebrows bitching about ATM fees and a cluttered death. How do you know? Maybe he's out of shit. But back to nationalism. <laughs> Nationalism does nothing but teach you how to hate people that you never met. And all of a sudden you take pride in accomplishments you had no part in whatsoever. And you brag about, you know, like the Americans you go, fuck the French. Fuck the French. If we hadn't saved their ass in two world wars, they'd be speaking German right now. You go, oh, was that us? That was us? Was, was that me and you, Tommy? We saved the French? <laughs> Jesus. I know I blacked out a little bit after that fourth shot of Jägermeister last night, but I don't, I don't remember. I know we went through to Wendy's drive-thru. We were going to get one of them fresh set of sandwiches. It looked so alluring on the commercial, but then we ordered it and realized we had no money and we had to ditch out before the second window. And that was douchebags in line behind us with the bass music probably got our order and out we laughed about that but i don't remember saving the french at all i i went through the last 10 calls on my cell phone and there's nothing incoming or outgoing to the french looking for muscle on a project i checked my pants there's no mud stains on the knees from where we were garroting krauts in the trenches at Verdun. I think we didn't do anything but watch sports bloopers while we got hammered. I think 
we should shut the fuck up. Silly. All that stuff. Tradition and heritage. It's dead people's baggage. Quit carrying it. Did you make it up? No. It's passed on to me. Pass it back. Every immigration argument that you hear, they, they never come from a, like, well, how does it affect you personally? Well, you know, these immigrants, they come to our country, they burden our tax system. What they do is they come here and they get into our education system and our health care, and I've got to pay the taxes. My taxes have to pay that. Well, what the fuck are you doing to me? Every time you have a kid, every time you have a kid because it's American, I should pull up a chaise lounge and wave a flag while 15 of those things come out of you, pay every, oh, I can't wait to pay for these. They're American. I have a vasectomy and an abortion on my record, but I can't wait for all your fucking fat Headed mis- Midwestern kids to come out of here. What are you, Catholic? Come on, be fruitful and multiply. Love it, love it. I'll get a second job. No, keep. Well, these immigrants, they don't fuck, they don't speak the language. Then don't talk to them. Well, I solved your problem. That was quick. You know who speaks the language perfectly? Your next door neighbor. You've lived there eight and a half years. You've never said one fucking word to that guy. You avert eye contact should you check the mail at the same time. So why would you give a shit with the guy selling ganip ganops in a cart in the park speech? It's none of your fucking business. And all this, all the cliched arguments like that, well, they're, they're lazy, they don't ship this, and they're criminals and all this. They, all those arguments go against the main cliched argument of their taking American jobs. I live on the Mexican border. I live seven miles off the Mexican border in a town, Bisbee, Arizona, a little town. I can go out any day and watch Border Patrol arresting these guys by the dozen, 11 at a time out of a Dodge Omni, like a clown car with plastic cuffs. And you're right, they don't speak the language and they probably have no education. They don't have fucking shoes half the time. They're like barefoot and tattered castaway like Gilligan's Island shorts and hey, the fucking dirty t-shirt and a dehydrated and wander in a desert for four days and if that guy is as qualified for your job as you are you're a fucking loser of such epic humiliating proportions I would be ashamed to have anyone find out that guy took my job. He doesn't speak English. What, did they do your job training in pantomime, shithead? (laughs) Oh, see, color. Boy, boy, I see, boy, boy. Crank, 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 crank. (laughs) You're out of here, mullet head. That guy's more qualified. (laughs) Fucking asshole, you should have tried harder. Nobody bitches about immigrants taking their job if that person has skills of any level. <laughs> no, they're fucking brain surgeons sitting around the Beverly Hills Hotel Lounge. You know what really chaps my ass, Barry? <laughs> Scandinavian fellas are coming over taking all our good neurosurgery positions. <laughs> the Norwegians specifically. And I say we down ourselves a bottle of Jack Daniels and go stop us some Ouija ass. The first Ouija we see. We j- <laughs> Jump out of that explorer and pound him. (laughs) Fucking immigrants. All started with that Einstein. Once they brought him over from Germany and we didn't have any good genius jobs, it was a trickle-down effect. (laughs) Steal your job. Hate, hate, hate. Fear, fear, fear. Hate, hate, hate. Fear, come on, they're taking your jobs and terrorists are trying to blow up your Ford Focus specifically. You need some fucking... Where's my Purell? I touched the doorknob. There's a new fever or flu. There's a big, faggot, sober, responsible, boring, dull, hand sanitizer generation and I can't get the germs off me fast enough. I'm afraid. Fucking faggots. I, I try to qualify. I use faggot 
too liberally, but I use it as a word of weakness. I attach no sexuality to the word, and if you're gay and you're in here and you're offended, I'll be at the door on the way out and I'll suck your dick just to show that I meant no offense. I'm not going to get wicked into it and like yank on your balls like, like you're coked up and that's the only way you can come. <laughs> I'll just pinch you with two fingers and, uh, uh, but just to show that I mean no disrespect because it's too strong of a word to let go. Faggot is a good word. So you know, I got a little sore on my lip right there to match the one that broke out on my dick from this stress. And, yeah, yeah, well, you know what? I, I, I was a player, not a fucking spectator in this life, honey. You look at a herp, he's like a skateboarder looks at a skin knee when you play along. Uh, ain't that big a fucking deal? And I ain't that Indian anymore. I'm an old man and don't give a shit. Anyway, let's move on. I was trying to segue into kid fucking, but segue is gone. Let's just jump right in, shall we? Internet predators. Yeah. Oh, they're very popular all over the television. They fucking catch a predator, MySpace, oh, fuck yeah. Like, I don't know, because I, I was a kid at one point. I don't remember, but it is pictures. But uh, I remember we didn't have the internet, but... To avoid predators, our parents would go, uh, hey, uh, son, don't talk to strangers. Some of them might try to fuck you. And you go, oh, thanks, man, thanks. Thanks for that heads up. And then you just went about your day. Does that not work for the internet now? <laughs> you don't have to parent anymore? <laughs> oh, the internet! Like they have some crazy way of getting around the don't talk to strangers. What the fuck? If you're a parent and you're in here, I know you don't want to hear this. You'll argue with me and you'll say that I, I'm twisting the fact, I'm wrong, but this is the truth. That, that probably, and huge probability, when I say probably, astronomical odds, Vegas odds, statistical probability, probably nobody wants to fuck your kid. I know you don't want to hear it. You want to think that child is so ultra fuckable that all the pedophiles there, they're jockeying for position right now down at the seesaws, waiting for him to come out of first period. Wait for it. Not that chunky kid, the O'Neill kid. That's what we're all here for. High five, high five. If you wanted your kid to get fucked, just to prove to your neighbors in your gated community that your kid's hotter than their kid and you sent your kid out as bait and you put him in a Catholic schoolgirl skirt with no underpants and you made him hop on a pogo stick to school. So, so his little pink fleshy hindquarters shone so temptingly towards traffic he would still probably graduate school having never been pooned and then what an asshole you'd look like trying to brag around a gated community at the next cocktail mixer. It's just by the grace of God that no one, no one ever fucked him. It's only because of my hypervigilance and the work of my congressman getting more laws passed on the internet that he never got fucked. <laughs> if I were a parent, I would prefer that pedophiles be on the internet. There's no more pedophiles in the world than there ever have been. They act like the internet is creating pedophiles where there were none. If I were a parent, if you exist anyway, stay on the internet. Stay jacking off in your basement in South Carolina as opposed to the old-fashioned way where they actually went down to your schoolyard. They did laps around the playground and smarties on a fishing line trying to fly fish little junior into the Oldsmobile. Keep beating off on the internet. Just don't fuck the kid. That's, that's what it's about, right? Just don't fuck the kid. That's all you should worry about. But that's not what the, the, fucking, the attorney general, his, he says his, his number one focus is to stop the kid fucking. But he doesn't, he wants to go after the internet. He's not going after the guy with the kid in the camera. He just wants to, they use that fear mongering to get more government control in your life, more legislation, more, oh no, I don't want to have to be responsible for my own kid. You take care of it, Mr. Government. And if I get tired of it, I'll just vote for the other party. And that'll make a difference. 
Stop it. Uh, child pornography rampant on the internet. Have you seen it? Attorney General, oh, we need to stop this. Child pornography is rampant on the internet. We need more government involvement. because I've never seen child pornography on the internet, but I've seen every other type of deviant, grotesque, sometimes stimulating, always clever, every other type of pornography that two eyeballs can absorb. You get into one good fruitless coke yank where you're all gacked up on blow and you're just beating off till the band plays because hookers won't answer their phone at this hour. You, you know it's not going to work. It ain't going to finish it. This is a cold, dead eraser in your hand right now. You wake up. You punch it in the face. You fucking wake up. Talk to me. Uh, wake when we bought this shit. You're waking up now. And you just start clicking on random porn links and you got pop-ups everywhere and that chick looks hot. Click on that and you go everywhere. You just keep seeing shit. It's never what it's advertised. 18-year-old amateur hot co-ed action and you click on it and it's some fucking bondage enema porn, some fucking amputee porn. I see what, prego popper, fucking lactating mama, all the flat top fucker. I mean, they all sound like funny shit. They all exist. Shit, I make fun of midget porn. It's funny to say, but it's out there. It's like the comic relief porn I look at after I just jacked off to something hugely uncomfortable. And I go, right, well, let's go look at midget porn and laugh. <laughs> Someone's into this. <laughs> you gay tard. <laughs> but it's all out there. All this shit. Never saw someone fuck a kid. I've seen three old queers. Go to my website. On the forum on my website. Seriously. They have a thread called the Tsunami of Poon where all these guys just post the most disturbing pictures to fuck with everyone else. Three old queers. There's three old guys in their 70s. They look like any kind of, you know, fez wearing fucking Shriners, but now they're all naked. One sucking the other one's dick and the other two are making out very passionately, which is more disturbing than even the blowjob is the other two silver haired. Uh, it's like, ah! Seen that? Ever seen the child boy? I've seen cock fingering on the internet. Have you seen cock fingering? I've seen it several times randomly surfing porn. Digit in the male urethra. Objects in the male urethra. Seen cock finger, I've seen it several times, yet I've still never managed to see someone fuck a child randomly. So if if child pornography is rampant on the internet, cock fingering is probably occurring in this room as we speak. I have no children. If I, if I had children, once people have kids, they get all fucking weak and they have that genetic defect that makes them want to protect but make other people like the government do it for them. I don't, I don't have a child. Maybe I'd feel differently if I did. Well, once you have kids, I don't know. I know I've had an abortion I've, with my wife and... It's been five years probably now. I just want to say, still a great decision. Every Roe v. Wade anti-abortion rally that comes out, they'll find some fucking crying cunt from a trailer park and put her behind a podium and pat her back so she gets attention. And you go, I regret it to this day. I had an abortion because I was in a lot of trouble and I wish I had that baby back in my... Us... We don't agree on much, my wife and I, but we agree that was the best decision we ever made. Still, five year anniversary, glad we fucking killed the baby. Five years later, still glad, still happy, no guilt, no regret. Have a lot of regrets about how handled the relationships, and, but never, the baby never brought up. Just saying, in case you ever come to that point, we're all regret it down the line. We haven't. You don't hear that side of the story. Just saying. I got, I got an, I got this anti-abortion flyer that were, they were sticking them under everyone's windshield wiper in the parking lot of this place in Texas, and it had a picture of a dead fetus on the front. You know how the the pro-life folk are so fond of the dead fetus photo? 
They get a picture of an aborted fetus and they run home and they blow it up large on a placard and they bring it down to their protest rally and they shove it in your face at 9.30 in the morning. Abortion does right there. Don't you turn away. This is abortion. Like, I'm just going to the ATM. I'm not going in this place. I'm just clear the sidewalk, baby. I'm hungover. But I'm like barf anyway. But they, they do that. The idea is that that picture is supposed to be so disturbing and so disgusting that it will single handedly change your whole view of the abortion issue as, as though live childbirth were really pretty to look at when that living monster is actually ripping out of you it's all covered in blood and mucus and sputums flying everywhere and the fucking thing screaming you're fucking screaming everybody's screaming your, your husband's vomiting through a surgical mask while trying to maintain a comforting eye contact. <laughs> and now your snatch and asshole have all been torn into one big open septic manhole. Look at it! Don't you turn away! Oh yeah, you put a picture of that under my windshield wiper, I'll frame it and put it over the piano. That's, that's adorable. It's a little sweetheart. But this little peaceful, freeze-dried, aborted fella laying all nighttime on a comfy pillow next to a ruler, he's disgusting. Oh, shame be that. Like I said, I've had an abortion. I've been party to an abortion. So, and we don't know what became of it. When we had an abortion, we just uh, shuffled out the front door. We didn't tag its ear or keep in touch, <laughs> track it on a GPS system, uh, pen pals. No, we fucking left. So if I see a picture of an aborted fetus, there's a party that's got to wonder a little bit. Hey. <laughs> Anything? Come on. Come on. It's a little bit. I think he's got my scowl. <laughs> if you've had an abortion, it really makes the whole idea, the, uh, uh, the whole concept of heaven a lot more disconcerting. If you've had an abortion, as irrational or illogical as that idea is, it's still, it's depressing to think about if there were a heaven and that you fought through the white light and got up to the pearly gates, that'd be the first dead relative waiting for you there, all angry and pinch-faced. Eh. Oh, look who's here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it took your time, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Looked like you were having a lot of fun down there. Yeah. You know, they took pictures of me. They took pictures of me. They be next to a ruler, for Christ's sake. Would you know my name? <laughs> So I get the flyer, it's got the dead fetus on the front, on the back of the thing it's got the whole pro-life propaganda screed. At the bottom, the guy who prints these things for a living, for fun or profit or whatever his motivation is, he puts his name and phone number at the bottom in case you want to order more. <laughs> and I'm drunk with a phone. <laughs> And the guy answers his phone. It's not even it's not even a business. There's no it's a dude in rural Wisconsin answering his phone in the bedroom. Hello? And I wanna fuck with him, but I wanna be original. You don't wanna just be drunk and trying to throw logic at this problem. You're just gonna waste cell phone minutes. That's like trying to kick water uphill. You ain't gonna win. So what I did is I came at him. And I attacked him from the more conservative angle 
where I accused him of being the worst type of child pornographer on this planet. This is sick. I can't believe what I'm looking at, sir. This is the child in this photograph. That's not a choice, that's a child. And for you to distribute photographs of naked children around my neighborhood, you're attracting the most deviant type of child predator on this planet. Right now, preterm necrophiliac child molesters are masturbating like frenzied apes in cages to your handiwork, sir. Don't you do 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 me. You knew what you were doing. You could have photoshopped a bikini onto that little baby. You could have airbrushed a tasteful one piece, but you chose not to, because this is how you get your rocks off, and I hope you burn it out. Let's I don't get here very often. I'm glad I had the opportunity again. So I, so I, so I can close strong and say, fuck the Yankees. I want to close with, fuck the Yankees. Fuck the Yankees. How about that? Fuck the Yankees. Fuck you and your Yankees. Fuck the Yankees. Yes, uh, fuck the Yankees for several reasons. You want to go through all of them? Fuck the Yankees. A, they bought their team. Yes, they bought their team. They spent the most money they're supposed to win. Like, okay, not fuck... If you have money on the Yankees, different story. If you have money on any team, okay, go ahead and cheer for that team. It's kind of like having stock in a company. You have an investment. You're cheering for that. But if you're just going to be some fucking bloat-headed alcoholic drink, drinking overpriced beer in the stands and paying too much money for parking and they're going to yell for a team, have some character and pick an underdog. If you're just yelling to yell, pick an underdog. Why not? The Yankees are supposed to win. So for you to be a dildo arrogant fan on top of that, that's like going to a casino and cheering for the house and being an asshole about it. Zip up to the fucking Indian casino. Just set up shop right behind a blackjack table and go, oh, dealer busted your ass, bitch, huh? That's my fucking dealer. I chose that dealer. I got my dealer, dealer hat on. I spent food money for this hat. I'm hungry. What the fuck is that? Fuck the Yankees most, because they're the reason that you have to go outside to smoke cigarettes. And the reason that they just banned trans fat and food. They're telling you how to eat in this city, how to live your life, what you can do on your own property. They just banned, like, they're trying to ban uh, uh, like, iPods and crosswalk. State Supreme Court in this state, 10 days ago, upheld a ban on dancing in nightclubs. Anybody know this? Nightclubs. Not, not fucking Utah, not Footloose. New York City. Tough guys, aren't you? You're fucking standing out like fucking bitches smoking outside. They tell you what you can put in your food, what you can eat, where to dance, where to walk. Can't fucking use my cell phone behind the wheel of my car. I'm a tough motherfucker. Before you advertise how tough you are, you might want to go into the bathroom and do some of Bloomberg's cock smell out of your assholes because it seems to me that you are just little bitches to City Hall. And that's why I say fuck the Yankees too. Because the Yankees, what you were all rallying around and getting pumped up and badass about when you should have been down at City Hall 60,000 of you getting fucking amped up. Next time someone even mentions a smoking ban, it should have been 60,000 of you pricks fucking booing and throwing batteries at the guy who suggested it. You distracted motherfuckers. I gotta go. Outside smoking. I'm not showing applause. This is where credits roll. Got a part of the thing. I'd rather.
send me back there. Don't sit out. I don't want this. It's not real. You're lying. I like you anyway. Fuck the idea. Right. Just sit quietly. It'd be, it'd be better credits if you this thing. That, that'll be credits. That would be real for like 60% of my show. Alright. Can I go now? Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together one time for Doug Stanhope. You know, the, uh, you know the funny thing about child pornography? I mean, aside from the lack of credits at the end. Yeah. No ego on that side of Hollywood, is there? <laughs> Who did the editing on this film? It's seamless. I want to use them on my independent documentary, but no names, not even a nom de plume. Some people are in it just for the art. Thanks, thanks very much. Not everyone's going to enjoy this show. <laughs> Settle in. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Not everyone's going to enjoy the show, and more so, not everyone's going to enjoy the CD. Even more people will not enjoy the CD <laughs> than will not enjoy the show. And that's fine. I've learned to live with that. But the problem is that now a lot of people who don't enjoy the show uh, have a, a compunction to go home and blog about it. And that's bad because there's a good chance I'll find that blog someday. And it will make me really sad. I'll be at uh, some other gig on the other side of the world and I'll be you know, uh, alone in a hotel room. I'm drinking vodka with yogurt because I drank all the mixers out of the mini bar. But I had that yogurt I grabbed from the Continental Breakfast, and I still have that. And I'm sitting on the computer, and I'm Google searching my own name on the internet. And that's a fucking sad night when you're in Copenhagen, Denmark, and you're drinking blueberry yogurt with vodka, and you're ego surfing your own name on Google blog search. It's a fucking sad night already. And I'm going to find your blog about this show and all your stupid opinions, and I'm not going to have the time or the ambition or 
even the physical dexterity to you know, register to become a member of your blogosphere so I can comment back with my side of the story and you know, find an email with a password. I won't have the time to... So let me circumvent that whole problem right here and now ahead of time and respond to your blog by saying, go fuck yourself. Who, who are you? What have you ever done? Think your stupid opinion counts? No one gives a shit what you think. You probably have a lot of fucking opinions. You probably have some stupid hump job where you have to wear like a, a orange reflective vest and you set cones around holes and you spout off your opinions to all your coworkers and bore them to tears and you go home and you log on to CNN.com to tell Jack Cafferty how you feel about the question of the day. You wait till the end of the show to see if he reads your stupid comment. Well, if Wall Street's getting a bailout, where's my bailout? That's my question, Jack. He never reads your fucking stupid comments. You go to town hall meetings and you bring up issues that are not even on the docket. And you go over your time till they have to bang the gavel. Sir, you're over your time, sir. And that's still not enough. So you sit at night on your stupid blog. Pineapple Express didn't live up to my expectations. I'm glad I waited for a video. Fuck you again. No one gives a shit. Writing horrible things about my act. You probably didn't even pay for the CD. You probably downloaded it illegally, which is fine, but then talk shit on top of it. Fuck you. I hate you. I hate you, and nobody even reads your stupid blog, because I know that, because I read the blog about how much I suck, and there was only two views and zero comments, and I think I might have read this one before. Stupid opinions. He's the douchebag that ruined the man show. What? Really? Still? Still, you're putting that up? How many years? I did ruin the man show. I fucking raped its corpse. I ruined it horribly. Not a bigger turd has ever been seen on the airwaves. And you know what? So what? People write hate mail. You ruined the man show. Like it was some piece of comedic genius to begin with. Like it was some masterpiece. Like, like, I, like I tried to do Monty Python and the Holy Grail Part 2 with... Jackie Mason and Andy Dick. No, it was a turd anyway. It was just their turd. <laughs> I got paid a bungload of money to ruin that show. I would ruin that show twice as much again for half the money. <laughs> I would I would do gay porn right now on this stage for that same paycheck. And you know what? I wouldn't really be worried about the integrity of the product. If you emailed me in six months and said, you ruined gay porn. Yeah. I guess I didn't try my best. I'm sorry. I didn't really put my back into it. <laughs> Cut me another check, we'll try it again. What are you gonna do? You ruined You ever come to Boston to do gay porn, I'll kick your sorry ass. <laughs> There's nothing funnier than getting a death threat via MySpace. <laughs> Don't you just write it in a children's birthday card? It'd be just as intimidating as a MySpace comment. Big care bear with a bouquet of balloons, die faggot scrawled across it. <laughs> Better get a gun. This guy's serious. I don't want, I don't have a gun. I want to, I really shouldn't have a gun. I'm against gun control. I think guns should be out there, but I know I'm a responsible drunk and a drug user, and I should not, with a small man's complex, a big weakling, and a fucking lot of hate and talking shit in strange places, I should not be carrying a weapon. It's just responsibility. It's personal responsibility. Other people should learn that. Know who you are. 
I also am a violent alcoholic, and I know how I'm going to feel in the morning, and there's not going to be a lot to live for, and I should not have a Glock underneath the pillow before I can get a cup of coffee in me, a cigarette, and think things through. But I think guns are the great equalizer. It uh, puts everyone on the, an even keel. Chuck Liddell, badass mixed martial arts fighter, maybe baddest guy in the world. Put him in a cage with Hannah Montana and a 20 gauge. <laughs> Vegas odds are dropping drastically. <laughs> this, uh, America has this reputation for violence that it, we, we don't really live up to. It's not that violent. A we promote the shit out of violence and we make violent movies and we exploit a lot of violence on the news, but the face-to-face -face marketplace violence that you see is mostly, you know, chest bumping shit talking, waiting for the bouncer to come. Because I play over in the UK a lot, and they're way more violent over there. They're fucking maniacs. It's just any, any given night. You walk out into the street on a Tuesday, and the pub closed, and it's fucking UFC in the streets. Every corner, you don't know which fight to watch. They're just beating the shit out of each other for, for no reason whatsoever. Where are you from? Across the street? Fuck across the street. There's only one side of this street. I fucking slam and wham and thump and they... I was in Manchester, England, where they had a public service announcement in the toilet of the bar above the urinal, like you'd have here for, you know, don't drink and drive, give your keys to your friend or something. They have, don't beat up ambulance drivers. It was just, I don't remember the specific text, but that was the gist of it. Some crying football hooligan, and don't beat up, and you go, is that a real thing? That really happened? And they go, yeah, they, they do that. They evidently get so bored in their fucking projects over there that they call fake 911 calls and the ambulance shows up and they beat the dog shit out of it. But no reason, just they're bored. You go, maybe you should give these people fucking guns, man. Because <laughs> that's one thing that we give our kids in this country that they don't give children in a lot of other places. And that's false hope. We give our kids an abundance of false hope. And you say, oh, you could be president one day in America. You could kick field goals and win the Super Bowl. And none of that shit's going to happen. Your kid's going to grow up in the same fucking stupid cubicle that you rot in now. But you don't tell them that. Over there, they don't even have false hope. They have no hope whatsoever. As soon as you're old enough to hold a beer, they go, here's a Guinness. You're fucked. Just keep your mouth shut till the ambulance gets here. And I think a lot of the reason that there is so much more street level violence over there is because they don't have guns and they do have free health care. <laughs> we have no health care and we have all the guns in the world. It makes you think twice before you start throwing punches in a bar over a football game. You even break my tooth, that's like $1,500 out of my pocket. Maybe I'll run like a pussy or wait for the bouncer. <laughs> so everyone's fucking... Old people are like getting into fights now in town hall meetings about healthcare. You, you don't fucking deserve it. Everyone else has healthcare, but we need healthcare. Canada has healthcare, everyone else has... We, you think Americans deserve healthcare? Have you looked at this fucking horrible... Fat fuck country, slovenly, sedentary, lazy fat fucks. You don't even try. Why should you get free health care? Oh, yeah. Fucking Sunday afternoon, buy four stuffed crust cheesy bread cheese pizzas, and you'll get a meaty, meaty pork pie, pork bacon pizza for free with 12 cinnaloves. That's a pretty good deal. You know what else we need is free health care, too. My diabetes is so bad, I can't even feel my feet. I have open fissures in my leg muscles so deep you can put your whole finger in there. Who's going to pay for my amputations? If I was in Amsterdam, they'd pay for my amputations because they have free health care. You know what else they have? Bicycles, and they use them. <laughs> you get nothing free.
you got to try on your own a little bit. Jesus, we, we live in a country where the face of fitness is Jared from Subway. That's your goal. You used to be like Jack LaLanne or Charles Atlas or some shit, tug, dragging a tugboat with his teeth across the Hudson River. Now it's a guy that... Still kind of fat. He's not as fat as he could be fat or he used to be fat, but he's still kind of fat. That's what you should aspire to. You wouldn't fuck Jared with the lights on. Come on. And that's your goal? It's, it's awful. You can't give Americans free shit because free is used as such a buzzword for gluttony. Like it's been used in advertising so much. Buy one, get one free. Free with purchase and big free. Free samples at the grocery store. And you go, oh, Black Forest ham. I never tried Black Forest ham. <laughs> Turn your hat backwards so they don't recognize you when you go back. Vermont cheese, what's that? <laughs> free. They do the same shit with free health care. So it's free, let's go get fucking something checked. I got an itch or a scratch or a bite or a lump. Let's get this checked out. Doctor, I got a spot. Check it out for free. It's a fucking coffee stain. It's, it's not even on your skin. It's on your shirt. Well, let's get a biopsy of that. That could be precancerous, right? It's free. Get my money's worth. Everybody in the whole health care system is everyone's fucking everyone it's all dicks and no holes and fucking <laughs> pharmaceutical companies make you as paranoid as possible so you always think something's wrong with you and insurance companies are raping the patients and patients are abusing the system by running to the emergency room every time a fucking kid sneezes malpractice attorneys can't wait for you to get prescribed the wrong thing so they can see the fuck out of pfizer and jack the prices up even more it's just Every disease has its own month. It's this disease awareness thing. Wear a ribbon and come down for a free screening in a fucking bookmobile. You go, no. It's preventative. It's no, it's a waste of fucking time. And, I mean, some of it, I'm sure, is a place, but most of it's a scam. Do you get your pussy looked at every fucking year since you're 13? So you got to get some old gray man once a year to crank open your pussy and look in it and scrape it and spackle it and redecorate it for what is there ever anything wrong with your pussy Did, before modern medicine would pussies just generally rot up inside you and fall out of you like spoiled oysters on the sidewalk people stepping in it ma'am i just stepped in your vagina you have soiled my buckled shoe don't you get that checked Oh, there's nothing wrong with your pussy, but you keep fucking going. It's a scam. They, every five years, they find something. It might be something, but it's probably nothing. But let's just scrape a little bit of it anyway to be safe, and we'll put it on a glass slab and FedEx it to Langley, Virginia, send it to Quantico, and have it run through the NCIC and make sure you're not part of a terrorist organization and you pay your taxes in a timely and organized fashion we'll get back with you on friday with the results but but they don't call till monday so you spend the whole weekend going is there something wrong with my pussy this time maybe they're afraid to tell me tom have you noticed anything wrong with my pussy is it it does stink a bit i noticed it it's a pussy they stink a bit relax get over it jump in the pool whatever it's chlorinated it does, it's just what pussies do will you stop being such a paranoid, a hypochondriac. Well, I was looking at it, it looks kind of funny. I, if I lay on my side and I look at it from behind in the closet mirror, it looks like it's frowning. Do you, do you think it's insulted? Do I have disgruntled pussy disorder? I'm afraid, Tom. It's just your pussy, would you relax? It's fucking so unnecessary. They do the same thing with my ass hole. Uh, <laughs> Well, once I turn 40, it's some magic number that, oh, for your own good, we should get a bunch of people in your ass. And it's for your own safety. Doug, you have a history of colorectal cancer in your family. Your dad died of colorectal cancer. So, yeah, he died happy. He didn't fucking have any problems. We need to get a team of interns in your ass with a snake and a fucking camera as soon as... 
And I, I don't like life that much. It's not that big a deal for me. I don't, I, I don't want to know what's coming. You go to the doctor, and even if it's not for what you went there for, they'll find something else. Say, well, that's another thing you should have checked. That looks, what? I don't want to know. I don't want to know I have cancer till it's visible to the naked eye. And you can <laughs> spot it. I think you might have throat cancer. It's uh, coming out of your mouth a bit there in the corner. It's, it's, and then I'll just die quickly. And it'll be fucking great. I want to die of a terminal disease where the symptoms are exactly the same as a hangover. Because that way there'd be no chance of early detection whatsoever. Didn't you notice something might be wrong when you woke up and fetal and coughing and you sweat right through the mattress and box spring splattering blood shits you no just uh, that's morning and that's the road it's called the road what am i gonna i gonna annoy the emergency services in every town i play i've done shit that's supposed to be good for you like that and I had a uh, hydrocolon therapy. They stick a hose up your ass and it's supposed to power wash off all the years of black tar Burger King that are caked to your colon walls. And, and I didn't do it to be healthy. I did it because I was a goof for a morning radio show in Anchorage, Alaska. I was on morning radio trying to promote a show and they go, we're going to Doug stand up. We're going to talk him to go down to Alaska colon therapy. <laughs> Stupid intern with a phone to your face while you're crying. And it, was fucking, it was awful and rape-like and violating on, on every level. Uh, and not because it's something in my ass. That's not some new boundary I just broke in late life. I, I've jammed enough things up my own ass just trying to come on any amphetamine-based narcotic when you're fucking, you're all gacked out and you can't feel a thing. You slam the lid of the laptop on it and it's fucking just can't feel it. And hookers won't answer their phone at this hour. It's like 5.30 a.m. on a Sunday and you're calling up. They can hear your teeth grinding on the phone. It's just like a little company. They're not taking that call. it take you till Tuesday to blow a load. So you stick something up your ass and you hope it might work. And it usually helps, you know, a little bit. Somewhere between a little bit and a lot, somewhere in there. It wasn't violating for that reason. It was, uh, it was just the whole, like, clinical nature of the problem. There's a woman is was humorless and stagnating face. She's got, like, a white lab coat and latex gloves. And lay on your side, you're going to feel a bit of pressure. And you're like, ah. And they shove a hose in you and they fill you up like a water bed until you think you're gonna shit all over creation. Like, I can't hold it. And then you do, you shit everywhere. You think you're blanketing the walls with it, but it's all going through a hose. It goes through a hose and then it goes through a, a glass tube where you can see it and she sits on a stool, at, like it's like, uh, like a poop aquarium and she monitors all the, like she's gonna, you know, reading your tea leaves. She's going to tell your future by the chunks of stool coming out of you. Look at that. You need to chew your food better. And you go, ah, oh, this is so... Can't we at least make this funny or something? You're going to jam something in my ass. Why don't you do it the way I do it when I'm all fucking coked out? Do that kind of... Thing. Dress up like a dominatrix and stand on the side of my face during this. We're going to clean you out and then we're going to check you for prostate cancer. Yes, mistress, you're a dirty faggot. Say, this dirty faggot, this is dirty faggot. You love that. You're going to get a flu shot on your turkey neck, bitch. I'm a little bitch. Why couldn't you do that? It's all just a waste of time. You try to be healthy, you're going to fucking die. It doesn't matter. It's too much of a pain in the ass to be healthy. There's fucking, the whole species is just doomed anyway. We, we try to live forever, but fucking life addict. But yeah, we're doomed as a species. There's no other species of animal that is as blatantly self-destructive and suicidal like human beings are. Every other species has some sense of self-preservation. We don't have that. 
We just fucking, uh, fucking drink up, fucking fire up, let's have a cigarette. You have a fucking puppy and you throw a tennis ball for a puppy till he's out of breath and he's thirsty and you offer him a pan of water or a pan of Pepsi, he's gonna drink the water every time because he has some instinctual need to survive where that is more palatable for him. All the advertising in the world around the Pepsi is not gonna affect his decision billboards, little billboards, Pepsi puppies, get more puppy pussy. He, he's still drinking the water. I don't, I don't get it, Tom. You could not Michael Vick that dog into drinking a lick of Pepsi. But us, uh, fucking give me another Red Bull. I'm fucking, put more mayonnaise on it. I love the taste. It's killing me, but fuck it. Let's do another rail before I fuck her without a rubber. Everything that's going to kill you is extremely appetizing. And that's the sign that we're fucking not supposed to be here and we're on our way out. No other animals do that. Fucking woodpeckers don't fucking get addicted to chewing tobacco. Raccoons don't need to do poppers in order to come while they're having anonymous same-sex interludes in a highway rest area before slinking off into the night in a cologne of shame because they know it's not good for them instinctively something tells them that's bad Man's natural instinct to procreate, well, man also has fucking logic where he goes, oh wait, there's only so much space and so much shit and most of it's fucking gone. You have to balance that. Maybe it's instinctual to be monogamous, but if you know you're gonna fuck your sister, maybe you should not be monogamous right yet. I don't know. Some of this isn't worked out completely. Do you think monogamy is instinctual on any level at all? Is it completely a learned behavior or is any part of that? Is it completely contrived though? Like if you grew up in a world where everybody just fucked everybody randomly and for fun as a you know, pastime, see your friend from college, hey, I haven't seen you since, well, fuck him over a bus bench and you got nothing to say. If you grew up in that world, you just automatically go along with it. So then would love still exist? I mean, not, not like the bullshit love, like we've been together for 12 years and he's my best friend. We're like, I can, I mean that initial retardation love, that few weeks or months of, uh, you know, just that allergic reaction to, I can't believe someone wants to fuck me twice and sober this time. So I'm gonna print off all her emails and read them to my friends as innocuous and benign as they might be. She put an emoticon. <laughs> Would you still have that in a world where everyone just fucked randomly? Or is that retardation a byproduct of a forced monogamy where you only feel like that because of... And I don't know. I don't have an answer. I, I know... Uh, I, 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 I mean, there's good things about monogamy. Uh, you get sick of fucking the same person. That's a bad thing. Uh, but it's part of the... Like, I'm old, I, I, I'm either gonna be monogamous or not fuck anyone, because I'm not gonna be some old, that old creepy dude still trying to work chicks at the bar, and hey, what's your name? <laughs> Get away from me. And I don't care anymore about fucking so much, so I don't, there's parts of monogamy, but you do get sick of fucking the same person, not like, like puke on her back sick. <laughs> like, oh, 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 I can't believe I'm doing this, oh, oh. But there's no thrill anymore. There's no, like the first few times you fuck someone, you get that animal conquest. Yeah, there's no, like a victory. Like, ah, I beat you. <laughs> hey, I tricked you. You shouldn't be doing this at all. <laughs> I win. Somehow I'm a winner. I've won. And then after the you, you, first few times, you, I've been through all your holes and I slopped a load on your head and what else? And, Move on. I want to keep winning. I want that feeling of victory. Being in love is the best feeling in the world. Like it really is. There's no that initial couple of weeks of ah, this is better than any fucking drug in the world. And what you do by committing to someone is agree that neither of you will ever feel that good again. <laughs> Let's agree 
to never have the best feeling in the world ever again. You and me, baby. <laughs> Chicks will find, this is like 3% of the animal kingdom that you know, is monogamous, and a chick will find one on Discovery Channel or whatever and, <laughs> and throw it in your face to try to rationalize you, know, you not fucking her sister. <laughs> and uh, monogamy, it's not unnatural. You know, uh, there's a weird kind of fucked up, obscure penguin <laughs> that fucks for life. And you go, well, the penguin is working solely on instinct. He doesn't have any bank of knowledge or history or societal pressures that make him monogamous. He's working purely on instinct. He doesn't have to do what we do. He doesn't have to lie to a chick for three months and act like he likes to do shit he doesn't and court her and hang around a botanical garden. <laughs> So he can finally get her to sign the contract and they buy an overpriced fucking iceberg out in the fucking gated community somewhere. And then he sits there for three and a half years questioning his judgment as all the passion is sucked out of the relationship. He's fucking pretending to be asleep until she really is asleep so he can sneak out and waddle across the glacier to go fuck that skank whore penguin in the fucking Section 8 housing. She's all fucking dirty and stuff. She wears a latex mask and ties him to a crucifix and whacks him on his crazy dick with a riding crop. And, fucking, and he's like, ah, fucking, ah. But she knows what the fuck's going on. She's not a stupid penguin. She's hired a private investigator. He takes pictures through the igloo window. The fucking cheaters, penguins, cheaters, kicks in the door with a camera crew. You're a cheater. And then they hire a lawyer and sue him for half his fish. <laughs> Penguin doesn't have that. He has fucking instinct and fish. We have other shit to deal with. I'm sorry if this gets too depressing, but it gets worse. <laughs> I know a lot of people come to see comedy to get away from their problems, and I I don't have that kind of show. <laughs> I have the kind of show that reminds you of your problems, and then I talk about other problems you didn't even know you had till tonight. <laughs> then I dump all my problems on top of that, and you walk out of here 10 times more depressed than when you even walked in, and it's the only time I smile during the night, is watching you leave all sad. And that's not professional. I had a guy kill himself after a show a year and a half ago. Clark Adams was his name. Yeah. And it wasn't that weird because the people who... Like, I have a really fucked up, you know, audience. The people who are into what I do over the years, it's not a lot of them, but there's some dark fucking souls that come around. And I'm glad you're here because you're the only people I can talk to, man. It's not for everyone. It's fucking... But this small, narrow corridor of people who are into this, I'm glad you're fucking with me because it's a big, ugly world out there without you. It's not ever going to be popular. It's almost like what I do is, uh, it's like fetish comedy. It's just like fetish porn where, yeah, it's not, you know, the adult babies or that shit you look at on the fucking, at work on the internet. Look at this, hairy girls. You got sideburns and this big Chernobyl beaver. It goes all the way up to her belly button. Brillo up the ass crack. And yeah, she's never going to be mainstream porn, but the people who do jack off to her will drive a long way to see her live. And that's what I count on with you. This isn't, this isn't really so much about a career as it is not feeling so fucking alone in thinking like this. That makes any sense. Because I can hang out with you guys. And there's not, you forget that this is what I do for a living. I talk to you guys. You're all I know. I jump on a plane. I go to the next town. And I drink with you guys again. And you forget sometimes that there's a whole real ugly fucking world of people out there that you don't want to meet. Until you have to go to your, you know, girlfriend's fucking grandparents house for dinner and you're like oh jesus what do i say these are oh this is what people are like i had a i had a i took a shuttle bus i'm doing this gig and i took a shuttle bus it would take me to the club it's like a fucking holiday and it's some shitty fucking regular hotel 
And I get in the shuttle bus this night, and uh, there's an older couple, you know, upper class, middle upper class, like 60s, you know, the gated community types. And I go, hi, hi. And uh, then the shuttle driver gets in, and she looks at me, and she goes, wait, you're the comedian from the comedy club, right? I go, yeah. She said, these people are coming to your show. You're both going to the same place. How about that? I go, oh, motherfucker, Jesus. <laughs> Stop, why did you do that to me? Like, first of all, I know they're not, they have no idea who I am. They're going to a comedy club because they think it's all Jay Leno bullshit. And, uh, but not only have I been thrown under the bus, and I know they're going to hate me, but now I'm stuck forced talking to them for eight minutes. <laughs> and making up, it doesn't sound like a long time. It's a fucking eternity. When you're just trying to make up small talk, whoever the f six people I was with in the elevator know how awful I am <laughs> at trying to make small talk when I'm dead sober and trying to prepare for a show. And now I'm talking, and they don't want to talk to me either, but we're put into that social contract where every word I say is, it's forced and it's unnecessary and it hurts. Every word feels like a tooth extraction and it's bleeding and it's like a brick being forced through a funnel, vomiting up a, oh, so where are you from? <laughs> and then a stagnant dead air. And, well, we're down because our niece is graduating. <laughs> and every second it hurts. I don't get that with you guys. I'm drink with you guys after the show at the bar and I don't you know that's it when I talk to you guys I know if you still want to talk to me after listening to an hour of my bullshit it's probably gonna be interesting right away if you listen to all the shit I say there's no more need for pretense and social mores. You just say, hey, Doug, you know that thing you said about hydrocolon therapy? That's wicked funny, because when we were kids, my gay uncle Nick tried to suck a bullfrog out of his ass with a dirt devil, ended up tearing his colon wall. It went septic. If my mom hadn't been there doing his laundry, no one would have known he might have died. And you go, this is so disgusting and compelling all at the same time. With no build-up, it's just right there. You don't get that in a shuttle bus full of old fucks. <laughs> old country club fucks. <laughs> I'd like that. Come on in the shuttle. This is my wife. We were just talking about the night we met almost 40 years ago. You know, I raped her that night. It was date rape, they call it now. But it was rape. She was kind of drunk, and she was trying to shoo me off. But she was puking too bad to actually say no. And back then, there was so much shame and repression, she thought it would be better just to play along like she did want it. And we've been together ever since in a bitter, sniping relationship. I would love that. That would be a welcome exchange rather than, eh, when we grew up, all of this was nothing but... <laughs> So I'm trying to be nice to these people. I'm a nice guy, I just, just don't have any common ground. So it's nice and small talk. But the more I'm being nice, the more I feel like I'm being deceptive somehow. Where I should just be honest and say, listen, you'll never get what I do. It's not for you. Here's your money back. Go see a Bruce Willis movie. I don't want to fuck up your Saturday. <laughs> but somehow that would be considered rude. You won't get it. It's not for you. So I had to do the wrong thing by continuing to be nice, knowing the longer I'm nice, the more they build up, you know, some, the more they're going to be disappointed when they see my act because they will fucking hate what I do. And it made me wonder if any of the 9-11 hijackers ever got into a similar pickle with bad airplane conversation. <laughs> where they're just trying to trying to go do their gig and they got it all worked out in their head and they're trying to concentrate and then they get through the airport security and that box cutter is shaking in their pocket it's showtime we gotta be ready to go but then they sit them next to some chatty cunt back in coach oh you got a middle seat come on in sit down want a piece of my usa today you can have the money section i'm just kidding nobody wants the money section anyway <laughs> I had no USA today. <laughs> that traffic at Logan was atrocious. 
Very bad traffic. <laughs> Weather map shows a lot of thunderstorms in the Midwest. I hope we don't hit any turbulence. Yeah, turbulence. Oh, yeah, I don't like the rocky plane. <laughs> Long flight to Disneyland. Oh, it'll take a lifetime. Jesus fucking Christ. Here's your money bag, lady. Take the bus. You're not going to get what I do. You'll never understand. It's not for the mainstream. <laughs> so this dude, Clark Adams, had killed himself. <laughs> we do this. We used to have this party every year in Death Valley for about seven years. Just uh, about like 70 or 100 of us. We'd go out, way out in the middle of fucking nowhere in Death Valley. And every year we'd go. And just this colossal drug use and you know, booze and no cops and fucking loose women and tight women and tight men and loose stool and sunburns and fucking <laughs> juvenile drug abuse, like stupid shit. Like one year we were snorting chopped up Ritalin at the end because it was all that was left. And you're just like teenager stupid shit. And this was the year, two years ago, where Steve Fawcett went missing. Steve Fawcett, they just found his remains. He was a billionaire adventurer is what they kept referring to him as it's a fucking adventurer is that a career choice you a fucking cape fear community college for adventurer <laughs> fuck is it because i think i think a, an adventurer is nothing but someone who takes unnecessary risks with their own life for no benefit to humankind just to get some adrenaline and have some fun i'm not against it you know, he's a fucking 60-year-old billionaire. It's hard to have fun when you're 60 years old and you have a billion dollars. And I know that because I'm 42 years old and I have $9,000 and I'm out of ideas. <laughs> fucking, I, I have nothing to spend it on. I'm, I'm bored shitless. <laughs> I will die with that $9,000 still sitting there. And he's... A billionaire. He's bored with shit I couldn't even comprehend or make up. He just has fucking picks up the yellow phone to have small Indonesian toddler boys air lifted in, covered in the finest talcum powder, and chucked out of a fucking C-130 cargo plane in a cartoon crate, and they waft down on a parachute into his backyard of his ranch. He runs out in his PJs, his stocking PJs, like a kid at Christmas. The boys are here, the boys. And he cranks that thing open, and he gets ping pong paddles, and he starts paddling them on their talcumed bottoms, and the powder comes up, and he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> until the pink bottoms show through the talcum powder, and he goes, okay, these are spent, order more. <laughs> and he goes, it's not as fun as it used to be. Let me go into my giant aquarium and my 40-ton blue whale. I'll walk through his jaw and sit in my smoking room in his belly and think of a new idea. I am bored. I'm just saying, he can do that kind of shit. I understand why he does crazy shit and tries to race balloons around and break land speed records or whatever. I just don't know why he gets to be called an adventurer. I'm taking the same adventures in the same desert 400 miles south. I'm just doing them with my brain and chemicals and, and stuff. Because I don't have a billion dollars to get hydroplanes and jetpacks. I have to do lines of mocaine in Death Valley. where you, That's where you chop up your mushrooms with the cocaine and you grind it all up in a one big fat line and you do a red... It's the worst idea in the entire history of the Death Valley Desert Party. But someone said the word mocaine, everybody laughed, so we had to try it for reals, just to make it official. And it was fucking terrible, because you get the same post-nasal cocaine drip going down the back of your throat, but now it's mushroom flavored. And if you've never done psilocybin mushrooms, it's the most awful flavor any angry god could create because he doesn't want just anyone going through his fucking jewelry drawer and finding out his secrets. So, uh... So we did that, uh... Point was, yeah, fucking even X Games guys, they fucking, or extreme fucking snowboarder dude, whatever, you fucking, oh, it's a fucking, hey, we're going up to Mount Hood because there's a disastrous storm on its way in and we're going to go off trail and they get buried by a fucking avalanche 
And all of a sudden, the, the National Guard's out there and Wolf Blitzer's fucking <laughs> announcing candlelight vigils, hoping everyone rushes out of the bar and chucks pool cues into a snowbank, hoping to hit hot meat and be a hero and get on the news. <laughs> These guys are celebrated. Well, how's my adventure different from fucking snowboarder shithead? I'm taking unnecessary risks. They're just in my own head. Just because he's a snowboarder, he's an extreme sportsman. That's a cool fucking adventure. Why? Because you get rock hard abs and chiseled calves, and all I get is, you know, perhaps understanding and empathy for the human condition. Oh, but what's that worth? Fucking nothing. So we do this show after the party. We had scheduled a show in Vegas because there's like 12 fucking great comics at this party. We never get to work together. Let's schedule a free show at my buddy's bar. We were going out of Vegas airport anyway. We'll take one night. Sounded like a great idea uh, three months ahead of time. We weren't calculating in how we would feel after four days of fucking brain raping, hallucinogen <laughs> use and other... So we had this show scheduled and we have to do it and nobody wants to do this show. Everyone's like just strung out comedy. What the fuck is that? Like, I don't know why anything I've ever said elicits laughter. I, how is comedy a business? You're thinking like are you, people get paid to do this. Are we so bereft as a species of laughter that you will actually pay money? I have like chicks that give me shit about all the whores I've fucked. You really slept with that many prostitutes and you talk about it like you're proud about it? That, I think that's sad. I think it's sad if you have to pay for it. You just paid me 20 bucks just to chuckle, whore. We're all fucking sad. We're, s We're sad on every level. What are you talking about? So this show, it's a... It's just one comic after another that doesn't want to be there, and I'm just phoning everything in. Did you ever see that one commercial? Oh, I can't believe I say this. It's such an empty fucking thought. I'm awful, and I just phoned in this piece of shit show, but it was a free show, so we're going, fuck it, you get what you pay for. We wrote it off. I forget that a lot of people do go out of their way to see me for fucking free or $20. It doesn't matter to them. And two days later... I get a MySpace fucking email. Doug, you might not remember me. I was the blonde woman at your show at Tommy Rocker's in Las Vegas. I had you sign a thing for me, blah, blah, blah. I just wanted you to know that my best friend and your biggest fan, Clark Adams, saw your show as the last thing he did on this earth. On Monday, he took his own life. This guy not only killed himself, he had planned his own suicide postponed it because he saw I was coming to town and he never missed my shows. <laughs> he killed it. And you're going, all I could think is that show sucked ass. That was the worst show I've done in years. Why didn't you tell me about this? Why didn't you send me an email ahead of time? Hey, I'm going to kill myself on Monday, but I'm going to see you Sunday first. I hope you have a great show. I would have prepared more. I would have sat in a fucking coffee shop and wrote out a set list. I'd have given, I wouldn't pander like comedy clubs do for a fucking birthday party or bachelorettes, but you're going to kill yourself after the show. I'll song and dance a bit for you. <laughs> you know, oh, we got a special event over here at table four. What's your name? Oh, nice to have you out, Clark. <laughs> I'll do that. Because I understand that mentality. I'm not... Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm not the kind of guy that if you tell me you're going to kill yourself, I'm not going to try to talk you out of it. <laughs> what am I going to say? Oh, well, there's, there's so much to live for. No, there isn't. <laughs> Come on, there's hope. Where? I haven't found any. I think about suicide every fucking day of my life, and I think the only thing stopping me is the lack of a perfect idea. Once I have a perfect idea, like something that's like really funny and disturbing at the same time. Like the stuff I look for in my act. It's something that you go, oh, I'm ashamed I laugh. When, that will elicit the response when someone tells you, hey, did you hear Doug Stanhope killed himself? Oh, that's really fucked up. No, wait, this is good. You're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna love this. This is, 
When I get that idea, I think I'm going to do it right away because I will be so paranoid that someone will steal it from me. <laughs> I, was, I was in, in Norway and a dude says, I have your perfect uh, suicide. I can't do Norwegian. So just fucking, I have your perfect suicide idea. He said, you jump off a building with a rope tied to your feet and you have a thin wire around your neck that stops short of the rope, so it cuts off your head. But you glue your hands to each side of your head. So when you swing... <laughs> that is fucking brilliant! But it's yours! the last way you want to die as a comic is doing someone else's material. <laughs> Why didn't I think it out myself? You tell me you're going to kill yourself. The only thing I'm going to ask you to pry into your personal business is how you're going to do it. I want to know. I want to know what you came up with. I had to ask the lady who emailed me about Clark Adams. I'm like, I sent a couple, you know, consoling. I'm sorry, I'm sure he's a great guy, and uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Third email. By the way, <laughs> how did Clark pass? And I get a one-word answer back. Helium. <laughs> you, you can't just leave me hanging all alone with helium. I need some follow-up to Helium, but I can't gouge her for details. I know you're mourning right now, but between sobs, if you get a moment, could you explain graphically how someone kills themselves with fucking Helium? But you don't have to ask. I figured out, oh wait, Google, that's right. We have Google for brains. We don't need fucking Helium suicide search. And it's a lot of, a bunch of shit. It's evidently a lot more common than I could have ever imagined. It's not, it's like, a, it's like a painless asphyxiation. It's like carbon monoxide, only it's not nearly as popular because more people have a car and a garage than they have fucking clown shoes and a <laughs> balloon tank hanging around in the basement for a gloomy Monday. <laughs> Goodbye, cruel world! <laughs> Goodbye, Clark Adams! And good night, Cape Fear! Good night! That was good. Is that all right? Are we done recording? All right, good enough. All right, Jesus, I fucking hate recording CDs more than anything. I want to talk to you, I want to riff. No, stick to the script. Stick to the fucking script. I hold on fucking sweating. Oh, I want to riff. Oh, God damn it. My brain does not work fucking well on a leash. Are we good, Brian? Ah, oh, motherfucker, I forgot that goddamn fucking joke. It's not a joke, it's a story, but it goes here. See if you can edit this, Dan Schlissel. It's about the fucking people telling me stories and the fucking... Get Hang on, just shut up. I'm going to try to fucking sneak this in like it was natural. This is coming from the fucking dirt devil fucking bullfrog sucking out of the ass, which is made up. But uh, I was... Uh, Caroline's... Caroline's in New York City where I played and a guy came up to me afterwards and he said, you know the thing you said about people telling you stories after the show? He's my usual type of fan, which is a school shooter who didn't have bullets and now he's all awkward <laughs> and alone and doughy and he has no friends with him. And he tries to, he's kind of blocks my path as I'm rushing to sell merchandise. And uh, he goes, excuse me, um, hey, you just talked about people telling you stories after the show. Do you want to hear a story? about the time I shook another man's hand inside a woman's vagina. And, I, and I'm like, man, I gotta sell merchandise, but after I get done, uh, if I get time, uh, all right, fuck it, go ahead, Ida, go ahead, tell me the story. And the dude, it was a great story, he was an EMT, 
and he had, uh, had some breech birth situation where he had to go to the call. He had to put his hand inside of the woman to hold the baby's head. It had come out sideways or weird, and he had to hold the head off the cervical wall so it wouldn't suffocate for the whole trip to the emergency room. He said his hand was in there for like 45 minutes, getting her into the dress so the doctor could prep, and they did a C-section, and the doctor did a C-section and took the baby out and reached through the C-section to shake his hand for a job well done. And I go, that's fucking fantastic. It's absolutely a brilliant story. And those are the stories that my fucking audience has. You don't get that story in a shuttle bus full of country club fuckers. I think that will end it perfectly. All right. Thank you guys very much. Have a great night. I'll see you soon. Good night. Some people say, yeah, I don't have to drink to have a good time. You go, okay. But that means you have to have a good time to have a good time. How do you, how do you pull that off? Just, a, you just assume the universe knows it's your Friday, so some organic good time will swell out of the woodwork and appear at a certain time. You, you read the weekly and find the editor's best bet, and you email all your dumb friends in their cubicles let's meet up we found a local eatery that's well reviewed it has vegan options for sheila we'll meet there at 7 40 where is sheila she's late our sober good time starts in 40 minutes call her on her cell phone maybe we can order for her because we don't want to be late for our sober good time it starts in Maybe you came here tonight to have a good time without drinking. That means you're solely reliant on me being funny, which is a 50-50 shot at best in these waning years of my career. If I suck, you're fucked. All that sober good time planning and the map questing and the finding the parking, and then I just, I was off. I was too fucked up that night and I, now the blame's on you. I don't take those chances. I drink to have a good time. It's a fail safe. I take whatever mundane shit I was doing anyway, and I just start pouring booze on top of it. And within a short amount of time, it's fantastic. I'm talking to some shingle salesman in an airport bar, and he's showing me pictures of his dogs on his cell phone camera, and that's uh, Miss Patsy, and this is Patriot. I call him Patriot, because I got him at 9-11, and then within five drinks, that guy's hilarious to me. I'm hugging that guy on the way to his gate. I'm swapping phone numbers. I have a problem? No, lady. I have a solution. You have a problem with your sober good time. I'll feel like shit in the morning, but I'll know exactly why, because I got hammered. You wake up, you feel like shit, you worry. Oh, did I forget to take my omega-3s? My glands are swollen. Did I touch a toilet handle without sanitizing? I'm not sure exactly. You should have been drunk. You, know, you just wake, you wake up and go, oh, fuck. It'll go away by the afternoon. <laughs> I did stop drinking Jägermeister as though it were some, like, like miraculous life choice. I brag to people when I stop drinking Jägermeister. <laughs> like I'm doing Bakram yoga now and eating tofu. I'm still hammered all the time, but I, it's not Jaeger, which is a, just a shitty drink. At some point, I saw a clip of myself on stage yelling at the bar, 
drunk. Hey, can I get a shot of Jägermeister? But I could see me. Like, in my head, I'm young. But then I saw I'm just an old fucking dude. And just the word Jägermeister coming out of your mouth is some desperate cry to be young again. And it's like the old guy is a silver-haired fox, but he still has two hoop earrings. And he's like, hey, ladies. Like, oh, don't be that fucking dude. Just drink something clear. Because, uh... Uh, Jake LaMotta, the fighter, is a neighbor of ours in Bisbee, Arizona. He lives two blocks down. If you don't know Jake LaMotta, uh, he was a fighter, a legendary fighter. The movie Raging Bull, yes. No. Nah. Robert De Niro. For you 22-year-olds, let me explain. Robert De Niro used to be an actor. Uh, in the moving pictures, uh, one of his greatest roles was that playing Jake LaMotta in Raging Bull. It was a real guy that's our neighbor, and we never met him till last year. A mutual friend brought him to the house to watch football, and we're wicked excited. Like, fucking Jake LaMotta's coming here. And they brought him over. He's like 91. There's no Jake LaMotta left of the Jake LaMotta. So we're all, like, happy, and they bring him in, and we're like, oh... Like for a boxer, my age, they're fucked up. And he's twice that. So they bring him in. Like he's fucking up. They have him by one elbow, 91 years old. Uh, uh, and they plop it on the couch like an eggplant. And we're like, hey, Jake Lamont is here. <laughs> and he's got a trophy wife who's 30 years his junior, which means she's still in her 60s. So... The trophy is a bit tarnished at this point. It's, a, it's no Stanley Cup anymore. It's, a, it's more of a bowling trophy. And she's a very sweet woman. She has all the characteristics of trophy wife. She has bleach blonde hair and the 60-year-old tit job is forced up so the good parts are showing through the top. There you go. Okay, and she's very sweet and she's trying to distract from... Jake LaMotta doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know he's watching football. He's confused on the couch hey. the only time he showed any cognitive recognition of his surroundings I saw him scrambling with his cigarettes and fumbling and looking to the door like who will walk me out so I can smoke and I said it's okay Jake you can smoke in the house he went, uh, uh, uh. that's how fucking deep cigarettes get you nothing else he's a uh, uh. Then straight back to confusion. Uh, uh. So his wife is uh, very sweet, and she's talking to me and Bingo. I can't believe we've lived here so long, and we've never met, and it's so nice. And at some point, she says, you know, Jake and I are doing a play on Saturday night at the Central School in Old Bisbee. We'd love it if you come. I wrote it myself, she says. <laughs> oh, really? All by your little lonely. That fucking half cadaver on my couch didn't chime in with some of his great ideas on how the script should be written for the arc of the story. And normally you would have to stun gun me, cattle prod me to get me into a play. I'm not interested until I spend an hour and a half with Jake LaMotta at my house. That's going to be live on stage. I'm not missing this for the world. And we went and it, was, it lived up to every awful expectation that we had. It was so tragic. She wrote it herself. It's called Lady and the Champ. And she wrote it. So thank God it's mostly her. And she has an acoustic guitar. So she'll tell some stories and anecdotes and then sing some uh, show tune kind of things. In the corner stands a boxer and a fighter by his... And you're like, oh God. And then they, they plop the champ out on the other side of the stage in a chair. And they sit him down. He still has no idea where he is. He still thinks he's watching football at my house. Uh, uh. And his only job is to pepper the script with some uh, one-liners and some shadow boxing. So occasionally he stands up. Uh, uh, 
bought Sugar Ray so many times, I got diabetes. <laughs> Which is not a bad line for a fucking 91 year old boxer. Except the champ forgets he already did the line. So moments later, he stands back up. But uh, in the middle of a song, stop, but sugar ray. So, and they have to come out. They can't stage whisper to him because he's deaf as a stump. So they physically have to come out and push him back down in his chair and yell at him. Not yet, champ. Wait till the end of the number and then you do the, okay? All right. And we're in the back of the room fucking dying. Like it's quiet. We're having to bite our hands like children in church trying not to giggle. It was like seeing if, uh, if, if Mr. Shivo brought Terry Shivo on the road as a song and dance act. Hello, my honey. Hello, my baby. Hello, my ragtime. Uh, uh, thank you. Terry and I will be selling merchandise after the show. Terry will lick your t-shirts for you to personalize them as a little souvenir of the great time we had tonight here. And as much as I'm enjoying it, for all the worst reasons, there's part of my head going, all right, how long before that's you? How many, I've been doing this shit 23 years. How long? I've taken a lot of shots to the head just like the champ. How long before that final synapse in my brain burns out that would have told me, don't do this anymore. You're just, you're, you're embarrassing yourself thoroughly. But I have my trophy wife, Bingo. She doesn't want to get a real job, so she's just shoving me out on the stage. Go get him, champ! Uh, uh, uh. Jager, master! Uh. Maybe it already happened. I don't know. Maybe... Uh, Maybe this is being filmed to rem Don't do this anymore. <laughs> I live every day of my life like it's my last day on earth, kids. And I really, don't clap. You don't know how I live. <laughs> that makes it even more sad and pathetic that, that I would willingly choose to spend any given last day on earth immobilized on a couch sweating, watching a marathon of storage wars, completely content with that. Friends going, come on, let's do something, man. Let's go out. I came all the way down. Let's go live life. And you're like, fuck you. I ain't getting up. I've had to piss for the last four episodes. My prostate is welded shut like a lug nut. And I don't give a shit. I'm not getting up. I gotta find out what's in that safe. Very important to find out after the commercial break what could possibly be in that safe. You guys all have interests and you do shit, and I don't. Yeah, try doing nothing as long as me. I have house arrest on my bucket list, just so I have an excuse for why I can't go do the dumb shit you like that I don't understand. Oh, I'm sorry, I'd love to see your friend play the flamenco guitar, but I got the anklet, sorry. Go right back to watching fucking Hoarders. I watch Hoarders, I see shit I need. <laughs> like they brought the yard sale into my living room and I just poke around. I'm not following the dialogue, I'm just looking at their shit. Bingo, they have an orange microwave. Rewind it. Pause. That's an orange mi How do you get an orange microwave? Underneath the stack of the newspapers and the mummified cat is an orange microwave. Find it on Amazon. That might fill the void in my soul. Orange. Because that, that's I don't even drunk dial people anymore because I have nothing to say. But I drunk eBay and Amazon. I buy shit when I'm blacked out, which is off. Uh, eBay's the worst because if I get outbid, then I take it personal when I'm drinking. And you just fucking looked at my girlfriend weird. Oh, outbid me. I'm gonna fucking outbid you. Yeah, I'll wait. I'll wait. Come on. 
<laughs> oh, up in me, up in you. Because you probably have kids. I don't. I don't have a lot of money, but every penny I have is disposable because I don't have children. I bought a shitty cheap house on the Mexican border. My nut is 800 bucks a year in property tax. I could beg that. You, you're gonna outbid me. Eventually, you're gonna realize, oh shit, my children have to go to college. And I'm gonna realize, oh shit, I need a vintage pachinko machine in my house for some unknown reason. Outbid you, you lose. I'm a giant winner somehow. <laughs> Way worse than drunk dialing, because drunk buying shit, you don't even remember you did it for five to seven business days. <laughs> you walk out of your house and UPS is building some corrugated Great Wall of China outside. And what did I do now? What'd you get yourself this time, Mr. Christmas in July? <laughs> Miracle socks as seen on TV, actual purchase. I don't have circulation problems, but evidently when I drink on Ambien, that's some underlying fear I didn't even know I had, is deep vein thrombosis. I'm gonna die. Maybe that's why I never work Australia. That long flight could kill me with deep vein thrombosis. <laughs> I have no fear of death, except I hate waiting for it. Just come on. I beat cancer. I never had it. That's how I beat it. Like, I, oh, oh, you survived it. I beat the fuck out of it but by not getting it. I've courted cancer every day of my life. I have done everything but fucking pay cancer's taxi fare to my hotel. Won't show up. That's beating it. You survived it. You're like tied. I'm, I get the number one seed in the bracket over you, survivor. I'm a winner. But there is an afterlife. And I, if I can give you any hope in this show, I have definitive proof of an afterlife. I didn't get weird or go religious on you. I'm not saying there's a God. I don't know what the afterlife entails. But here's the proof. My mother killed herself in 2008. Don't worry, this is a fun story. It was the best death you could ever be part of. She was dying of emphysema at 63. Her, her brain was still with it, but her, she was drowning in her own fluids. She's uh, being permanently waterboarded by 45 years of cool milds. She can't take it anymore. We knew it was going to happen when she made the call. I, I can't do it. I'm like, all right, Ma, uh, we'll do what we can. I like... All right, Ma's going to kill herself. I, I don't know what to do. Like, that's, okay, we know it's going to happen, but what, when you say we're going to do it, I'm not going to go buy you a fucking shotgun. <laughs> like, oh, have fun, Ma. <laughs> so I don't, I, I don't know what to do. I don't kill people. Like, I, it's just, it's not something, like, I fantasize about it. If my mother were Nancy Grace, I'd have been all over it. Like, I have plans, but my mother was a great person. So I'm like, how do we do this right? So I called my lawyer. I have three lawyers. We have, like, we're Jewed up big with lawyers in L.A. for this shit, all the camera people and recording contracts. Then I have my local Bisbee attorney that helps me with, like, I got married when I was 20, and I had... 24 years of marital bliss till I remembered, oh fuck, I never divorced that girl I drunkenly married in Vegas. That's for another DVD. So he, but then we have our third lawyer who's a comedy fan. He's our like wink, wink, nudge, nudge, Saul Goodman from Breaking Bad attorney. That he handles all the creepy shit. Like when me and Andy are up late at night doing blow and thinking of creepy, Call Kirshner, see how much jail time we could. Could we go to prison if we actually did this? He's that guy. So I called him knowing he'd hook me up with a, a doctor on the down low, as we say in the black community as a black person. He gave me the number to a, a doctor and a, I go, hey, my mother's gonna cash out and I don't know what to do. He said, what do you have? I go, I got Xanax out the ass. On the border, you can get all the fucking Xanax you want. Uh, it's like, that's no good, that's anti-anxiety. Does she have hospice care? Yeah, she does. Then she should have morphine. Ma, you got morphine? Yeah, I got morphine. All right, she's got morphine. We worked out the dosages and the milligrams, and he goes, if she has 30 of those, that's enough to kill any human being on the planet. 
she had fucking 90. I'm like, okay, we're good. Okay, we never talked. Remember that. Okay, doc. So I'm like, all right, we're going to do this. First of all, bring her to my house because she lived in 300 square feet of hoarder paradise, old electric bills with spider webs all cramped. Like, it's depressing enough if you're going to help your mother kill herself. But we're going to go to my house. We'll tidy up. We'll... So we set her up with a uh, hospital bed in the living room. She had been uh, AA off and on for my whole life. She had, at this point, been four years sober. And I'm like, you're not gonna kill yourself sober, right? You can't take those chips with you. She's like, yeah, you're right, why would I do that? That's dumb. So she, in her heyday, she was a black Russian drinker, so I set out a mini bottle of Kettle One and a mini bottle of Kahlua with her pills for whenever you're ready, let me know. We laid down ground rules. Uh, I said, Ma, if you're gonna kill yourself seriously, uh, you can't do it on Sunday or Monday because that's football. And that's, that's a dick move. If you can call your own time to leave this planet, don't do it during someone else's planned event. Don't be an asshole. And she did it the Saturday before football. That was great. She came in on Thursday, Saturday night. She goes, it's time. And I'm like, time for what? Like medication? No, it's time. And I'm like, oh, fuck, this is real. So I wake up, bingo. Like, it's going on. We start mixing up white Russians. She decided to make black Russians white Russians because she thought the milk would coat her belly better for taking all the pills. Like mother till the end. Do you have whole milk? I got skim. Skim will work. I just don't want to throw up the pills. Chicken soup for the suicide. <laughs> you're so fucking, you're so sweet. So, so we're whipping up drinks and I, don't, I didn't so much assist the suicide as bar back it. Like I'm in there mixing drinks because we're all drinking. We watched Bad Santa together, their favorite movie together. She had a very dark sense of humor. My, I didn't come from nowhere. My mother used to review porn on the man show. She's fucking dark like us. So we watched Bad Santa and she's trying to choke down these pills. She had a very hard time taking pills. So she just you know, gagging and just getting them down. So I'm keeping a vague count. When she got around 30, little over, I'm like, Ma, that's good. You don't need to do any more. You're fine. And she said, I don't want to take any chances. She's so scared of fucking up. She took all 90. <laughs> no, we're sitting there in horror going, you're wasting. Ma, they said 30 of those would kill any human being alive. You could leave 60 of them for me and Bingo as our only inheritance other than the last 17-year-old blind cat you have, Georgia. Yeah, we're gonna have 60 morphines to have spontaneous memorials for mother every here and again. Remember mom, Papa Morphine, woo! What a great lady, what a crazy old bitch. No, hoard her till the end, all fucking 90. And then we fucked with her. All right, I remember her last words as she's coming in and out, because we're just goofing on her as she's doing this, as she's fading in and out. I didn't even know if she'd respond. She was just hammering cocktails. She's, and, and she's laying there half in, half out with a white Russian on her chest that she'd occasionally get to her mouth and it'd spill. You know when you come off the wagon, you hit it fucking hard. And it's pretty bad when you're trying to keep up drinking with an 83-pound, 63-year-old woman. And I go, wow, you're really knocking those back, Ma. And she goes, there's times to be dainty and there's times to be a pig. <laughs> And we all laugh. And this is a mother's problem throughout her life. She was a funny lady sporadically, but when she would get a laugh, she would just hammer it and over tag it and repeat the joke. Like, just keep, I, I can keep getting a laugh off the same joke and it would ruin the joke. And when we all laughed that there's times to be a pig, I saw her go into, she's gonna, and I go, shut your fucking mouth. Those are perfect last words. You're not gonna ruin this joke. Cut the mic on mother. And then we just roasted her as she fell in and out. We just did a Friars Club roast making fun of her and making it a fun, dark suicide. Ma, wait, they found a cure. 
I love you. Oh, fuck you. I was a bad mother. I love you. At one point, I remember uh, I said, uh, Ma, if there's, a, if there's any kind of white light situation, that other side that you get to, if you can communicate with us Houdini style, see if there's any way that you can make the Saints cover eight points at Oakland tomorrow. Because I have money on the game. And they did. The Saints fucking blew them out. October 12, 2008. The Saints won 34-3. I'm not saying that's proof of an afterlife. That was just 40 bucks that I won. Proof of the afterlife is this. If there were no afterlife, how could my mother have bought me and my friends so many nice things from the Sky Mall catalog on her credit card? Four days after she'd passed from this earth. Answer me that, Your Honor. Answer me that. In fact, I'd like to enter these credit card receipts into evidence against the advice of my attorney. Look at that. Four days. I had to swear on your Bible just to testify in my own defense. Your silly fake Jesus only lasted three days before he ran out of that cave like a pussy. My mother, four days, relaxing up there. She's drunk eBaying like I do. That last piece of that story has special meaning to me because in my entire career, that's the only chunk of material I've ever had that had a statute of limitations before I could comfortably tell it on stage. Three years statute for credit card fraud. After that, fuck you. Mother didn't want some silly gravestone. That doesn't do anything. Mother wanted me to have a voice-activated remote control R2-D2 doll. <laughs> I'm just saying we all occupy in our own way. You occupy your fucking filthy Portland hippie selves because you hate the 1% and you hate the banks because of their predatory lending practices against the people and enslave them in a lifetime of debt. What'd you do about it? You stunk up a park for almost a year. I occupy far more efficiently. Maybe you should look to me for leadership. I hate the banks as well as we all do. How did I fuck them? I spent three hours jacking up mother's Chase Bank Visa card after she's dead up to its $10,000 limit, buying dumb shit that no one needs and sticking them with the bill because she had no estate except for that blind fucking last cat. If you want to repo that, have at it. That actually caused damage to the bank not sitting around with a dog with a kerchief and a cardboard sign <laughs> slapping on drums in a drum circle the fucking Occupy movement was such a letdown because you seemed like me angry and we're going to take to the streets and holy shit around the globe people are fuck this we're going to do something and what did you do? You fucked up a park. All you fucked up in a year is some guy's day who wanted to throw a frisbee for his dog, but you, he couldn't because you're all camped out there. You hate the banks? Don't fuck up the park. Fuck up the bank. Who's in charge of this project? Next time, me. We don't really have leadership. You needed some. You have 500 angry people in a park. Go break them up into squads of 20. You can fuck up every branch of Bank of America in a 50-mile radius. Go there. And not as anarchists either, throwing bricks through the windows. What are you, a fucking teenager? Have some ingenuity. You line up as customers at 8 o'clock in the morning. They only have two desks to do actual commerce other than cashing checks and shit. You clog up those two desks as bogus customers. Sit down, cross your legs, apply for frivolous loans all 
day long. That's a lot of paperwork for every frivolous. Yes, I need a billion dollars for an ant farm. Sharpen some pencils. That's a big stack of paperwork. I'd love some coffee. You comb your dreadlocks over to one side, put on your $3 Salvation Army suit, and you clog up all their time. Or you could deny me the right to apply for the loan, and then I sue the fuck out of you for discrimination, causing even more damage to your bottom line, rather than just sitting out there in a park getting tear gassed by cops. What does that do? What are you accomplishing? I got it on tape. Police abuse. Yeah, police abuse people. That's how it works. You're never going to win. Yeah, well, you're going to fight that, and eventually they'll go, it was justified. I was laying there. I'm paralyzed. I was face down in the park. They tased me. Justified. Yeah. Why aren't you the cops? That's a better idea. You had a fucking year in a park. The first week of Occupy, you should have called everyone with no police record out, made them go apply to be police, you'd have had people that have gotten through the academy, they're in the works now, they're moles on your side, they're sitting in there in a riot helmet with a Bluetooth underneath the Star Wars helmet, calling you in the park, giving you heads ups. Hey Kevin, you might want to put on a gas mask around 7.45 a.m., you know what I'm saying? Thanks, Shane, but we're already wearing gas masks because we haven't showered in seven and a half months and Angela's snatch is really starting to reek up the pup and something ferocious. But keep fighting the good fight, power to the people. Good Christ, you could have done so much with that. There's a fucking million ways you could have been clever. I, 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 I love, that's why I love like WikiLeaks and anonymous because they're actually in there. They're fucking with the system. They're not sitting around chanting and slapping bongos. Bradley Manning didn't get to release all that information by sitting in a drum circle. He had to get inside. That's why you should fucking read up on Scientology. And I'm serious. Scientology is brilliant. If you read this book, Inside Scientology, it's a breakdown of how that evil motherfucker created that religion in a modern time. Every other religion people believe in, you only believe in it because all your ancestry did. This guy had to create this and sell it to adults recently. <laughs> it's as stupid as any other religion, but how did he do it? How did he create this Leviathan? Read this book, Inside Scientology, and apply those evil tactics to Occupy, and you have a fucking winning recipe. You follow L. Ron Hubbard's intimidation, infiltration, harassment, blackmail, complete abuse of the legal system, where you just turn a crossed eye stink look at Scientology and they'll sue you into poverty. You use that for good. You know what L. Ron Hubbard didn't have in his master plan for world domination? Drum circle! It doesn't do anything! You sit in a bad No one wants to hear that! It's annoying as shit! You had enough time in a year to learn how to play real instruments. You could have had a whole New Orleans-style jazz swing band that people want to hear. Boom, 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 boom. But instead, what? I'm not against you. I, I, I appreciate the passion. But I don't know how... Anyone who has a cause in life where they put that much time and effort into trying to change something, how do you pick one thing? How do you, how do you wake up in the morning and look at the billions of things that suck on this planet? You log into your Yahoo News and it's just countries you didn't even know were countries have problems you didn't even know existed. How do you pick one sliver of that and decide that's the one we have to print up t-shirts and have a car wash? <laughs> I would be so confused. I want to make change. I, how do you pick something if it hasn't affected you? Oh, juvenile diabetes? Well, I don't know, but I have lots of free time during the day. I guess I should... Do. Oh, wait, spina bifida. And the guy's right here, and he's uncomfortable to look at. So maybe I'll go with this guy's cause. And clitoral circumcision in the third world? And that... I know that gives me a handy excuse for not finding it, but that's selfish, and I have to stop thinking about me. 
maybe we should. And as soon as you focus on one thing, here comes Sarah McLaughlin on the TV with the skinny, sad puppies and the abused in the arms of an angel. I don't know why animals always seem to trump any human cause, but they do. And now you're telling me about fucking corrective rape, which is some weird thing in South Africa, you know? Corrective rape is where they gang rape lesbians to try to cure them. And I want to, I'm behind that just to bring attention to it because the term corrective rape is such a good comedy reference <laughs> that I demand a bigger laugh when I mention corrective rape, but no one knows about it. So I want to bring attention to your cause. I just don't know how you pick. If I had any cause over the course of my career, that I've bitched the most about, it's overpopulation, which is the root of most of the other problems you care about, anti-children. But I don't know where to send a check. I don't know, like, what do you do? The only solution that I've ever come up with, which I, I think is great, but no one's gotten on board, uh, incentive-based eugenics. Eugenics was a practice of uh, sterilizing people. Hitler got a lot of the credit for it, but it was actually done in this country long before Hitler even though knew who he was mad at. He was, we were practicing eugenics in this country. Eugenics was the uh, practice of forced sterilization of undesirables, which sounds bad. Uh, and the way they did it was bad, because uh, they, they would, uh, first of all, the force is wrong. You don't force people to do things they don't want to do. And B, who decides who's undesirable? They were doing it in this country at the turn of the 20th century, which is the 1900s for a lot of my fans, uh, early 1900s, to uh, criminals, perverts, which is way too vague, uh, the mentally ill, mentally retarded, uh, homosexuals, which makes perfect sense. We don't want them breeding. Little queers running all up and down like gremlins. But if you took away the force and you just made it incentive based for people willing to sterilize themselves, offer up some white trash prizes. You know, NASCAR pit pass, meet your favorite driver. All you're gonna do is snip the sack. Really? Here's supply of sunny delight. You want some Sunny D, don't you? All you're gonna do is putty up that front hole, lady. You still have two holes left to trick guys out of drinks at the bar. What are we gonna do? Are you telling me if I cut off my balls, I'm going crossbow hunting with Ted Nugent? Well, shit, yeah. No, no, sir, 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 wait. No, you don't actually cut off your balls. We just make a small incision with a local anesthetic. Fuck you, I want you to cut off my whole balls. I'm gonna hang them from my rear view mirror like a lucky rabbit's foot. I'm going crossbow hunting with the nudes. I ain't never won nothing in my life. That's a workable plan. There's no, you can't argue with that. It just won't happen. Here's what I think. If you're behind, whatever you're behind, we should triage all charity. So we take the most important and most easily solved first. Everyone works on that and we'll get to yours eventually. I would start with a starving people in a world full of food. That seems easy to solve, you don't need scientists with lab reports and years, no, there's lots of shit, loads of food, there's just, just a transit problem. Someone from FedEx, get the food there. How, we live in a place of fucking horse meat is a scandal, they found horse meat. The, how there, oh my God, have you heard? There was horse meat in my frozen processed lasagna meal. How dare they put a more lean and nutritional meat and now we're gonna dump it by the warehouse fulls in the 
garbage dumps while people are starving to death on this planet. That makes no sense. I can solve that. Yeah, take that food and feed the people who don't have it. And then we get down to the next most important and the wrongly accused and the torture and the thing and the disease and occupy is lower and then save the manatees even lower than that and eventually hopefully in a perfect world we get down to the bottom which is toys for tots how fucking embarrassing is it to live in a country where toys for tots is an actual recognized legitimate charity god forbid little daniel go through some bogus holiday made on some, for some fake deity without Lincoln Logs. The horror. The horror. That's why they have to have Marines and bikers enforce that shit like henchmen. Because otherwise you just go, fuck you, toys, they're starving people. And then some big fucking crew cut guy, I fucking fought for your freedom. Give me a goddamn Lego for the kid. <laughs> It's gonna be tough. <laughs> Whatever your cause, your charity, or your drive, your effort, audit it. Make sure, because so much of it is symbolism over substance, where people think they're helping by doing nothing. Audit all the time and effort and see if you're actually affecting change rather than just, oh, we're going to have a 10K fun run for the cure. Come on down on Sunday. It's a 10K fun run for the cure. Why? Why? When has running ever cured anything? I don't understand the cause and effect on this. Is, is that how Jonas Salt cured polio? Is by speed walking around the track down at St. Mary's High School with a wife beater on and a paper number safety pin to his back? Oh, we're doing it for the cure. How are you curing anything? Well, what I do is I get sponsors. And every time I go around the track another time, my sponsor gives me another quarter for the cure. So I got to go as many times as I... Are your friends that sick and sadomasochistic that they wouldn't just cut you a check outright for the cure? They make you do weird shit first? Larry, you know, my daughter was born with cerebral palsy and we're trying to get a big fundraiser going. Really? Yeah. How many hard-boiled eggs will you eat? Come on. Come on. You love your kid, right? Come on. No, they would cut you a check outright, but you're that much of a fucking megalomaniac that you have to make the cure about you. You need spotlight in this. You could just get a check, but no one's going to fucking... Be, oh no, you know the truth is I do the same speed walk at St. Mary's every morning at 6.30 before work with my Labrador, Sheba, trying to shed a few pounds, you know, but no one claps for me then and calls me heroic, so I'm going to do it on Sunday afternoon for the cure and everyone's going to go, go Ray, go! Yeah, you could do it, but you want to fucking, it's, it's a 10K fun run about you, you fucking megalomaniac. Stop it. You know you're not doing shit. You can just get the check from your friend and then actually do something that means something other than running. We're, we're getting donations and we're petitioning City Hall for a spot in the park to big, make a big granite slab for the victims and the sufferers and the survivors of the thing. And then we're going to painstakingly etch each name of the people into the stone at great expense for what? It's a fucking chunk of rock. It doesn't help. Put that time and effort and money into actually something that's calculated that actually helps. We're going to knit a SARS quilt. It's going to take all summer long. Because there's people with SARS and they're chilly with SARS. And then you go, what? We're going to have a, a prayer circle. We're going to have a candlelight vigil at midnight. Could you do less? <laughs> Mathematically, ask your accountant if there's any way you could do any less than that. Well, we are raising awareness. Raising awareness is another form of doing nothing. Only now you're making me aware that the nothing that I've been doing is not up to par with the nothing that you're doing for such a noble cause. 
Why don't you do my nothing for your car? We'll watch Storage Wars for the Cure. And then we'll both be happy in our impotence. And we'll find out what's in that safe. We all win. Raising awareness is me standing next to a drainage ditch where a guy just hit a goat with his moped on the highway. And now they're in the ditch, laying in the muck with compound fractures, and the dude's got a bone sticking through his leg, and the fucking goat's got a bone sticking through his fur. They're both laying there in agony. And I'm raising awareness by standing above them, shouting down an empty highway, Look! Look! Ew! Ew, look! Ew! And they're going, no, help! They're going, no, no, no. Look! It's way easier to just look. Are you aware of breast cancer? Fucking the entire month of October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The entire country turns pink, so you can't not be aware of all your products. You go to the grocery store. You, usually I buy the Progresso soup, but this month I'm going to get the one with the pink ribbon so I know that I've done all I can to help my fellow man. <laughs> I don't read the fine print that says point zero 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 one cents of every can up to a very minimal amount goes to oh it actually goes nowhere near a titty ever at all it goes to more promotional material asking for more money and to give very dubious medical advice where a lot of titties get chopped off that didn't need to because we're an industry not a charity anymore i don't read that part i just see the pink ribbon and know that i'm helping You've destroyed the color pink. There's no need for that. The color, I like the color pink. And you've ruined it. You see pink, that's all you can think about. I have a pink bedroom. My bedroom is pink. I can't sleep in it during October because you just see the color and all you think about is giant metastasizing titties sucking the life out of some poor woman. Why you fuck up a color? Associate it with something else that's negative. You know, traffic and weather brought to you at the top of the hour on fucking 6.20 a.m. Hey, traffic sucks again. This is brought to you by breast cancer. And that way, next time you're stuck in traffic, you go, oh, wow, fuck, this sucks, but not as bad as cancer. Maybe I should try to help. Don't fuck up a color. Do you watch football? This is where it went too far with me. The National Football League participates in Breast Cancer Awareness Month. First of all, why is it Breast Cancer Awareness Month rather than Cancer Awareness Month? I, I assume if you cure breast cancer, that would cure ass cancer and face cancer and shit cancer. It's cancer. Cause kitties sell tickets, stupid. Okay, I forget the marketing angle. Maybe you're right on that. Still, the National Football League participates with the pink gloves and just pink on the players where if you think football is stupid you're right but it's my stupid you have your stupid you can judge me in sports you do you have your own stupid you play world of warcraft or you do renaissance festivals you fucking win brian doyle murray look like competitions you fucking you do you grow organic apples and sell them at the farmer's market. You learn how to speak Italian on the Rosetta Stone so one day you can impress your friends by ordering an Italian at a restaurant and the fucking waiter at Olive Garden looks at you going, I don't know what you're saying, dude. <laughs> Whatever you do, football is my stupid. That's what I do for a few hours on a weekend in the fall to forget how much I hate myself. I don't want to think about breast cancer while I'm watching football to get away from this. It's hard enough to watch football as it is if you're a fan without constantly thinking about AIDS. You have to push that out of your head. Inherently, if you're a fan of the game with the, with the technology that they have now, you watch Monday Night Football or Super Bowl, they have cameras now that come down on cables right over the field, like right over the players' heads, almost touching them. 
You have 60 inches of high definition. You have a camera panning around 11 men bent up in a huddle, <laughs> presenting these beautiful, thick man asses and it's zooming in on each one and it creates this Bangkok whorehouse scenario in your brain. You feel a little tuggle in your sweatpants. You're like, oh, well, what if they were behind glass in Phuket? Which one would I select from my evening's entertainment from the Cambodian guy that runs the place and he's got an eye patch and I go, Jing Dai, Go Da! And he pulls the guy out. Number 28. I haven't even seen all the guys and I impulse buy on 28. He's a, he's a half back with these sinewy horse haunches leaning into me. And in my mind, before I can make a rational decision, I've already leaped over the railing at the field. I'm streaking butt naked across the field wearing nothing but a I'm wearing an 1800s nightcap that's a striped with a pom pom I don't know why that but I'm wearing flip flops because they make you run funnier but my dick is slapping up and down against my belly you make your dick however big you want it to be it's your fantasy have your dick slap in your chest have your dick take a tooth out on the way to the huddle it doesn't matter just get to 28 and yank him out of the huddle and put, pin him to the ground, hold him down with one elbow, peel those, they wear these little lycra pants, they're so fucking gorgeous. And you just peel him off him, and he's sweaty, they're just gonna slide off like a wet band-aid. Don't fuck with the jock strap, it's no obstacle to the asshole, you're wasting time. Plus the little straps keep the ass cheek up and focused steam comes off his ass get your face in there you huff that steam you huff it like a gassy rag inhale his essence and you peel those ass cheeks apart with your thumbnails like like you're cracking a cage-free farm fresh egg and you take your dick don't stab him with it right away tease him with it here we go in and up Asshole to tailbone, people. Asshole to tailbone. Watch him struggle. He knows it's gonna happen. He doesn't know when. Oh, 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 oh. asshole to tailbone. Pull on his face mask a bit. Twist his neck. Pull on his dreadlocks. And these are not Occupy Wall Street dreadlocks, by the way. This is a black dude. This is straight up racism. This is a hate crime. Because, because you are pretty sure that your ex-wife used to fantasize about this guy doing similar shit to her. You knew it. Oh yeah. You want to do that to my wife? You'll never get a thicker boner than that angry, racist, jealousy boner. Veins are coming out of the head and nothing makes you crazier than when you get that boner, you're just jamming in them like a fat salamander and you ride, you do that porn angle where you bend your dick down and do deep knee bends so you can look at the people. You have 55,000 people are now out of their chairs on their feet chanting for you. They love you. They're like, fuck that guy. Fuck that guy this is his home field and they're on your side all of a sudden fuck that dude yeah they're spilling beer you feel the rubber start to slide off of you but you don't give a shit this is my day they love me i'm gonna launch rainbows of coming to this broken motherfucker and you do you're not even done coming when you pull out your dick's just still fire hosing and swaying back and forth getting rid of the last of the spurts and and you have a end zone celebration dance that you've worked out in the hallway mirror all season little old school icky shuffle thing and you spike the ball right next to his head he's blubbering like snot bubbles and crying he's not even making an attempt to get up his asshole is still dilated he's spasming his asshole is winking like a cyclops in a rainstorm. He's trying to regain its original shape. One milky tear is dripping down the tank. It's crying for you.
and you float out of this perfect Sunday afternoon and this perfect daydream back into the stark reality of it's just you as some bloated post middle-aged dude with you got lumps of yellowed gummy cum and your gut hair and you look around you feel immediate remorse and shame I I let the rubber come off inside of that guy how irresponsible is that knowing what we know today to just bareback fuck a guy I don't know where that guy's been I know where he's going he's going into free agency he's fucking 32 now he's got shit knees he's lucky if he's warming a bench in Jacksonville but I don't know where he's been to just bareback fuck the dude I could have fantasy AIDS as we speak and I'm gonna do it again and as you're dealing with this, you want to escape, you look at the TV, pink shoes, I have to think about breast cancer on top of this problem. You're ruining the integrity of the game, breast cancer. This is what we do on Sundays to forget how much we hate ourselves. And I don't, uh, I hope I didn't uh, ruffle any feathers. But as an openly gay comedian, I feel a responsibility to talk about a lot of issues that, what, is, what are you gonna test me? You don't know if I'm lying. I can be as gay as I wanna be up here, fuck you. What, are you gonna strap me to a chair and blow loads in my face to see if I'm fibbing when I say I love it? I'm gay if it fucking... If it needs to be, I'm gay, I'm fucking gay. And you should be gay as... I come out of the closet all the time. It's something fun for me. Do it all the time. I'm not saying lie to your friends and family or lead a fake life, but if you're just in some bullshit social situation around people you don't know, if you can drop the errant... I'm gay in a conversation, not relevatory, like, I have to tell you, just drop it as an aside. Is it just you and your girlfriend for breakfast? Ah, oh, that's not my girlfriend, I'm gay, but it's just two of us. Is it a buffet or can I order off the menu? Just drop in, just if everyone was just someone, oh, I guess they're just gay. Because here's the thing, I, I love homosexuality, I defend it, but I hate fagginess because it's aesthetically unpleasing. The whole la 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 shiny, you don't have to do that. It's the same, I, I have nothing against Jewish people. I hate Jewiness and the clamming, nang, 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 clamming. I just can't get all with my allergic. It's just like, the, personally that's unpleasing. I hate anyone who leads with their sexuality, homo or hetero. If I know your sexuality in the first 30 seconds of meeting you, you're fucking annoying. <laughs> Heteros are the same way. If you have naked lady mud flaps, or you go, oh, after your show, you want to go to Hooters, or you just watch the game for the cheerleaders, just go into a basement and jerk off, you fucking teenager, 13-year-old, and then come back when we got to have a regular conversation. So it's not. that's why I like to come out of the closet as just a normal dude. A guy on the plane going, yeah, I remember when stewardesses used to be hot, now they're all fat. And you go, yeah, I'm right with you. Buddy, I fucking thank Christ I'm queer because they are fat as shit. <laughs> but just because maybe somewhere around you when you just drop a normal I'm gay in a conversation, there is an adolescent kid who's just coming to terms with the fact that he's gay and he's fucking terrified. Not only it just being gay, maybe he thinks he has to be jump out of the cake and ride a fucking float, assless chaps, ice capades gay. And he hears you say it just like a normal dude, I'm gay, and he goes, oh, I can do that. I can be just regular Anderson Cooper, Todd Glass, Joel Osteen, faggot, and you give him courage. And it's in the Supreme Court now, uh, for gay marriage, and I hope you get it. Get the right to marry, and then don't. It's important to get the right. 
Not just symbolically, but sometimes you have to be married to game the system. You need the insurance, you need the inheritance, you need to pull the plug. Maybe you just need to get someone cool into the country. You know? <laughs> so you need it for that, but don't if you don't have to. It's kind of like the civil rights movement where black people had to fight for the right to eat at the same lunch counter. Once you won that right, I hope you didn't. The guy's a fucking racist. Why would you support his business unless you're just trying to fuck with him and show up just because he doesn't want you, which I understand, and maybe that's where you started not tipping. If so, every tradition has to start somewhere. Let's just hope it was for a good cause. Have a great night, Dante's Portland. It was nice to be back. I'll see you soon. Have a good night. The saying they love in Bisbee is that when you go through the tunnel coming into Bisbee, you're going back through time. If you don't know the story of this venue, it used to be a church, and then it became a theater, and then a, 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 a beautiful local eccentric millionaire put a couple million dollars into renovating it to make it this... I, but one of the best places I've ever played. And uh, then he closed it. <laughs> and, uh, then he reopened it. Then he got angry and closed it again. <laughs> then he reopened it like, as a movie theater or something. And then he got angry and closed it. And then he said, fuck it. And he just donated it to KBRP, <laughs> the local. Somehow dumping two million dollars into a bar in a town of 5,000 people where the biggest employer is permanent disability and small pensions didn't work out for him as a business plan. That's, uh, the statistic is uh, roughly one out of six Americans live below the poverty line, which I know that's you, my fan base generally. <laughs> probably four out of six of my fan base below the poverty line. My friends in Bisbee, five out of six easily, plus a fraction. But it's not it's not poverty. It's the people down here work as little as possible, which is admirable just enough to get by that's below the poverty line but it's just kind of broke is what it is it's not poverty it's insulting to impoverished countries to say one out of six people live in poverty that's american standards of poverty where yeah yeah you still have a flip phone and you're embarrassed to break it out in front of chicks that kind of disgraceful poverty you have you have to watch walking dead on bit torrent oh my god the way i have to live gonna roll up the passenger side window with pliers because the handle fell off and your dodge neon you don't have power windows wow you're well below the poverty it's not world poverty. Like that's uh, our landfills are a third world bling. The, uh, you know, other, <laughs> you ever, you ever watch uh, uh, Locked Up Abroad? If you haven't, the name is pretty much self-explanatory. It's stories about people, Western people who got locked up abroad. It's usually some chunky girl that get talked into taking an exotic vacation from some smooth talking swarthy man in a cocktail lounge <laughs> and he wanted to take me to indonesia and he was gonna pay for my travel and i thought it was a good opportunity to travel then all I had to do was carry a satchel of his in my asshole and it was going to help me pay for community college. And I was skeptical, but I wanted to travel. So she winds up in some Indonesian prison for seven or eight years. And granted, horrific conditions. 
just gets shit in a bucket and bugs crawl in and out of her orify at night and rats nibble her toes and everyone hates her. It's not pleasant, but what they never address is just outside of those prison walls, exact same conditions as real world poverty. Some kid sitting right outside the corrugated walls and the razor wire whistling songs. He's got raw sewage shit river running through his front lawn. He's got to spear rats in a dump to feed his kinfolk. It's just another day in Indonesia. I want to see locked up abroad, a broad version. Where that same kid gets the same opportunity to smuggle drugs into our country, gets busted at Newark International with black tar heroin in his asshole, spends eight or ten years in one of our finer penal institutions. What tales of woe he's going to write back to his parents. Dear mother, I am writing to you now from paradise. I now live in a castle where my room measures a full six feet by nine feet that I share with only four other people. Meals are catered to my door thrice daily with relatively few maggots as compared to the home cuisine. Every room in my estate is equipped with a stainless steel throne full to the rim with clean drinking water. So plentiful, you can just take a dump in it as a goof and press a button. And it's replenished with even more clean drinking water. Mother, I make 72 cents a day here in the prison laundry. Double that what father made sewing shoes for Nike. <laughs> Mother, mother, I can practice homosexuality openly now with no threat of being beheaded in the town square by the local moolah. And good goodness, isn't that an easy segue into ISIS? Hell yeah. Scary, that ISIS. What the ISIS is doing now, the ISIS is using social media to recruit disenfranchised, angry youth to join them. And that's what I do. <laughs> that's my demographic. Fuck off, ISIS. I'm working this corner. <laughs> It's my people. I have never felt felt threatened by any other comedian. I never had a comedic rival that worried me. If you're into the weird shit that I do, I'm the only guy selling. It's a very small niche fan base of weird people that'll fly from all over the world to come and sit in 150 seats. Jeff Dunham and Peanut is playing across the street for free. You're not flipping a coin. You're here. I got you. No comic has threatened me. ISIS worries me. <laughs> that's, that's you, the angry, young, disturbed, knock-kneed kid in a Misfits t-shirt that showed up alone, lonely and hapless and helpless. Yeah, stay with me. Don't join the ISIS, kid. I actually care about you a little bit. ISIS does not care about you. You think you could have got a selfie with Jihadi John after a Friday night beheading? No. He wouldn't even talk to you. I'll take a selfie with you after the show. <laughs> Evidently, the Jihadi John was killed in a drone strike. And I don't, 
I don't know how this affects the whole beheading video thing. Uh, well, I don't know if it's going to work like True Detective now, where they film eight episodes for a season and then they recast the whole thing now that Jihadi John is gone. But I watched season one of the beheading videos. I don't know if you caught it. I don't know if it's on Netflix yet. But the first run of eight, Jihadi John was the... Uh, the protagonist or antagonist, depending, I guess that's a glass half full kind of question. <laughs> but he's the main guy. He would open the beheading video with this extended monologue, which runs a little too long. It's funnier than Fallon, but it's, it's still. <laughs> so you wrap it up, Jihadi John. Uh, but the, uh, they had a, a different guest star in every episode in an orange jumpsuit and he's down on his knees and he really carried the guest star carried every episode did you now see the beheading video season one uh he had to carry the show because he's limited dialogue which is, that's hard acting when you only have a few lines and you have to carry the whole show just with this stoicism in your face trying to not betray your inner terror you're nervous it's your first time your parents are going to see you on tv and you're trying not to laugh you know, you don't, want, don't want to make the beheading blooper real i can't do it again Sorry. keep laughing but uh, my only critique about the the beheading videos in, in this recent version, there was no cutting off of the head. They, they, you didn't watch? They, they, Jihadi John, blah, 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 and his black rag around his head. And then they put the knife to the guy's head, and then they just cut away to the beheaded body with the head sitting next to it. You just, <laughs> like, if you remember old school early 2000s beheading videos nick berg daniel pearl i was full on oh, eyes rolling back oh, 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 oh. <laughs> this is just a beheaded video it's not a beheading it's, it's past tense it's soft core beheadings there's no penetration You hope somebody is getting chewed out in an editing bay over at ISIS Central Casting. Lois, I saw your latest reel, and you're still missing a very integral part of a beheading video. It's the gurgly gurgly part. That's what the focus groups respond to, Lewis. We're not making art films here. Do you remember 9-11? Imagine if they forgot the footage where the plane actually hits the fucking building, Lewis. It's like I ask you to make me pornography, you show me a man unzipping his fly, and then you smash cut to cum. Just a puddle of cum, and no one knows how it arrived here. <laughs> why did I don't know why they have to recruit when in America there's a mass murder every week just on our own just do that someone goes out and kills a whole bunch of people just take credit for it guy goes out and kills 18 people at work and then kills himself just say that that was us <laughs> ISIS. That was a schizophrenic kid who dropped out of community college and thought the president was reading his emails and, a, and he was a secret alien lizard person. <laughs> no, it was ISIS. It was us. All right. It's just a cheap segue into the mental illness chunk I'm about to do, and it goes on and on. We're going to talk about mental illness, and I know there's a lot of different types. 
But for the sake of this bit, I'm going to break them down into two camps. Camp one, mentally disturbed people. These are people with a mental illness that is disturbing to them. You know, and there's a lot of different kinds. There's the, uh, uh, everything's a germ, man. I, 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 I wear plastic gloves like a Subway sandwich artist because I know everything's going to infect me. And I wear a SARS mask on my bicycle when I go to work. And, or or uh, I got to flip the light switch three times before I go to work. One, two, three. And then I wipe my feet on the mat. One, two, three. And then if I think I forgot to do the light switch, I'll go home from work on my lunch break. One, two, three. And these boil all the way down to the government has a chip in my head and they're tracking my thoughts and they're making me do st stuff. <laughs> Camp one, mentally disturbed. Camp two, mentally challenged people. Also have a mental disability. They just don't seem disturbed by it <laughs> on any level. They seem to quite enjoy having that disability. <laughs> A mental impairment but only one of the two camps gets any kind of sympathy mentally challenged people get all the hugs and kickball in the world <laughs> everyone loves them mentally disturbed get kicked the fuck out of the house as soon as they're old enough there's something wrong with that boy he's got the devil in him get out of my house they're it's not a, he doesn't have the devil in him. He's got a fucking mental illness. Take care of him. But you don't with camp ones because mentally disturbed people are frightening and irritating. They seem dangerous a lot of the time. They have bees living in their beard and they walk through the crosswalk talking to themselves. <laughs> and you know if you make eye contact... All of those problems in his head are going to be your problem. <laughs> and occasionally, it's very rare, but it's always well publicized. Randomly, sometimes mentally disturbed people will go kill a whole bunch of folks for no logical reason that you can see. So you don't want to give them the same sympathy and safe quarter that you do mentally challenged people. No one ever says that. Retards never kill people. <laughs> Nobody ever says, did you hear about Kevin? He went all downsy and shot up a movie theater. It's the weirdest thing. He went full-blown special needs and drowned his own children in a bathtub. Nobody saw it coming. So retards get to live at home until they're 45 or 80. You can never tell how old they are. While your crazy people just get chucked into the street as soon as they turn of age. And then you got free-range crazies walking all over the streets and living in the parks and and then who has to deal with that problem? Us. Smokers. <laughs> Nobody spends more time caring for the mentally disturbed than smokers. Because while you're all in here laughing your balls off at some silly play or break dancing or whatever you do on a Saturday night, we're out front like a salt lick for the homeless. <laughs> You're a stationary target. Oh, here he comes. No, no, no. Oh, hot box it, honey. Get a dollar for him. Uh, it's not fair. We reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. Who's that sign apply to? Where do you enforce that? With your Negroes or your homosexuals? or you're Muslims, you fucking get shut down in a second. That, that sign applies to crazies and crazies alone. 
You couldn't even do that with a retarded kid. Ma'am, uh, your son spilling the cream of weed out of his mouth is making people dry heave. But... No, just crazies can you use that on, and it's fucked up. Hey, Benny shit pants, get off my coffee counter. You're stinking up the place, and the bees in your beard are stinging my customers. You gotta take care of them equally. The whole idea that parents are no longer responsible for their children after a certain age is such utter bullshit. You, you should be responsible for your children for the rest of your natural life. That's, you did that. It's not, it's not I, as soon as you turn 18, it's not your fault. No, it's your fucking fault. Anytime you make the decision to have a child, you're taking a gigantic risk. You have no idea what kind of problem is about to flop out of your pink hole. <laughs> so if you roll shitty dice at that craps game, society should not be responsible for covering your gambling losses. <laughs> Pay your marker, motherfucker. Or the mob's gonna take your thumbs. You can't just do that. We all just... We all show up on this planet in the same state of confusion and terror. It's like if we all left this building right now, just disappeared and reappeared on another alien planet, no memory of ever being here or being a thing, just all of a sudden you exist. What the fuck? You get a couple of basic instincts. I'm hungry, throw food down this hole, and I'm cold. So wrap me up in something. But other than that, well, what the fuck is going on? Anyone? And there's other people who showed up just as fucked up and confused as you are, but they've been there longer. So they could give you a few hot tips. Uh, yeah, if it stinks, don't step in it. And someone said, eat kale. And that's good for you. And don't get a LinkedIn profile because the spam is endless and you'll never use it. But... Other than that, I don't really have any answers for you. <laughs> and then some of you sadists take this to the next level where you say, let's pull that same practical joke on somebody else who doesn't exist. <laughs> Fuck me in the front potato. We'll watch it fall out all terrified and confused. And we'll laugh at it for as long as that joke stays fresh. And then we'll wait till his knees are strong enough to hold up his upper body weight. And we'll make him work around the house forever for nothing. <laughs> Sorry, black people. You do not corner that market on slavery. Every single one of us was born into indentured servitude. 18 years a slave. Make that Oscar winning motion picture. 18 years a slave. You had me. I used to be nothing. I didn't exist, and I never had a bad day. Then you create me. I come into this world, and next thing I know, I'm doing yard work and dishes. I got chores. And then do your homework. And when your homework's done, then you're grounded. Fuck you, cunt that had me without my consent. <laughs> I'm grounded. I'm 13 years old. You know what I could do? I could make a dude, too. <laughs> I know your law says 18, but nature said 13. I could crank out a dude just like you did that didn't exist, put him on your dime, and he's going to half my workload. <laughs> Subcontract that piece of shit out to break leaves. But I didn't do that because I'm not a dick. But if my parents were alive today, I would sue them into poverty just for having me against my will. Set legal precedent. They weren't bad people, but you made me out of nothing. Then you kicked me out when I was 18. Now I'm 48. I'm ugly. I'm drunk. I don't have a strong closer for this special. And you're conveniently dead before I can sue you. It's wrong. And I'm not even crazy or retarded. I'm just unamused with the outcome of their poorly thought through prank. <laughs> not funny, lady. Retarded is, I know, uh, 
unfashionable to use, but it's still in play down here. If you're visiting, go down uh, the, the neighboring town, Douglas, Arizona, where they take care of Camp Twos, still have their big vintage sign, Douglas Association for Retarded Citizens, 1963. It's beautiful. Any hipster would be proud to have that in their man cave. But the thing with the word retarded is retarded is not like other epithets. It was not a word of hatred. Retarded was the medical definition. It was actually a word born in sensitivity because they used to call them uh, before retarded was the word. The doctors would use imbecile or moron. <laughs> this is something a smart fuck at Harvard has labeled the euphemism treadmill. Moron and imbecile were the correct terms for a while. And what happened is we co-opted those words to call our friend when he does something incredibly stupid. <laughs> to the point where it became an insult. So out of sensitivity, they changed the word to retarded. And what happened... <laughs> was we co-opted that word to call our friend when he does something incredibly stupid. So you can keep changing the word, and if you make the new one stick, that's what I'm going to call my friend. Did you just put a metal plate in a microwave? What are you, developmentally disabled? You don't fucking put a metal plate in a microwave? Who doesn't know that? You can make it as difficult to pronounce and Latin-based and medical-rooted. And if you make it stick, that's the new word I'm going to call my friend when he trips over his own shoelaces. <laughs> ha ha! You just exhibited some of the atlantoaxial instability that is usually associated with the trisomy 21 genetic imbalance. <laughs> fucking loser. And you still have some blogger or a Susan Blackford in the back of the room going, that's not funny. Letter to the editor. My son was born with the trisomy 21 chromosomal imbalance. And if you ever had to raise a child in such a condition, you would show more sensitivity and not use that kind of word, you know, mocking to... This is where she's being thrown out by Chad Shank and my imagination. <laughs> You have to take care of your crazy people. That's the whole point of this. Yeah. And they, uh, they, they, they don't here. I don't know if... Uh, Bingo, my girlfriend, you know, is... Uh, she's mentally ill. Camp one, mostly. Shows signs of camp two here and again. But, yeah, she... Uh, Bipolar, schizoaffective is her diagnosis. Uh, do we have, and I'm not trying to open up the floor for open mic, but are there any, like, legitimately diagnosed, uh, medicated crazy here tonight? <laughs> Labeled? What's your label? Clinically depressed. Clinically depressed. Bipolar. Yeah. Bipolar. Canadian. Canadian, see? <laughs> That kind of proves my point. See, if I was asking if anyone, uh, uh, if I said uh, my girlfriend surviving cancer, has anyone else had cancer, you fucking disease, you wouldn't go, my wife's a cancer. <laughs> I'm saying that you can shit all over crazy people where retards are sacrosanct. They're both mentally ill. I think you just kind of proved my point. You can't even say, you, crazy people, you can call them whatever you want. Fucking lunatic, psycho, nut job, wacko. You drop a tard bomb in mixed company. Oh, you better pick up the check at that company luncheon. 
Thank you for making my point. Clinically depressed, you might just be correct. <laughs> Bipolar, welcome to town. I hope you're not here seeking treatment. Because uh, Arizona, Arizona's kind of notorious for not taking care of mentally ill people. Well, uh, Jared Loeffner. A few years ago, for people who are watching this, if it ever gets released... Jared Loeffner was one of our Camp One mentally disturbed people, and he thought the government was playing with his head, and he had all sorts of weird theories, and he had to take it out by going down to the Safeway in Tucson, and he killed, I think, seven people or nine people, and he shot our congresswoman, Gabrielle Gifford, shot her right in the fucking beam. Whop! <laughs> and uh, she, she survived, sort of. <laughs> She walks among us, but... No, this is the good part. Is one of our mentally disturbed people shot our congresswoman directly into camp two. She's straight up retarded now. She lived much to her husband's chagrin. She did manage to pull through... He's a, wait, if, if you don't know the story, it's a, it might be a little touchy for the locals, but her husband was an astronaut, and he, after she got shot mentally retarded, she's still in a rehabilitation facility when he had to take his last space mission, and you know he was hoping to get lost up there like George Clooney in Gravity. I just got to live. I can't fucking do Put me on the leakiest rocket with the worst maintenance record and shoot me the fuck out of here. <laughs> this is Major Tom to ground control. Is my wife still shot recharted? Is she still making those awkward personal appearances? Where she gives a speech, but no one knows what the fuck she just said. <laughs> this is only okay to laugh at if you need a reason for it to be okay. Is because at the time that Jared Loeffner, mentally disturbed, shot our congresswoman, mentally challenged, we ranked 49th in mental health care under her watch as a congresswoman. That's out of 50 for a lot of my fans. It's not very good. That's your job. That's not so much tragic as that's some instant karma's about to catch you right in the grape, Gabby. Poof! Ah. Should have chucked some of that retard money crazy's way. <laughs> Crazies don't have a big 1963 vintage sign out on the highway. If you want to drive by on your way out of town tomorrow, drive past where Bingo gets mental health care. is in a U-shaped strip mall on the outskirts of town on Highway 92. On this side of the U is the Second Amendment gun shop. In the middle of the U is the Beast Brewery. And on her end is Community Intervention Associates. With the acronym blown up on the door where you do not get to see a doctor. You see a registered nurse via Skype. A woman that I was actually in the room when she said to Bingo, next time you feel like cutting yourself, try doing something positive instead. Like get a new hairstyle or a manicure. It's fucking actual quote so if you have a mental health issue like a Jared Loeffner and you think oh you, you, you get the shortwave radio is playing in your head and the plastic bags are flowing around your brain like poltergeist and, and you want to do the bad bad thing and you're loading a clip and that last rational synapse is telling you Maybe you should seek some mental health care first. In order to get that health care, you would have to stroll past the gun shop, then past the bar, 
walk through a tinted glass door marked CIA for community intervention associates where you talk to a television set that's talking back to you. And you wonder why people die in hails of gunfire in America. It ain't ISIS. You know what I was thinking, Alex, if you can hear me, is I would love to hear uh, the secondhand review of this show from Sherry, the checker at Safeway in lane four, the town gossip, who just hears about it and then tells everyone else what she heard. And I heard it was like $50 and it sold out in six minutes. And all he talked about was retarded people beheading Gabby Giffords. And I... I would never pay that. I'm in a hurry, Sherry. If you go to Safeway, go, don't go to fucking aisle four, lane four. She just... She's the uh, she's the TMZ of Bisbee. I'm just trying to buy two fucking things, and she's gonna tell you all the gossip you don't care about, as though she was already talking when you got there. It's a cheese dick segue into a good TMZ joke. TMZ, it's fucking celebrity gossip shit. But now they're being cited as a legitimate news source. CNN will go, uh, and TMZ has just released. Like, that's a fucking, that's like saying breaking news from your gossipy Aunt Nancy. This just in. This fucking TMZ, the guy that runs it, they have a TV show as well. The guy that runs it, his name is Harvey Levin. He's this fake tanned, greasy, smarmy, He's the Fagin of celebrity gossip, where they don't even do any legwork. They just count on you, the public. Anytime you see a celebrity, just film him with your cell phone until he breaks and flips you off. And then we're going to run that footage. Uh, hey, Justin Timberlake, uh, where are you doing? Where are you going? Are you you're going to the gym? You're in front of the gym with a gym bag. Are you going to use a Stairmaster? What are you, Justin Timberlake? And finally, fuck you. This just in, hey, it looks like Justin Timberlake doesn't appreciate his fans. I'm a smarmy cunt. <laughs> if the Nazis only committed all of those atrocities because they had some prescience and they were trying to prevent Harvey Levin from one day existing on this planet... Even a lot of Jews would have to write off the Holocaust as collateral damage. And that, that's factual. It was, for the, it was for the greater good. Don't worry, I'll be apologizing for that joke tomorrow at noon at a press conference. It will be attended by absolutely no one. I just, I just one day wish I would have to do that or even be asked to do that. Every fucking week, there's some celebrity or comic or a athlete that has to apologize for a, you know, a caught on tape comment or insensitive joke, a drunk tweet. And they have a press conference and and it's always something that's way weaker than the shit I say every night as a segue. I say worse shit. No one ever asked me to apologize. I wouldn't, but I want to be asked one time. I way better shit than they do. I demand outrage, for God's sakes. What do I have to do? I could, fuck, I could have told that joke at the Simon Wiesenthal Museum of Tolerance. And people would go, what did he say? I wasn't listening. <laughs> I could, I could, I could finger fuck all the Duggar daughters as a closing bit to this set. If you don't know the Duggars, just imagine an American reality show of a Christian family with 18 children. And it turns out the older brother was fidgeting all the little tiny girls. You don't even have to know that. Imagine me as a closing bit with three tiny toe-headed blonde girls 
like a ventriloquist act, finger puppets. Shut <laughs> up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Still, when I could, I could play all the Duggar girls' little tiny vaginas like wine glasses on America's Got Talent. <laughs> Still wouldn't get any press. I could commit suicide hanging myself with a belt off a doorknob like Robin Williams. I wouldn't even make the local police beat on the back page of the Bisbee Observer. I don't know if that's a good thing. Maybe it's good. No one notices. No one from TMZ's following me around. I'm only famous within a hundred feet of my show on the night of the show for a half an hour before and after. And other than that. Uh, if you don't know this, uh, Robin Williams, I did a, a, an episode of the show Louie on FX or whatever it's on. Thank you for stealing that online as well. Uh, yeah, I played a, uh, a, a washed up, alcoholic, bag of shit, loser, suicidal comedian, which took months of training. I had a, different acting coaches. I had to find a guy that would fit the bill and do ride alongs with him to find out what makes him tick to really nail the character. But after it aired, Robin Williams uh, sent an email to Louie that he forwarded to me so I could read the compliment. Robin Williams wrote that the Doug Stanhope episode of Louie was the most powerful dialogue I have ever seen on the subject of suicide. Which you go, hey, that's a nice pat on the back. It made me think perhaps even the lowly rated Doug Stanhope might have influenced the great Robin Williams in the last days of his career. Maybe I am reaching people. I have a big head, but I can find small hooks on which to hang my hat. Same way I like to believe that I influenced uh, Michael Sam, the first openly gay NFL player to come out of the closet. If you saw my last special, I closed my last special with about a seven minute gratuitous graphic detailed depiction of interracial gay man rape on an NFL field during a live game. And right after that came out, First gay NFL player comes out of the closet. I like to believe that he wasn't even gay until he saw my special. And I made it sound so appealing that he jumped at the chance. Now we got a gay uh, baseball player, minor leaguer for the uh, Milwaukee Brewers organization. We had a gay basketball player, uh, Jason Campbell. I might have fucked up his name. And uh, it's all great. Every time an athlete comes out of the closet, if it's a, like a manly sport, if you're a skater, you'd have to come out as straight. But like, yeah, with a football player, and uh, it always boils down to this weird hypothetical locker room scenario that the sports center guys bring up. All right, I'm going to you level with me, Tony. How are you going to feel if you're in the locker room with an openly gay athlete? Tell me the truth. Are you going to feel okay with that when you're in the showers with a, a man who's openly gay? Is that going to be good? Can you maintain the teamwork? <laughs> <laughs> trying to profile for anyone with a job <laughs> yeah, does anyone have, what, do you, what do you have for a job just make something up if you don't property manager how would you feel honestly if at the end of the day you're fucking you know, kicking out deadbeats or whatever you do 
you get back to the office and you're griping about your, your and then you get into the showers with the other property managers <laughs> knowing that one of them is an open homosexual are you going to feel like you're being sexualized in the shower my point is what other occupation in the face of western civilized society do people shower together and that's not the first question if not the only question why are we showering together the fucking you're, you're, you're selling cars your first day and you have a you have a real knack for this nikki is that you, you, you get good instincts you hit the showers and we're gonna see you on monday you, sh showers and these are multi-millionaires. These are professional athletes with money spilling out of every orifice. You could not write, you have a private jet. You couldn't get a private shower. Your agent couldn't write that into your rider and your signing bonus. Do you take dumps together too? You had a bad game. The coach makes you line up in a trough. All right. I saw no teamwork out there. We have no defense. Everyone shit in a trough. You line up and shit in a trough and you wipe the guy to your left. Till I see more team building. All right. I'll wipe him, coach. But if he gets a boner, I'm going to kick the shit out of him. Playing on no team. Gay, gay porn stars. When gay porn stars get done a long day of gay porning around on the set, they shower alone. They're not animals. So I say this to you, professional athlete person. Try to raise your standards up to that of gay porn stars before you start worrying about someone's sexuality. I came out of the closet on my last special, if you saw it, and uh, you know what? I was not embraced by the gay community. It's almost like they thought I was lying. Like they thought I was making it up. But that's passe anyway. So now I'm going to tell you the real truth. All right. You're in my hometown. This is what yeah. a lot of people don't know. I'm transgendered. <laughs> Not just because it's the hip thing to be now. It's really what I am. And I've been hiding this from you for so long. And I feel so free now. I'm transgendered, which if you don't know, that means I, I identify as a woman. I was born into a man's body, but I, I was born a woman as far as I'm concerned. I just happened to be a slovenly pig skank woman that doesn't take care of herself. I'm a woman that let myself go, but I'm okay with that. I'm not some goddamn beauty queen. I don't shave body parts. I don't wear makeup. I couldn't. I, I, I laugh so hard, crying, laughing at a loud, ripping fart that it would make my mascara run all the way down my face because that's the kind of girl I am. I'm a, a, a daddy's girl. We're not all Caitlyn Jenner an individual. Caitlin is she's a, in a ball gown on the cover of Vanity Fair. Go girl, I'm just not that same. The only modeling I ever did is I did model my teeth for uh, warning labels on packages of Canadian cigarettes. I did that <laughs> and that was enough of the spotlight for me. I didn't need anything more. I'm the kind of girl that watches beheading videos and reviews them on Yelp. <laughs> If I destroy a bathroom, I'll try to trick you into it by saying there's a spider in the tub and then I'll jam the door shut. That, just a rustic tomboy kind of gal. And if you cannot accept me for the woman that I am, then you can suck my dick and juggle my balls because you're intolerant. 
What is it in you that makes you so uncomfortable around a strong woman like me? And no, I'm not getting the surgery. That's all your follow-up questions with your minds in the gutter. You gonna have the surgery, Doug? They... Because that's my chick name, too. Doug, I'm not very creative. <laughs> not getting the surgery because balls are hilarious. and I'm not going to lose that. Why would you? I have surgeries I actually need that doctors have implored me to get. Uh, two really strong hernias working. And hilarious balls aren't going to take precedent. You pull your balls out at last call and hang around the jukebox. You don't need jokes. You just wait for someone to notice, especially when you have really, really hangy ball. My balls have hangy hair on. I have long ball hair, crispy long ball hair, like a hipster's beard. And if you can hang those out, you don't even have to come up with new material. Why cut those off? I got to get back to the hernias. I got two strong hernias working right now. I got a ventral hernia. That's where your the abdominal muscles split apart. That's common in uh, alcoholics and pregnant women. So jury's still out on what caused this. The other one is the run-of-the-mill inguinal hernia, the groin hernia. And that one, uh, that's where your intestines are trying to spill through your ligaments. Uh, so where I, like, I learned to work around it. I haven't got surgery because I learned, like, if I have to sneeze, I do a high kick like a rocket to keep my guts from spilling out like a balloon animal. <laughs> so healthcare is completely overrated. If you knew, you just got to figure out how to work this shit. I'm working on uh, developing an eating disorder because my only, because with the hernias, I can't uh, do sit-ups or lift heavy objects, which is perfect. Who'd fix that? My only problem is uh, with, with the fat, you got to understand how much time and effort I put into these suits. You don't just buy this suit. This is years of hitting every Goodwill and Salvation Army across the road in every town we play, and you find the coat one year. And one day I'll find pants that match it, and then a tie. And you go, you get one pant size, my whole closet is done. Years of effort. And on a side note, can we start putting sizes in obituaries? Can that be a tradition? That would make thrift store shopping so much easier. If I could just read the local obits. He was a Korean War veteran. He worked with the unions. He liked to disco dance in the 70s at the Studio 52. And he was a 40 regular size 32 pants. And then I'd know exactly what neighborhood to hit the thrift store. It would... <laughs> I figured out if I get, if I could just get an eating disorder, I could do an eating disorder because I don't have the horrible psychology that goes with an eating disorder. I could vomit socially. Just, I don't want to be like some, I don't have a bad body self image. You have that about me. That's not, I don't care. I just don't want to lose my pants. I'm not some teenager who's going to just start puking and then it's going to catch on until I rot my teeth down to little black nubs and I'm emaciated. I just want to puke enough to get the outer layer of smoking stains off. I want to vomit my way into teeth whitening while maintaining a 32 waist. And I think I could pull that off socially. The, 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 the problem with... Uh, People with eating disorders, and I say people because it's not just ladies, it's also jockeys. People <laughs> who have eating disorders, there's an inherent rudeness to an eating disorder that's not intended, it's just part and parcel of the disorder. That's because the reason that a person can vomit their way down to you know, Karen Carpenter, Auschwitz emaciated because they still think they're fat no matter how thin they get they still see themselves as fat so if you can puke your way down to 78 pounds of bile breath and organ failure and you still think you're obese what are you thinking when you look at me 
I know what you're thinking. It's fucking rude, lady. <laughs> Stop it. I'm a little bloated, alcoholic, doughy, but I'm not some fucking Ralphie Mae circus act freak show guy up here. It's rude how you see me. Rude. It's like kids with cancer. Fuck you, little kid with cancer. You're rude, too. Little kids here dying of cancer, and everyone goes out and they have these foundations like locks of love where people shave their heads for the little kids with cancer. Oh, we're going to make wigs for the little kid with cancer. That should be such an affront to any bald or balding man in this room where some child is dying of leukemia and you as a parent, your biggest concern, oh yeah, he's going to croak any day, but God forbid he dies looking like you. Not my baby. Get him a wig. Doll him up for the grave. It's fucking hair. Who gives a shit? This is not a medical condition. This isn't painful. It's fucking hair. This kid's six years old. He's not trying to get pussy. What's fucking wrong with you? God forbid my child dies without having learned our grotesque obsession with personal appearance and vanity. I'm not just fucking with you. I got, I got a situation going on right there. It's not bald. You've committed. This is a, this is a little something there. I can pull on it. If you put a cigarette lighter to that, you'd get a small foof. It's a little sad. This is a running argument with my girlfriend where she'll go, you should put some sunblock on your bald spot. You're getting red. Like, it's, not a, it's not a bald spot. There's technically hair on there. It's not, and I took this to an extreme where one night shit-faced, which I don't have to, you'll know by the story. I shaved my entire head, razor shaved to the bone, everything except for this spot right here. And I came out of the bathroom so proud of myself. Go, where's my bald spot now, Bingo? Point to it. Point to the part of my head that you just referred to as my bald spot. Is it here? What's this? Oh, is that my hairy spot now? Say it. Say it out loud, Bingo. Yes, that's your hairy spot, Doug Stanhope. And I'm always wrong and you're always right. And then I, then I had to walk around with that haircut for a week till I rubbed it in a, enough while all my friends are going, what the fuck did you do to your head? What is that? Did you lose a bet? No, I won a bet. Technically, I won a bet right there. And then I thought, wouldn't it be magnanimous of me to donate my hairy spot to some little kid dying of cancer? Let's go down to that locks of love supermarket parking lot. Everyone's shaving their head fest find the kid that showed up late <laughs> don't worry little buddy i got you covered right here i'm gonna give you this yeah right out here in front of everyone you want to you want to look like that you want to look like some elderly jew who's still wearing the same lucky yarmulke for the last 70 years now it's all threadbare and wispy because i'm gonna give that to you you want to wear that pompadour of shame into your little tiny grave i'm willing but no kid with cancer would ever want my hairy spot it's, it's not good enough for them because they're rude go sit with your puker friend in the back kid with cancer you're both rude i know you're having a bad day but you don't take it out on people who are trying to give back to the community it's the only part of my body I could donate that isn't toxic at this point. A little fucking chemo wisp. Good. The fucking show went downhill so badly without you. <laughs> Everything started to suck. No, thanks. I'm fucking Guinness. Grotesque. <laughs> fucking 
do a shot and eat a loaf of bread. There's, I'm getting a Jägermeister tattooed across my toes. So that when I lose my toes to the diabetes that I assume if I don't have it, I'm going to get it from 20 years of drinking that swill and they have to lop my toes off from diabetic neuropathy, I can then hang those toes around my neck on a fishing line. A little shrunken head charm bracelet of little tiny Jaeger toes to remind me of all the good times I can't remember from drinking Jaegermeister. Like a Vietnam vet coming out of the jungle with... VC ears strung around his neck to remind him of his time in the shit. I will have little tiny shrunken head Jaeger toes of my own. And I will have to clobber the first person that t points out the typo. Because I know there's at least one bean counter in here right now doing the math. And no, I don't have 12 toes to fit all... Jägermeister, I'll have to eliminate some unnecessary I before E bullshit, but you'll get the message. You know what gives me the creeps about the uh, Vietnam vets? They have a, a this obsession with wearing the hat. They have to let you know they're a Vietnam vet. They all wear the baseball hat with the gold leaves and the platoon and the year. Dang Wang, 68 to 70, Vietnam vet. What the fuck would you wear that hat? Uh, did you forget how brutally fucked over by your own government you got on that deal? And you wear a hat celebrating it? Nixon, in his own words in the Nixon tapes, talks openly and casually about delaying the withdrawal of troops just so he can win re-election. Fuck them if thousands more die. I need this gig again. And then you're wearing a hat. They fucked you over and then sold you merch after the gig. How bad... Do you need someone to buy you a Pabst Blue Ribbon down at the VFW? That's like a rape victim walking around in a pink trucker cap that says, Molested, stepbrother, 82 to 86. Hey, girls, where's all the fun at? And if you've suffered any kind of trauma like that, or war or rape or whatever it is, I, I'm glad you're here so we, we can annex some of those problems and goof on them. If, you ever, if you're a victim of any kind of traumatic event like that and you ever find yourself being the person who says publicly, and I still have nightmares, just remember... So does everybody else. At least now yours makes sense. Everybody else has nightmares and they don't make sense. I have nightmares of riding on the back of a carp through a swamp like a camel. And then we fly up into the air and get sucked into a jet engine. And now I'm in a middle seat in the back that doesn't recline. And everybody hates me and I'm having to watch... Paul Blart Mall Cop 2 and I'm starring in it and everyone's booing me that doesn't make any sense you wake up shaking from the war at least you, 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 there's some connection to reality I don't wake up shaking and have my girlfriend holding me going it's okay honey you needed the money for Paul Blart Mall Cop <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I prefer nightmares to dreams. Dreams suck. Yeah, I, I just, I just won seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on a scratch ticket, and I'm rich, and I miss my plane. But Air Force One is here, and the president is a huge fan, and he has all of my DVDs, and I'm 
huge and famous. And then I wake up and I'm in some fucking travel lodge in Big Timber, Montana. I slept in my suit and I sweat through it. I have a nine hour drive to Pocatello to another gig, a 40 seater that I can't sell out with the Patel Motel Mafia hammering at my hotel door because it's past checkout. That's the reality. I'd rather ride the carp. I was really trying to have a whole positive spin on this entire special, and I feel like I failed again in my career. I was trying to be uplifting somehow with all this shit, and it doesn't feel like it's working. <laughs> Problem is, when, when you spend 25 years just pointing out everything that's wrong in life and wrong with the world, you have a tendency to come off as a negative person. <laughs> but, but I'm not. It's not, it's true, but it's not negative. The truth is that human beings as a species have almost always been wrong about almost every single thing that we ever thought was right for the entirety of recorded human history wrong wrong oops fail missed again get you next time wrong ah, earth is flat Burning witches, slavery, reefer madness. They thought Liberace was straight and Bruce Jenner was a man. Wrong. So that, that should be inspiring. Occasionally, here and again, someone's right about something and they have a genius idea and they're right. And maybe you have a genius idea. So don't be afraid to put it out there. Don't be afraid to be wrong because that's what we do. <laughs> ah, you fucking stupid. You thought that was going to work? You're wrong. Well, that's what we always have been. But maybe you're right. I know no one in my audience is curing Ebola or anything. <laughs> but maybe you have a genius idea that works on a, a lower level, but changes the social structure a little bit to make life a little bit better. Put it out there. If you think you're brilliant, try. And if you fail, fuck. Yes. There's a... Yes. In 1960, the New York Giants hired a kicker from Hungary. This is back, if you watch old black and white NFL footage, they used to kick field goals. It's just very stiff. Dun, dun, dun. Like a fucking kid with rickets and leg braces. Dun, 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 dun. And that was the norm. And then they f finally hired a soccer player from Hungary. And he came over and he sees the, all these people. It had to be a lot of pressure. You sail on a boat all the way from Hungary to be a kicker and everyone else is kicking like a dildo. I, I, I don't want to have to learn how to kick like a dildo. So finally he says, fuck him, I'm going to kick like I kick. And he's the first guy to kick like they kick field goals now. Soccer style. He didn't know he was a genius. He just said, I don't want to look like an asshole. <laughs> So I'm going to muster up the courage to kick like I kick, despite the peer pressure. And fuck them, it's 1960. They don't pay shit yet. And he revolutionized special teams in the NFL just by being brave, a little tiny thing. So whatever it is, if you think you have a brilliant idea, don't be afraid to be wrong. Put it, kick like you kick, and fuck them if they don't like it. When I was... When I was a young man growing up, uh, jerking off in the shower, I, I would notice that as soon as my load hits standing water, it would all coagulate into this angry swarm of gummy bear boner sap that had some sonar, on, like it was trying to attach itself to my toe hairs. It's like chasing you. And you... You don't want to have to get down on all fours and wipe all that up with a hand cloth. 
So at an early age, I realized if I just got my shoulder into the shower stream, I could manipulate every little bead of gummy bear jizma like a super soaker effect running off your arm and guide each one into a drain hole. And I didn't know, is this a genius idea? Does everybody know this? Should I run down the street in my towel yelling to all my friends? I don't know, because I didn't grow up in a household jerking off with 12 other guys. I did not grow up in an NFL type of environment. <laughs> Perhaps if I did grow up like that and everyone all jerked off in the shower at the same time, we go, oh, gee, wow, we really chowder house to drain on this one, gentlemen. Who's going to clean this up? Get Stanhope. He's a rookie. And I come through like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer on a foggy Christmas Eve. And I go, stand back, guys. Look what I discovered. ba 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 They would have carried me out of that shower on their shoulders as a conquering hero. To this day, it would still be known as Stan hoping the drain. And I would have left a mark on this world. Bisbee, you're a beautiful people, and I gotta get the fuck out of here. We'll be, we'll be drinking soon enough. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Doug Stanhope. Thanks. Thanks very much. For public release, <laughs> on Saturday night, May 25th, while performing in Las Vegas, I made comments and performed material that I now understand to be <laughs> utterly deplorable and indefensible. It is now a source of great shame and embarrassment and I want to offer my heartfelt apologies. I'm gutted by my own carelessness and beg you to know, deliver earnestly, this is not who I am. I intend to take the time in the future for great soul searching and hope to come back a more sensitive and insightful human being. I only wish there was some way I could go back in time and erase this whole ugly affair. I like to get ahead of problems. I decide I'm going to do this whole uh, show backwards, kind of, where I'm going to open with what I was going to use as my closer, but my closer I really like, and it's about dead kids, and that makes me happy, and it sets a tone for the entire show. So I go, yeah, let's, let's do it that way. Perks me up in the beginning. And I'll tell you, there used to be in any given recording or special or whatever the fuck you call them, a large portion, not a large, but a certain percentage of my material was based on 
cable news, shit I watched on CNN or whatever cable news, and I don't have that anymore because since the election, there's only one fucking subject on cable news anymore, and it's just that one boring fucking story that I don't care about, I have nothing to add to, I never even say his name on stage, just ignore it. It's your fucking problem. You deserve that fucking guy because you're the generation that made this happen. You are responsible for making all these talentless blowhards famous just for being fucking assholes. And now you got one that you call your leader. So fuck you. None of my business. I'll be dead soon. But where it became a deficit to me, I remember right before the election, there was a story about a family at Disney World that was enjoying a vacation and they were having a nice picnic at the end of the day on a fake beach at a fake lake at Disney World with probably a fake sunset too. And the little toddler boy of the family wandered out into the drink just a little bit and a real alligator sprung out and ate the boy which the dad probably thought was fake too after a whole day at Disneyland he, oh, there's no surprises for me anymore, a real alligator oh fuck, that's my boy, it's a real alligator so the dad he grabbed the boy by the wrists but by now the alligator has the boy up past the feet, past the waist, and as they say in the business, possession is nine-tenths of the law. <laughs> and that has to be a very emasculating, devastating experience where you have to concede defeat in a tug-of-war with an alligator when your boy is the rope. Like, ah, I can't... Ah, fuck! Oh, but you try it, honey. It's a goddamn alligator. The fuck am I supposed to? This whole vacation was your idea. I'm not responsible for. I tried my best, and it was like weeks after that story. I remember watching that at two in the morning, and then the election happens, and then then that's all they talk about. All the cable news. Oh, did you see what he tweeted this week? That contradicts what he tweeted last week. Let's have a panel of eight eggheads all sit out here and discuss this for an entire hour. Should he apologize? What's your opinion, Brian? Well, you know my opinion because of the network we're on. We all have the same fucking opinion. How many kids being eaten by alligator stories am I missing because of this fucking onion head in office I have a business to run people so now I just get all my news off the internet so I can read the headline, make sure it's not about that guy. I don't know if I fixate on dead kid stories because of that alligator thing, or if maybe I just have a weird, dark interest in dead kid stories. But every, I click on all the dead kid stories because they're always interesting. They're always tragic, necessarily. I've never read a dead kid's story where at the end I felt justice. <laughs> I, you had it coming, you prick. <laughs> How many times did your dad warn you not to talk on the cell phone in the tub while it's charging? <laughs> no, they're all tragic. But one of the patterns I've noticed is almost every dead kid's story ends with, and the family has set up a GoFundMe page. If, for what? I don't know anything about what it's like to lose a child, but if there's one thing I do know, if nothing else, you're making money. 
a lot of money. Shit loads of money. The littler the kid, the more money you're making. Because now all, all that money you no longer have to spend on the, the big boy pee pants and the, the Lunchables and the juice boxes, that's your petty cash coming right back into your pockets. All the Pop Warner gear and the Air Jordans and the tuba lessons. That's your fucking money is racing back into your fat khaki pockets. The orthodontist, the antique that came straight out at you. No longer your concern. That's your bank. It's like you're in one of those phone booths on a game show where cash blows all around and you get to snatch as much out of the air as you possibly can and you're gonna start a GoFundMe page on top of that? You greedy cocksucker playing on the sympathies of your friends and neighbors. You robber baron, you road agent, you, you have a little kid that dies, you start a go fund someone else page and pay it forward. Share the wealth. You have a friend that has a little kid that dies. Jack him up for a loan. That's the day, day one, before everyone else gets to him. Sorry, as awkward as this seems, Kevin, I heard you won a lottery of sorts. And uh, I don't know if you heard about the predicament I'm in. I'm in a bit of a pickle. Uh, my kids are, uh, they're still alive. So it's tough times at the Jenkins household. Hate to show up with my hand out. The fuck do you need a GoFundMe for a dead kid? The only time I've seen it in a story is where it says to help pay for funeral costs, which is another scam altogether. A funeral? You just fucking... It's dead. It doesn't care. Dead things don't give a fuck about all your goings on. And you're going to get a headstone and a coffin for what? You're going to... You're gonna buy a cemetery plot for a dead kid? You're gonna buy real estate for a dead thing while you're still renting? Does that make any sense at all? See, a little more energy this time, huh? You have something that you loved that's now dead. That vessel is still sitting there. You donate it to science. It's what you do. You fucking spend money on some nonsense that dead things don't care about you. No, you. My parents both died and we donated both of their bodies to science because you can't chuck it in a dumpster. It's illegal for some reason. You donate it to science, and what happens then is you actually help the world. You donate it to science, they show up, they pick up your dead thing, they sh ship it off free of charge to a medical university where some hungover 19-year-olds are going to gut open your Aunt Betty and start flipping around her internal organs like it's a Benny Hanna and... <laughs> chase each other around with your mom's pancreas. Ah, quit it! Ah, quit it! I'm gonna hurl! Still drunk! Get it out! But maybe one of those kids is actually paying attention and somehow your donated dead thing will... He, he finds a cure for something, for some disease or malady that actually helps society from your donation rather than you just being some weird corpse hoarder and then you did a good thing for the world that kid's asian by the way 
I know they say that there's no heartache worse than having to bury your own child, and I have to give that to you. I wouldn't know. I've never been in that position and uh, never put myself at that kind of disadvantage by having one. <laughs> but if that is true, that that's the worst heartache, that proves my point that there's a huge difference between a child and a fetus. Because I never had to bury my own child, but... <laughs> did uh, have to pony up for an abortion when it was my turn to grab the check. <laughs> and heartache with an abortion? <sighs> I could have watched live footage of that abortion on closed circuit TV while eating spaghetti and still gotten distracted and started checking my tweets. The only heartache you'll ever feel with an abortion is if you chug the champagne too quickly afterwards. <laughs> And if you started a GoFundMe page for an abortion, I would kick in a few dollars and retweet that to my Twitter followers, because that is an effort worth investing in for the planet. <laughs> Had to get that out. That bit, it's important, it's dead kids season, Memorial Day weekend kicks off dead kid season you're gonna get back from vegas the sun's coming out whatever shithole you live in and you're gonna peel the tarp off of that above ground pool you're gonna start pouring the sangrias a little too heavy and a little too long and I didn't think I was that drunk, but you stopped watching the gate, and then all of a sudden, little Kelsey is now bobbing around a little blue bobber that afternoon, <laughs> right beside the pool noodles, and gonna fire up the jet ski and zip Sarah around the lake, and you didn't think you were that drunk, and now she's all wrapped up in the propeller. Maybe that Asian student that was paying attention could figure out Nerf propellers if you donate her to science. I don't know where you guys are from, and I don't give a fuck, but wh wherever you're going back to, I'm sure I'm booked there eventually. Whatever horrible... It's so weird to, to be filming this at the plaza because I have been coming here... At, by choice since before I even did comedy. This is my, this is my place. This is my old school Vegas place. And fucking Oscars Steakhouse and even the worst parts of it. I have to go, I... That's the reason I come here. It's vintage fucking Vegas. I don't get to normally play any place that I want to be or you want to be at the same time. I usually have to play where you live and you're stuck, and then I'm stuck there with you, playing in some fucking mall, in a, some hideous city. I just, I, I had to, I ate at an Outback Steakhouse last week, in a fucking mall. And there was people there, like, are you a comic too? Because unless you're stuck and that's the only thing walking distance, why would you be in here? Uh, Outback Steakhouse couldn't be less authentic if Jim Jeffries was your waiter. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. <laughs> I had to do it.
But that's what I do for a living. I come visit you in fucking horrible places, and then I'm stuck there for at least a day, usually at a, an airport hotel, some mid-range, like 2.5-star, beige brownish salmon-colored in. It's always an in, like a day's in, or a comfort in, or a quality in, and they're all in a fucking row, and... You walk in and it's full of mid-range 2.5 star folks doing dumb shit. Oh, it's a dance mom's competition this weekend. And there's a bunch of kids in ballerina outfits and fucking... I'm using my roller bag as a cane coming in shit-faced and there's kids pressing every button on the elevator because their parents can't afford six flags so this is a thrill ride for the kid to go up and down and you go don't hit the kid don't hit the kid it's not your kid if, if you had your own kid you could beat your kid in effigy of that kid but it's not your kid so don't hit the kid talk to the businessman with the fucking lanyard there's an old Conventioneer business fuck. You look like Mitch McConnell and you have really bad small talk, but a very large lanyard. They wear big lanyards around there. Now. Northeast Arkansas Assembly of Special Needs Educators. Yeah. Well, you need a fucking backstage pass that size to get into that 8 30 a.m. TED talk. Are you kidding? I stole a croissant off your table in front of that fucking banquet room and I didn't need a pass, I just stole the fucking thing. I think you're so important. You wake up in the morning and you're fighting old people for some humid lobby waffle in the morning before they shut it down. And then I go to the show after a day of reading tweets from you fucking animals. Pre-gaming for the Doug Stanhope show tonight in Des Moines. And it's a picture of you drinking wild turkey at 10 in the morning. Oh, you're going to be a treasure to deal with at fucking 9.30 at night. And then it's just a fist fight. Shut the fuck up yelling at you. And I get back to my beige brown salmon colored hotel. And the final insult is you get to your room and your key card... Fuck, you motherfucker, red light, red light, red light, you fuck, red, 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 green light, oh, no, god damn it, and, and then I stomp back like a giant baby down to the front desk, you motherfuckers, and I just explode all of this shit all over some night auditor, my key card doesn't work again, big fucking screaming baby. I'm sorry, sir, did, did you have it near your cell phone or your credit card at any point? Probably! Yeah, everyone's got cell phones and credit cards everywhere. And what do you mean by near my cell phone or credit card? If it's here, is that near that? And what's the radius? And you know what? My cell phone and my credit cards still work. So what the fuck is wrong with your key card? Sir, if you just calm down, I'm, I'm trying to help you. What's your name and your room number? Stanhope, 217. Clack, 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 clack. Sir, I'm sorry. There's no one by that name in this hotel. Look at the key card, you motherfucking Hampton Inn. It's next door. You all look the same. Fuck you. I am not apologizing. You all look the goddamn same. I prefer a one-star hotel. I really do. I'm more comfortable. A one-star motel. The old-school motor lodge. You know, the, like, Route 66 shit, the U-shaped, one-story... You just bag has got a, a pool in the middle of the driveway that's no longer a pool, it's full of cement and some old police tape around it. And you just back your van this close to the motel room door and you just hurl your shit inside. You don't have to interact with people, just leave me the fuck alone. 
I look for my lodging based on the one star review. Because a one star review will tell you things that you're secretly looking for that the proprietor could not openly promote. One star. I didn't get a wink sleep in this place because it's attached to a dive bar that's open until four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Complete purchase now. <laughs> this is no place for children. No place is a place for children, except maybe a, you know, a cat carrier in a storage unit. That would be fine. I think they were running prostitutes out of the room next door. One star, the entire place reeked of stale cigarette smoke. Oddly, that's my cologne. I wear it daily. And if it already stinks like that, I don't have to worry about that bullshit $250 cleaning fee if you smoke in the room, initial here. Oh, don't worry, lady, I will be smoking in that room. But I'll, I'll, it'll be fine, because when I get home from that fucking ugly show. I'm going to put a wet towel under the door. I'm going to chain smoke cigarettes while I ignore missed calls from friends I don't keep in touch with anymore and fucking regret my life. And uh, in the morning, I'm going to check out a bit early. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stuff a, a, a giant rotted catfish into your microwave unit. And I'm going to set that for about 45 minutes. I'm going to shuffle off to breakfast. And while that beast of burden slowly explodes and blisters and bleeds and burns onto the walls of that microwave unit, I'll be dining comfortably in the knowledge that you're never going to be able to smell cigarettes in that room again. You'll, we'll all be just fine. And before you ask, well, where do you get a giant, dead-rotted catfish every night on the road? It's in my rider. I don't ask for a lot. I'll eat the green M&Ms. I just want some plastic jug vodka, some muddy bears, and a giant, rotted, dead catfish and or carp. Because I'm not picky. I'm not a brand whore. <laughs> Except for the Muddy Bears. Gay Cousin Eric came on the road with us once. And, uh, hey, get, Gay Cousin Eric, you get a fan out there somewhere. He was turning 21, and he thought it would be exciting to do a tour for a week on the road with us. Because he had some, I don't know what you even imagine the road is like, but it's not that. Like, if you have, like, high... No. But Gay Cousin Eric is 21, and he thought it's all going to be, like, you know, strippers and after parties and fucking penthouse suites and plates of blow in the green room. And Eric, we don't even have a green room half the time when we're playing the middle of this pig country. A lot of times we're just sitting in the van at the fire exit in the back alley of some fucking gin joint roadhouse place. Staring at our shoes. That's what we do on the road. We stare at our fucking shoes, yell at people, get back in the van. After about three days of dead silence, no one talks in the van. You wake up, you get in, stare at your shoes. Greg Chaley will put on a podcast of a comedian that you hate so you can silently judge him as you sweat out alcoholic remorse. And gay cousin Eric's all happy. Oh, we're going to Chicago. Can we go to Wrigley Field? Do you think that we could uh, go to the Blues Hall of Fame? And I go, no, we don't, we don't do things. <laughs> and I remember that Chicago gig, we were staying on the outer loop of Chicago in one of these jalopy motels. And it's like 5.30 at night, still no one's talking. We're eating some gas station pizza, 
nothing. We're not hungry. It's just that that hour you have to throw some kind of wet, doughy substance down your neck just to slow up the flow of the alcohol that's about to be dumped your way at showtime as a prophylactic measure. This is, it's, it's the same way you would sandbag before a flood. It's, it's not aesthetics, it's for safety. So we're jamming pizza in our head quietly and gay cousin Eric it was one of those moments where I just saw the exact moment where all his hopes and ambitions for this fun on this tour just dropped out of his face. Like his face fell. You know when like you do hallucinogens with a, a buddy and you can have an entire dialogue with just one glance, just one look on your face? You've spoken volumes. You just like... And you know every single thing that you're... But this was the opposite with Eric because it was a negative where I just saw him look up at me like... I don't, it's just, it was that subtle, but I know what he meant. And uh, it's not going to get better, Eric. Keep in mind, Eric, gay cousin Eric was not my cousin. He, he's, at that time, he was my brother's, my brother's then wife's now ex-wife, but her, her nephew, not even close to related. He's not even really gay. We, we called him Gay Cousin Eric to hide the fact that he was Jewish. That was the running joke. So I'm not really invested in how much of a good time Eric is or is not having but at that moment, he had pizza sauce on his face, and he just reached down and grabbed a hand towel off the carpet. And my reflexes were not quick enough to stop this from happening. So in slow motion, I'm going, oh, oh no! You, you never use the face cloth that's underneath the laptop in a comedian's motel room. Oh. Oh. oh, you're gay now, Cousin Eric. Oh, you are so gay now. I bet there's a one-star review about that motel from Gay Cousin Eric now. The linens were really crusty. <laughs> Exfoliating, but... Ugh. I would guess at this point, probably three quarters of the email I get are survey s spam, basically. Like everything you buy, every fucking service you get, somehow they have my email address and they want to know, hey, how about some feedback? You got your oil changed to give us some feedback. The, the cable guy came to your house and how was your experience in fucking every Amazon purchase you make, right? To take a few minutes and write a review. Why well, buy way too much shit from Amazon to write, take a few minutes every fucking purchase. Like cocktail straws, here, these. Plastic cocktail straws because they're disappearing so I'm stockpiling them, they're replacing them. <laughs> With fucking bamboo paper shit. No, I'm not putting, I'm not gonna disrespect a cocktail with some fucking paper straw that's just gonna flatten out. So I buy these, like $1.99 for a thousand from China with no shipping charge. I don't know how that's humanly possible to send me a thousand, but then you get repeated. Fucking Amazon spam. Hey, tell us about your purchase. Share with our customers your review of fucking plastic cocktail straws. Really? How could I really make that interesting? I'm, I'm going to take it. And when you don't, they go, you must have forgot. <laughs> I didn't forget. I said, fuck you, no. I'm not, a, I'm not a cocktail straw reviewer. How desperate is everybody for some review pat on the back star? It's like if you were getting your dick sucked. 
I'm getting my cock sucked, and every stroke, they stop. I go, oh, is that okay? Is that all right? Oh. If there's anything you want me to do different, tell me. I'm open to suggestions. Would you recommend it to a friend? On a scale from one to five, five being the best, very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, dissatisfied. And I'm just laying back there going, sir, if I didn't like it, I would have shown you to the door. Just fucking man up and finish the job. If I have some beef with a big corporation, I'm not going to waste that grievance in an email. I am going to call the 800 number old school because I want the human connection where I can hear the tears on the other end of the phone when I bellow at them because I wake up hating myself and want to blame the rest of the world. And I use that as an outlet. And I don't target Indian call centers. It's just they're the ones invariably who answer the phone anymore. When you're angry at a corporation and you want to give them shit, they transfer all the shit calls to some poor fucking India. And I don't want to rain on their already dreary parade. But even when I try not to, they fuck it up just in the greeting when she says, thank you for calling DirecTV. My name is Madison. How may I help you? They go, no, it's not. Your name's not Madison. Nobody in Mumbai, India is named Madison. I haven't even opened my mouth and you've already lied to me on the phone. Tell me your real fucking name. I am a long-term goddamn customer. I have 19 direct TV boxes so I can get every game at my house because I have to buy my friends and I deserve more respect than for you to open a phone call lying to my fucking face. Tell me your real goddamn name. Just on the... I don't even remember the reason I called to begin with. Now it's just give me your fucking real name on principle. And I just, and when the anger tactic doesn't get the results I'm looking for, then I come in soft, good cop, bad cop. Hey, Maddie, listen, I know the game. I understand the racket. You live in a poor country, it's hard to feed your family. Yeah, you had to take this shit job at a call center to make ends meet. Your own name is unpronounceable in the English language. They made you pick a stripper name out of a training manual. I get it. You picked Madison. There's nothing wrong with that. But Maddie, I'm not a customer right now. Right now, I'm your friend. We're two human beings sharing one honest moment on a telephone line. So be my friend and be honest with me. What's your real name? <laughs> my, my name is Madison. You're a fucking lying pig. How fucking dare you? I know where you live. I'm a goddamn American. I'll have your village bombed. Send in the drones. The call invariably ends with, I hope you get gang raped. <laughs> no, because I want her to know that I have some insight into her culture. <laughs> Because that's how they do in the India. That's a thing. It's what they have to deal with. Gang, Indian men gang rape. It's sad and it's savage. And Because Indian men are not strong enough to rape by themselves. It's, it's physiology or sociology. It's... 
It's fucking science. You get your GED and come debate me, but it's, it's true. Indian men don't have the upper body strength to pin and submit. Did you ever see an Indian dude in the UFC? No, you never will. Unless he's a ring girl. That's why they created their god, Vishnu, with so many arms to represent what it would take for even their god to be able to take a lady down alone. I don't, don't take this the wrong way. I'm saying Indian men are basically the women of men in that they, like if there were no women, Indian men would be the ones that you'd want to make the love at. Be Hopefully. Like on a good day. Yeah, sometimes you're going to get drunk and slum it with a hipster, but you're going to be imagining him as an Indian man underneath you because... Because Indian men are the most beautiful, polite, accommodating, docile, supple of men. They have that sick, s s silky, thick, black hair, just dense everywhere. Their whole head, their whole one eyebrow, their back, soles of their feet, legend has it hair as thick as their head like a slipper on the bottom of their feet <laughs> skating on sunshine Indian men are the most attractive of men not to women hence the rape problem if they're gang raping but but I am a I'm a dreamer I'm an idealist I I like to believe in a world where everyone lives on a level playing field, where everybody's equal, where an Indian man could at least believe in himself enough and have the courage to at least try to rape solo. <laughs> he, he couldn't do it. Like, I'm panic. Indian guy tried to rape you all by himself in a dark parking lot. <laughs> you would just laugh like you're laughing now and put your hand on his forehead like when your four-year-old nephew tries to swing punches at you and you just hold him out of arm's reach till he tuckers himself out. He gets all tired and then you laugh and you go back to Easter dinner and everyone has a fine time. But at least that guy had enough self-esteem to make the attempt. A community lifted him up enough to have this self-confidence to try. Because nobody ever wants to die thinking, what if? <laughs> at least he put it out there. And I'll be honest, I don't know if this bit has a point. <laughs> but if there is a point, it's this. Is it wrong to use racism to try to stop gang rape? <laughs> and that's a question for you to answer individually. Don't shoot the messenger. I put that on you, and you have to make the decision which is right and which is wrong, and either answer you come up with, you're a fucking asshole. <laughs> you're either a, a vulgar racist or you're a gang rape apologist. <laughs> either way, you sicken me. can't believe I perform for you people.
Hey, this got full. <laughs> On the night of Saturday, May 25th, I made wildly inappropriate stereotypes regarding Indian men that I thought were said in confidence. I hadn't noticed the cameras, the microphone, and the giant shrieking audience. Yet still, this does not excuse me promoting such a myopic denigration of a country wonderfully rich in heritage and humanity. I hope this apology will usher in a new era of understanding and open a dialogue that allows all of us to grow. And rape jokes are never funny. You cannot make jokes about rape because at least in rape culture, rape jokes are never funny. That's the thing. If you're a new comic in here and you're dealing with all that fucking bullshit, just, just ride it out. It's always going to be something. I've been doing this since 1990, and there's always a topic that everyone decides now you can't. When I started in Vegas in 1990 at the dive bar, thank you. Yeah, that, back then, in 1990, when I started open mics, it was AIDS jokes. Oh, my God. If you ever mentioned AIDS on stage, no, there's no funny thing. It's just awful, and how dare you? You're contemptible. And then a decade later, 9-11 jokes. You cannot mention 9-11 unless you're doing some bogus, uh, let's take a moment and a pause for the first responders because it's a difficult time we're going through. Yeah, it was that then. Look at those two subjects now. Fucking hilarious. <laughs> Write it out. If you bundled all three of those topics and you had a, the premise of like a rogue aides on airplanes flying into the Twin Towers without their consent. Like, just the premise gets a laugh not, without even a punchline. Let it go. It's always going to be something and someone's going to always be fucking upset. And uh, I feel, honestly, I feel like I lost a lot of street cred with my people for not being outed in the whole Me Too movement. I, <laughs> I think a lot of people were expecting that and let down when it never happened. And I, it's not like I don't have my stories. I, I'm, yeah, I Me Tooed it up. Yeah. That was me first. I tried to start that hashtag when I was doing it about me. Me first. For the record, I was never in the, uh, you know, the, the rape happy deep end of that ugly part of the Me Too swimming pool with Harvey Weinstein. But in the shallow end, in the kiddie pool part, the, pull your dick out in front of people? How many people haven't seen my dick at this point? I, Half my career, that would be a go-to thing if I couldn't remember my next bit on stage. I'd just pull my dick out. And, hey, take a Polaroid picture with the Jägermeister girls and $5. Yeah, I'm pulling my dick out. I pull my dick out all the time. I pulled my dick out in front of Louis C.K. And there's a picture of it in my book. I predate the predators. And unlike Louis C.K., I didn't ask him permission politely first. Just pulled my dick up for a picture. I can't get me too I had a, a friend of mine, a comedian named Alicia Wood, that tried to me to me last year on Twitter with a story that only made me think, oh, fuck, that story should be in my act. I forgot all about it. She just reminded me of a hilarious story that I 
banked away somewhere in some dead gray synapse. And I called her up and I go, what the fuck are you doing? Like, that story needs to be written long form. You can't, there's so much meat to that story now that I'm remembering it. You can't put that in a tweet. So I'm helping her write and edit my own Me Too Me story because it's fucking funny and she's wasting it. The story is, it's the early 2000s probably, we're playing a, a comedy club, Looney's in Colorado Springs, and uh, after the show, some guys wanted a picture with me, and back then again, pull my dick out was a regular thing for me. Back then, that was CD days, where you'd have a CD you sold after a show for five bucks for gas money, and I did, people would say, hey, will you sign it? And I, I go, oh, I don't have a catchphrase like get her done or nanu nanu or something. So I just occasionally pull my dick out and trace my shrunken dick on the ins insert and then sign over it because I had plenty of room for both. And, and that was, it was a different day and age. It's not like the current climate, which I hate that. The current climate, you know what, when you never leave your house, the current climate is wherever you set the thermostat <laughs> when you left last. So these guys, they want a picture and I go, okay, let's all drop trowel for the picture, ha, ah, standing in the lobby of a comedy club with our dicks out. It, it was funny. The guy next to me, we called him Fester afterwards because he looked like Uncle Fester. He's a kid, a little bald-headed fire plug of a dude. He pulled his pants down and he had micropenis, which is what it's called, the, the medical condition. Like real micropenis, not, oh, looks like it's cold out, huh? Wah, ha, ha. No, he had like a half a thumbnail, like a carbuncle. He had like just no dick. But he pulled his pants down with such heroics and aplomb and careless, reckless abandon. That's what it is. Reckless abandon. Pause for edit, because that's what I wanted to say all weekend. He pulled his pants down with such reckless abandon to show off the smallest penis in the world that we immediately fell in love with this guy. Like, you are the fucking gutsiest, beautiful, fucking strong human being. We befriended him and we took him out with us and we brought him to all the bars and got him hammered. And then he ends up back at the comedy condo, which is, you know, a, a, a apartment where they put up three comics, three bedrooms, and we got more drunk there. And at some point, it was my idea to do blindfold hand job. And I said, Fester, this is what? What we're going to do is we're going to blindfold you as me and my buddy Ben and a waitress that uh, was a, a drunkard and a player and a fucking regular solid folk and uh, I said we're gonna blindfold you and you have to guess which one of the three of us is giving you a hand job and I know she's gonna do it we made the eye contact she's in but even if she bailed out I would have done it because his penis was so small as to be non-threatening to a level where you would touch it anyway as a curiosity. <laughs> so I blindfold Fester with my bathrobe tie and she unzips his pants and Ben and I hide around the corner a little bit because we don't want to laugh and give away who's giving him a hand job, but she gives it away right away because she starts giving him the best dirty talk you porn hand job 
She's like, oh, I can't wait to see this cock come for me. It's fucking beautiful. Oh, God. This is so hot. I want to see your cum drip all over my... And Ben and I are both leaning in with half boners, wishing we had micro penis. Because this is the best hand job ever. And the only thing I noticed that was missing was she needed a lube. So I tiptoe across the carpet of the living room, get to the kitchen, and I grab some palm olive dish soap, which, not a sponsor yet. But when this story comes out, I'm sure we'll be flooded with money. I, I rain palm olive all over this little dick hand job. And then I get a little carried away. And I thought, what other condiments can I put into this? He's blindfolded, so I opened the refrigerator. And I get that mustard that's too cruel. I found crumbled goat cheese. <laughs> and I sprinkle a good amount of that into the hand job. <laughs> and then I run back over with Ben, still trying not to laugh and ruin his experience. And the part that I hadn't remembered was Alicia Wood. She was there. She was the opening act, sleeping like a baby in the third bedroom. So evidently, I went and I woke her up. You got to get off. You're missing it. Just get out here. What the fuck? What do you want? Just come down the hall and watch. What is it's micro penis goat cheese dish so bad, Joe. <laughs> what? It's micro penis dish soap goat cheese. Just come here, look. Just look. She's like, what? Oh fuck! What? The fuck is that? It's my tiny dick. It's good. She's like, just fuck off. And she, she went back to bed, and then fucking eighteen years later. Try to me too that story in a tweet and said it made her feel uncomfortable. What? It's a fucking hilarious thing. Like if I was a new comic on the road and I got taken out, I'm actually doing this as a professional now and I get to be in a comedy condo and uh, all the other comics are witnessing goat cheese, micro penis dish soap hand job and you didn't wake me up for that I would take that as a strong signal that I'm not welcome in the group why would you fucking leave me out like some Rudolph the red nosed reindeer wake me up you're uncomfortable imagine that kid's mom having to do his laundry with the next day she's uncomfortable what are you you're uncomfortable what are you fucking lactose intolerant and now goat cheese is a trigger for your you don't like sudsy hand jobs with your choice of toppings what the fuck fester had a better me too story in that than she did she just looked around a corner that kid was coerced by a a powerful man that he respected and looked up to and was coerced into receiving a hand job he may or may not have wanted. I think there's a lot of crossover in the Me Too movement where a lot of the people that you are trying to out and shame and say, fuck off, there's a good cross section are the same people that I am afraid of the fucking douchebag Saturday night last call fucking asshole Jocko bro dudes. When they can't fuck you, they want to fight me. That your hey lady nice tits, I get what are you looking at faggot. It's the same guys. There's a big cross section of that. Yet I'm still expected to fight that guy. He calls you faggot. Why didn't you just punch him in the face? Hey, he said you had nice tits. Why didn't you just suck his dick? No, <laughs> hey, that's what he wants. I don't want to fight him and you don't want to suck his dick. It's the, but it's the same douchebag. But I don't get to ride your hashtag. 
fucking weak dude gets nothing. We'll learn to fight. It says learn to suck dick. <laughs> fucking learn to fight. I can't fight. <laughs> Would you call me? Stupid. Rape is not a crime of sex. It's a crime of violence. You know what? So is violence a crime of violence. Where's my fucking hashtag protection? I walk into a bar, I get my head stoved in because I walk into a Raiders bar wearing a Broncos jersey and everyone says I was asking for it by the way I was dressed. I'm just saying, equal protection. I don't even go out. I, I, I only go out like, after shows when it's with you, where I go, oh, I got, I got people here. I don't go out. People scare the fuck out of me. They're awful. We were in, uh, we were in Indianapolis. And we're going through a car wash because that's one of the fun things you can do as a tourist in Indiana. <laughs> Just go through a car wash when it's not even your car. It was a fucking rental car. You're washing other people's shit because it's the worst state of the 50. And, and we get into the car wash. It's just me and Greg Chaley, my tour manager. And uh, it's a huge line that we get stuck in. But I needed a haircut. So I spot a barber shop across the strip mall parking lot. I bet Greg Chaley 20 bucks that I could get my hair cut before he can get through this interminable line in a car wash, because that's another fun thing you could do as a tourist in Indiana, is just bet $20 on any stupid thing, and hopefully the wager makes it exciting. How many plates do you think that fat fuck's going to eat at the Golden Corral? I'll give you over under five and a half not counting the chocolate waterfall because he'll probably just stick his tongue in there and not even use a plate on his way out. So I race as fast as old fat smoker can race across the parking lot to the barber shop. Fuck you, Chaley, I'll beat you this time. And I get to the barber shop door and I whip it open and oh... Ooh, it's really crowded. And it's a barber shop. Like those movies. It's a very urban audience. It's ethnic crowd. The defensive line in football. Your Atlanta-based flight crew. The New Zealand rugby team. However you say, the All Blacks. There's a fucking sea of black dudes staring right back at me. And I held this position for far too long. It's frozen. I don't know what my play is at this point. They don't seem to want me here. I still don't know what I should have done at that point. But I know what I did. I kind of ran. I think a little bit. Like I acted like I opened the wrong business door in the strip mall. I'm looking for something else. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking for the bridal shop next door. I'm getting married in the morning. Thanks for having me. Sorry, wrong. My bad. Because my first thought was, there's no way I'm going to win the bet with Chaley now because those places mobbed, every stool is full. There's 11 other guys on the back wall waiting in line. I can't win. My second thought, which is my first thought and every other thought I had, uh, I'm terrified by a room full of black dudes staring hard at me. Because I've been a human being for over a half a century. And one thing I've noticed about the human condition is most people are ugly, angry, fucking scary animals. 
And if you are confronted with a group of any type of the same types of human being and you're the one guy different, maybe a good time to kind of run. If I opened that door and it was a room full of hell's angels or snake handling evangelicals, I wouldn't have stopped and gone, oh wait, they're all white. They'll love me. No, you get the fuck out of there. If it was a room full of Indian men, cup your asshole and run anywhere but to public transit, because that's where they get you, according to the news reports. So I get about halfway across the parking lot, and this old barber comes out, and he looks like Morgan Freeman, and he's smiling with every tooth in his mouth I could see from a distance, because he, he's so happy. He saw right through my bullshit. He knows exactly what was going through my mind. And he was... Hey, man, where you going? <laughs> oh, they're going to fuck with me. I see where this is going. And I, I, I wander back over and I mumble some excuse about my friends in the car wash. And I know there's a lot of people in line and I can't, I don't have time to wait. And he goes, oh, no, there is no wait. I'll take you right now. <laughs> and he walks me back in like I'm a child that just got caught running away from summer camp. <laughs> and I get in and there was no wait because all those guys on the back wall, they're just hanging out in a fucking barber shop. They're not there to get their hair cut. Just fucking watching TV and shit. That's what they do. I thought that was an urban myth, all pun intended. But no, they actually just fucking hang out like it's a bar. And I walk in, and at this point, I am visibly trembling. Because I'm sober. It's early in the day. I want to explain that to everybody in there. Oh, this has nothing to do with the color of your skin. I'm a long-term alcoholic. This, this is what 2.30 in the afternoon looks like every day of my life. You don't get credit for the booze shakes. That's mine. Don't explain anything. Just shut up and sit down and get your hair cut. Be polite. And he sits me in the barber stool and spins me to the mirror and around the mirror, just like your mom's beauty parlor, they have photographs of all the different hairstyles that are available to me today. And I can't find any that are appropriate for my head. They're going to carve a dollar bill symbol into the side of my skull. And I'm just going to sit here and take it. <laughs> They're going to put an L.A. Clippers logo on the back of my balded pate, and I'm just going to smile and say thanks. <laughs> Shut up. Get your hair cut. Be polite. Over tip, which in that environment means tip whatsoever. <laughs> and get the fuck out. And it was the best haircut experience I've ever had in my life. So fucking old dude like me, a lot of times I've noticed I was suited up, thankfully. And when you're wearing a fucking over-the-top, grotesquely loud suit and you have your shit together, a black guy will fucking notice that. And fucking, yes, when your socks match your tie, brother, man, that's fucking sharp. And he did it, he was an old guy, so he did all my old crazy eyebrows and my ear hairs, and he hot toweled me. I, I begged off when I was offered the straight razor shave, only because he's an old dude like me, and I don't know how much he drinks every night, and I don't know how stable his hands are. So I, I walked at that point, but uh, would I go back? Fuck no. Not unless they move out of Indiana. It's the worst fucking state in the world. I should never have to play there again. I'd rather have fucking ear hair than have to play Indiana again. 
their turn to fucking move. I'd like to stop right now and uh, point out I am not racist. And I only say that not because I give a shit if you're offended. I say that because I worry that a lot of you might be racist. And I need you to know I'm not your friend. If you can't read context into these bits or tone or intent, it's not my fault. They say that. You know what? Jokes uh, have circumstances. Words hurt. You might think that they're just jokes, but it's how other people interpret them. And if they interpret them wrong, well, if they interpret them wrong, then fucking yell at them. Don't give me shit. Don't, just because you guys don't get it and you fuck up my comedy, yell at them. Them too. Hashtag them too. <laughs> Stupid idiots that don't get it. I am not, I am not racist, but that doesn't mean there's other people I don't hate for just as stupid a reason. Just race isn't one of them. I have my own isms. Sometimes there's types of people that just fuck you off. And, and it's just as dumb as any other. But you can't help it. It's an internal hate. You just shut the fuck up and be polite. I'm, I am an ageist. That is my big ism. I am disgusted by graphically elderly people. They gross me out so much, I can't be around them. I don't know why you bring them out in public. <laughs> I'm talking like, like gross elderly, like not, not cute, Keith Richards is still alive, or Betty White or something, functional elderly. I'm talking about the gross things that you bring out of a home, like Kirk Douglas kind of gross. Ah. And you bring them into public, I'm just trying to eat brunch at a Perkins on a Sunday morning, the hangover, and then I see the van pull up, and you're bringing out... Your fucking old thing. Kinfolk under each chicken wing. One more step, Berthenia. There you go. There you go. There you go. Now uh, uh, uh. you your other foot. Good, good. The tongue is darting in and out of their mouth. It's called tardive dyskinesia, when they can no longer control their mouth and the tongue just, uh, uh, it, it darts in and out like whack-a-mole. Uh, 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 it's all coated like they've been licking cheese or chalk in a rec room somewhere where their family abandoned them. Uh, Oh, you're almost to the door, Berthina. You're doing so good. Here we go. And you know, they're going to sit that fucking thing next to me. I guarantee it. Their skin is all dried and blanched like rice paper with big purple splotches underneath it. You know, if you accidentally drug an angry hangnail across that, it would bleed sausage. Just pour out of it. Yeah, here we go. We're almost to the table. Yeah, it's fucking right next to me. Their eyes don't work anymore, but the pockets underneath the big pink pockets are full of fluid to the like an infinity pool. They're full to the top. You know if you stuck one finger in the lower lid, all that liquid would just pour down their face like ocular bukkake. Ah, it's sitting next to me. They got scabs that were never a cut. There used to be a sunspot, and now it's some thick pepperoni dried and curling up off their scalp and I'm trying to eat undercooked eggs benedict right next to this going oh for fuck's sake I'll take it to go 
yeah, it's a horrible fucking way to feel about people, but it's honest. You don't say it. I think ageism is the worst ism to have when you're aware of it. Like being an ageist on that level is like if you were a racist who's very aware that you're rapidly turning black yourself. <laughs> and somehow you still can't quell the hate. Uh, ridiculing old fucks who are unable to defend themselves is punching down and certainly something I would never do. I was taken out of context. I was on Ambien. Russians hacked my teleprompter. That's just not funny. It's out of context with all of my standards and morals. There's some issues that you just never make fun. You shouldn't make fun. I love. <laughs> Just the idea that the expression making fun could ever be a negative. You shouldn't make fun. What? I'm sorry, did I take some subjects that are ugly and dark and soul lacerating, painful, shitty, maybe unavoidable in life kind of stuff and I made it fun? What a dick I must be. I can't believe just for attempting that Herculean feat of making awful shit fun. This is what you have to do in life, is try to make fun. If you, if you know how life works, it starts out where you're born into being fed a hard diet of lies and fantasies and fabrications. And then that just turns into a series of disappointments as you start to figure out everything you know is wrong. And then you get to live in the failures one after another and tragedies that are just waiting in the bushes to jump out and bite you in the fucking thigh. And then at best it ends with you on a cold slab in a medical university with hungover teenagers throwing around your internal organs, waving your fucking dead wang at each other and laughing. And that's the best that can happen. So in the meantime, you better try to make that shit fun. We had a friend uh, and a fan that died. Laura Kimball was her name. And she was the best version of the word fan and and I'm dedicating this special to her because if there's one thing that she loved more than comedy it was empty gestures <laughs> so I'm gonna dedicate this to her she had a perfect life she was 42 Husband making bank in Silicon Valley. She's beautiful with two beautiful little toe-headed Barton Lisa Simpson kind of kids. Gated community, all the shit. So she could come out to all of our shows anytime we're up and down the West Coast. She sat in the Laura Kimball chair, that side of front row. And uh, she called me up. She said, I just got diagnosed with stage four melanoma. It spread to my brain. And they're giving me six months to live on the outside, and I don't know what to do. And I said, oh, well, I'm playing San Jose in a month, so try to hang out that long. 
and then we'll come goof around. But I'm not a fucking doctor. I'm not going to give her what other advice am I going to give her? A new fucking Eastern treatment? To, no. Going, I, I, I'll be there. Don't die till I get to San Jose. And she showed up in the chair. She looked really good. I had written a whole pocket full of ha ha, you're going to die of brain cancer type of jokes just to fuck with her and roast her a little bit because that's what she'd want. That's what she would expect. And uh, we had a great night. And two months later, I'm playing Santa Cruz just down the, the street, basically. And there she is again with no warning. And she looked a little worse for the wear, but still pretty good. Now I'm out of ha ha, you're gonna die of brain cancer jokes. I had no preparation, so I'm trying to riff off the top of my head. Ha ha, Laura, ha, the brain cancer. Until I go back into my same old boring act that she's heard over and over. And this continues for months. She lived 13 months, and every few months she'd just show up at my show hearing the same fucking act. At one point, I leaned into her and I go, Laura, would you please fucking die? You're ruining my comedy. It's so hard to fucking say the same material when you're sitting there and you know you've heard it. And that night I said to her, I said, how am I going to know when you're dead? Because we don't have any mutual friends. I just know you from all these shows from the years. And you can't tweet me from hell, which is where you're going. And she said, uh, I gave my husband, Paul, your number. Take down his number. He's going to call you when the inevitable happens. So I put Paul Kimball into my phone under warning, warning, major buzzkill. Do not answer. Bad news only. You know what the fuck I'm going to say to this guy? So when I got the call from her husband... I decided I'm just going to talk to him the same way you talk to any one of your drinking buddies who just got dumped by some short-term Tinder skank or something. <laughs> and I just talked to him. I go, hey, wh hey, what's up? How's it going? Oh, oh, she's dead? Yeah, fuck her anyway, dude. <laughs> fuck her. You don't need that shit. You can do way better than her. What are you kidding? Fucking be a bitch about this. Let's get back out there. Come on. Nobody even liked her. <laughs> cry about this. Let's go to Vegas and hit some titty bars and bang some twelve ounce curls and we're gonna change your Facebook status to player. Don't be a fucking whining bitch about this. And he laughed, which was a pretty big gamble. <laughs> It was a pretty big roll of the dice to take that tact. But that's what you have to do. When life gets its ugliest, it's your responsibility to dig into the muck and try to make fun. And if they don't laugh, you just cut them out of your social circle. It's that simple. Get rid of them. Life is too short to hang around with people who don't get the goof. Fuck them. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming out. I'll be out there in the casino at some point. Before you, before you talk to me or ask me for a picture if I'm gambling, see the look on my face to see if I'm losing or not. Good night.